Are they ready? I'm checking right now. Mayor Du Bois, we're now live. Great, welcome to the council meeting of March 22nd, 2021. Our first item tonight, I'm sorry, can the clerk please call the meeting to order? Sure. Vice Mayor Burt? Here. Council Member Cormack? Here. Mayor Du Bois? Here. Council Member Philseth? Here. Council Member Koo? Here. Council Member Stone? Here. And Council Member Tanaka? Here. Seven present. Great, thank you. So our first item tonight is the special order of the day. It's uh, to vote on appointment of a candidate for an unfinished term on the Planning and Transportation Commission. So if um, we're gonna do it like we did before, if the city clerk wants to send out the uh, text or the directions, we'll go ahead and vote. We're gonna move on with the meeting and then the clerk will interrupt us once they have a total. Mayor Du Bois, I did send out an email earlier that included both of the phone numbers. If any council members didn't see that, I can text it back out. Okay. All right, so let's move on uh, to agenda changes, additions and deletions. I think uh, it's a record. We don't have one tonight as far as I know. Well, well actually, Mr. Mayor, I just thought that uh, for public awareness, the revised agenda having added item seven might work, be worth noting. Sure, yes, so we did add one at the end of the, tonight, which is a colleague's memo about uh, combating racism, uh, but no changes from that revised agenda. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to oral communications. And this is a time for people to speak on an item that is not on, otherwise on the agenda. If you could please raise your hands, we can see how many people want to speak. Okay, so it looks like we're going to have about 10, more than 10. So let's go ahead with two minutes per speaker. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois. Any member of the public wishing to speak on oral com communications, please raise your hand. We will start with Salim Demerji to be followed by Aram James. Salim, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Salim. I live in Mountain View. Um, last summer, amid widespread calls for police reform, Palo Alto Police Department's K-9 unit attacked Joe Alejo, a man who was asleep in his own residence at the time. Uh, the video of what occurred just came out last week, thanks to the lack of transparency from Palo Alto's police department. We did not know last summer that they had attacked an innocent man. And what he woke up to was disturbing. I had a hard time watching the video. I hope all of you on city council look at this video and look at what the Palo Alto police department is doing. They operate under your control and you need to make sure that officers like officer Enberg do not stay on the police department. It, was disturbing. They not only did this man wake up to being attacked by a canine unit, being commanded by Officer Enberg to attack the man, but then as he was being arrested, another officer told him to stop resisting while he is still being attacked by this canine. They obviously realized that he was not the person that they were looking for, and and they you know uh, settled it afterward after afterwards that you know this was this was clearly the wrong guy. They did not even stop to check before they tried to attack him. So it, it's really clear that there is something messed up in Palo Alto's police department. This is not the first problem in the police department. You are well aware of the other incidents that have occurred in Palo Alto PD, and it is now affecting Mountain View residents. So please settle immediately with Mr. Alejo and pay him the money that he needs and is owed. Additionally, you need to fire Officer Enberg. This guy should not have been on the police department to begin, to begin with, and he's been involved in multiple lawsuits. He's a legal liability for your city and for taxpayers. And finally, you need to prioritize Palo Alto Police Department transparency so we don't keep finding out these issues a year after they occur. And you need to fire officers who use excessive force like Officer Enberg. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Our next speaker is Aram James to be followed by Rebecca Ward. Go ahead, Aram, you have two minutes. 
So yesterday in Mountain View on Castro Street and El Camino Real from two to four, there was an aspiring rally that I went to. Justice for Joel Alejo is uh, well attended, 25, 30 people, peaceful of course, people speaking out, their outrage. Uh, I sent you all a letter today uh, indicating that uh, there were two outstanding, powerful letters in the Palo Alto Post today or the Daily Post, both of which pointed to the extraordinarily excessive force in this case, as well as the district attorney who's running for re-election in 2022, Jeff Rosen, who's refused to bring criminal charges. It's a violation of his oath. I know Jeff personally. I love the guy on a personal level, but he is not doing his job. I put in my, my memo to you. Uh, also, not only are the tapes viscerally disgusting, they had me shaking, shaking. That nine tapes, one from Palo Alto, eight from Mountain View. This was an excessive force case. And by the way, when you look at police tapes now, you'll see a lot of times for the camera, stop resisting, stop resisting. That's just a typical ploy that's used in law enforcement to make the victim look wrong. But bottom line, when I reviewed these tapes, Enberg, Enberg should be charged with attempted murder or assault with a deadly weapon. You say, wait a minute, Aram, attempted murder. You look at the 10, uh, I'm sorry, the 12 part series that I laid out for you uh, that, that in, in my memo, uh, which is called Mold When Police Dogs Are Weapons by the Marshall Project, 12 part series came out in October of last year, extraordinary. It shows how violent these dogs are, how they attack and how they racially uh, disproportionately attack people of color. You all need to call Rosen and let him know to file charges. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Our next speaker is Rebecca Ward to be followed by Raven Malone and then Eva Tang. Rebecca, go ahead, you have two minutes. SFO air traffic over our community is rapidly returning to pre-pandemic levels, a flight overhead every 90 seconds. Our city is the doormat for three concentrated highways of SFO arrivals traffic, accounting for a whopping 60% of that traffic. The city is always in search of a mythical regional solution beyond the SFO roundtable because the SFO roundtable has rebuffed its efforts to join since 1995, but that doesn't exist. The simple fact is the airport and FAA representatives take direction on priorities for SFO traffic from that body and congressional members. The city has allowed itself to be marginalized. It doesn't strongly advocate for our rightful spot on the SFO roundtable. Our congresswoman has undermined our efforts towards membership. The FAA knows that even when we have solid legal standing, the city will back away from legal action. The lack of effective response has harmed the community. That needs to change. Hopefully the new makeup of the city council combined with the longstanding efforts of council member Koo will change that. The city of Palo Alto should start by officially requesting membership on the SFO roundtable prior to the April 7th, 2021 meeting. Concentrated ultra ultra fine particles from arriving jet traffic is a serious health issue and the city council needs to take it seriously. Plain noise too has documented health and learning impacts. The FAA's own presentation on implications of next gen noted concentration of noise and pollution. In spite of this, the FAA is continuing to reduce traffic over the Bay and relentlessly concentrated over Palo Alto, the Willows in Bellhaven and Melino Park in East Palo Alto. Additionally, SFO flights are not being contained in Class B airspace over our city. You may recall the FAA created the side by waypoint in the middle of Palo Alto specifically to contain Class B airspace in order to reduce potential for mid-air collision. That containment is not happening where concentrated concentration is greatest. An example I recently raised to the airport and our Congresswoman was a 747 cargo flight that flew below 3,300 feet over Palo Alto, 700 feet below the class B airspace and above the airspeed limit when flying below class B. That's dangerous because it means arrivals are dropping into general aviation airspace. In this case, a massive speeding 747. The airport responds. I just want to finish this one. The airport response, we communicated with the FAA that the flight was what we consider not acceptable. That's an understatement. I hope everyone sees the problem and prioritizes this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. 
Our next speaker is Raven Malone to be followed by Eva Tang and then Adam Schwartz. Raven, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm also calling about Joel Alejo. Uh, I just wanna say this is unacceptable. The fact that this happened in June and we're just now finding out about it shows that we still don't have transparency within our police department our police department, which is also unacceptable. Um, this was a blatant use of excessive, fo excessive force. They didn't even ask who he was before using an attack dog. Um, and then they could have possibly found out that he wasn't the person that they were looking for in the first place. Um, I understand that some of you sitting on council now feel like we only have a few bad apples within our police department but a few bad apples spoils the whole bunch and we're no longer welcoming any spoiled bunches in our community. Um, so we need a reform in our police department and we need to fire police officers the, who use ex excessive force because we're, we're no longer accepting that. Um, also, I just wanna say to the AAPI uh, leadership here, uh, council members Lydia Ku and Greg Tanaka, as well as city manager um, Shikata, as well as any members of the AAPI community who may be listening, uh, I stand with you and I look forward to working with you to end uh, any AAPI hate and uh, letting our community know that hate against the um, Asian American and Pacific Islander community is not welcome here. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Raven. Our next speaker is Ava Tang to be followed by Adam Schwartz and then Lily Wong. Eva, go ahead. Oh, you were doing so well with my name before. Uh, it's Eva I'm Tang. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I was going to compliment you on that. Anyway, um, I'm here uh, also calling about Mr. Joel Alejo. Um, as Salim, Aram, and Raven have noted, uh, while my previous speakers uh, have not or didn't want to go into the previous suits that uh, Officer Enberg has been a part of, I will myself um, as a Mountain View resident, I'm appalled that this happened in my own backyard, literally, well, not my own backyard, but Mr. Alejo's backyard. Um, the previous suits against uh, Officer Enberg include one where he commanded his dog to bite a Black Palo Alto high school student, which I find appalling. You're telling me one, you can't detain a man that is sleeping without having your dog attack him and two, you can't detain a high schooler without having your dog attack him. It's a little ridiculous to me. Secondly, he's been in a suit uh, that involves him shooting a patient at a mental health facility while responding to a crisis. There's a reason that suicide by a cop exists. And that is because these people know that if they act in just the right way, a cop will shoot them and they will, they will die just as they intended. Um, and I, I find that appalling um, that that's even a thing. So uh, I, I, I really hate conflict and I really hate to call for, you know, someone to be fired from their job. But I, I don't think that I want Officer Enberg to be serving our public in this way. I feel very uncomfortable with that. Um, I think that uh, you need to settle as soon as possible and pay Mr. Joel Alejo the... Uh, money that he needs in order to get on with his life, uh, as well as increase the transparency within the Palo Alto Police Department. Um, that is all, I yield the rest of my time, thank you. Thank you, Ava. Our next speaker is Adam Schwartz to be followed by Lily Wang and then Kevin Ma, and we will take speakers through Adam and then no longer take any speakers after he speaks. Adam, go ahead, you have two minutes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Adam Schwartz. I am a resident of Palo Alto. Uh, my family has lived here for five and a half years. My kids have gone to the Palo Alto High School. My wife uh, works right here in the community. Um, I'm calling about the Joel Alejo uh, incident. Um, like many people, I uh, watched the footage that became available last week, and it is uh, shocking and disturbing and very hard to watch. Um, I won't repeat what uh, others have said here, but I'll observe the following. Uh, number one, um, it is inherently wrong for the city to issue dogs to its police officers and allow the officers to command the dogs to bite people. That is a use of police dogs that should be absolutely 
contrary to policy and not allowed. And I urge um, this august body to swiftly enact legislation that bans the use of police dogs to ever bite a person. Um, just looking at this footage makes it crystal clear uh, why that should be so. Number two, um, assuming that there is currently a policy in Palo Alto that allows officers to instruct dogs to bite people, uh, it clearly was abused in this instance. Uh, force must be proportionate to the situation, both ethically and legally. And uh, when this officer approached a man lying on the ground asleep, there is no scenario in which it is legitimate to use the force of a dog biting him uh, in order to uh, take the person into custody. And so uh, number three, I think it's clear that uh, discipline is required of the officer involved. Um, and number four, um, some uh, damages are owed to uh, Mr. Alejo. Uh, thank you very much for taking uh, the time to listen to me. Thank you, Adam. And we will no longer be taking any speakers. Our next speaker is Lily Wong to be followed by Kevin Ma and then Anna Lemke. Lily, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, uh, this is uh, Lily Huang. I'm a resident of Palo Alto. I am calling uh, to uh, voice my concern on the 2239 Wellesley Street project that changing the R1 uh, zoning to uh, uh, the uh, high density one, which has uh, 24 unit and the three level. And this is uh, uh, my concern is about this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, housing uh, project that will cause uh, uh, too much of a uh, traffic impact. Um, and also on the, um, about this uh, college terrace, this, uh, the whole community. Uh, I do uh, support housing for the low income. However, the, uh, the project could choose another site, perhaps around the commercial um, location, such as uh, Fry's uh, near uh, there. And um, so I really hope the city will take into consideration of the whole picture. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Our next speaker is Kevin Ma to be followed by Anna Lemke and then Yuang Ki. Sorry if I'm murdering your name. Kevin, go ahead. You have two minutes. Thank you. Evening City Council. My name is Kevin Ma, a renter in the Ventura neighborhood. And much like previous speakers, I would do wish to see the city make improvements based off this Joel Leo case. It is clear that this use of force by a canine is extremely unwarranted from the scenario, given all the situation. But what's worrying is also the general lack of transparency within the city. As the Daily Post has reported, Daily Post actually requested video about this incident about a month and a half ago, except the city denied it, only to actually show the video up once there's enough word in the area that there's been another case of another police misconduct and another possible sediment coming through through the city. We recognize that while police may have had stressful situations, this is clearly not in anyone's best interest. As such, I do wish to see that city make improvements to its race and equity work plan to ensure the IPA does have actual role to play in this situation rather than just a post hoc analysis that results in recommendations that don't really go much anywhere. I recognize that the IPA negotiation is still undergoing and I do wish to see the IPA have greater powers, perhaps consider some kind of community board to oversee it if the IPA is unable to, given that it is a Southern California operation for them. I also do wish to see the city do improvements as it does the POA contract coming up in the fall to make sure that those who have been shown to have conducted misconduct, that they can be accountably held rather than protected by the current provisions. I recognize that the city of Colorado right now cannot fire due to the provisions of the contract, but I do wish to see that those we entrust with lethal force are actually held to a higher account than necessarily the rest of us. Because if they can threaten anyone with impunity and they're supposed to be law enforcement, that's a threat to all of our rights. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Our next speaker is Anna Lemke to be followed by Yu Gang Q and then Coloma Smith. Anna, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, my name is Anna Lemke. I'm a longtime Palo Alto resident and I live in College Terrace. 
And I just want to commend the city uh, for uh, the city council for its recent efforts to approve and build more housing in Palo Alto, including the grant teacher housing, the Ventura project, the proposed Fabian Way project by the JCC, and also the multiple Stanford housing projects surrounding and adjacent to College Terrace. But I would like to voice my opposition to the ill-advised Cato proposed three-story 24 unit apartment complex on Wellesley Street in College Terrace. This proposed structure dwarfs the homes next to it, has inadequate parking, no setback, and threatens traffic safety. For future housing expansion um, in and around College Terrace, I suggest looking to the Stanford Industrial Park and the El Camino Corridor. Um, thank you, City Council, for your service, and I cede my time. Thank you, Anna. Our next speaker is Yu Gang Q to be followed by Coloma Smith and then Chuck Jagoda. Yu Gang, go ahead. Yu Gang, go ahead. You have to unmute from your end. There you go. You have two minutes. Okay. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Yu Gang. I'm Yu Gang, and I'm a resident in College Terrace, and where we raise our children from from elementary school to high school. We love our neighborhood and enjoy very much living in Palo Alto. Today, I want to express my concern on the Wellesley project in College Terrace proposed by the investment company and developer Cato. The details of that project can be found from the website created by Cato. We have received multiple postal mails from Cato promoting the project. And I'm not sure if Cato is doing such a PR in College Terrace wide or the citywide. We oppose the plan by developer Cato investment because it is a wrong project in the wrong location. The project proposes to replace two single family lots with a 24 apartments, three story building surrounded by R1 zoned homes. The proposed complex does not fit with the proportionally smaller neighboring homes and violates many planning regulations and ignores the reality that there are no three-story buildings of any sort in the College Terrace neighborhood of El Camino Rail. And finally, no evidence of a parking is provided. That is a serious concern of the neighboring residents and proposes a potential traffic safety liability due to its close proximity to an active child care center and the public uh, libraries. Um, while opposing that Cato project and their PR effort, we do support Palo Alto's effort to creating more housing opportunities in the appropriate areas, such as ground teacher housing of uh, Park Avenue. And given having that said, we are not anti-housing, we are not NIMBY. And thank you for City Council for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Coloma Smith to be followed by Chuck Jagoda and Carol Lee. Coloma, go ahead. Good afternoon, Council. I would like to um, read a letter that, so it officially gets on the, uh, from the Human Relations Commission about hate incidents in Palo Alto. HRC letter to Council regarding the response to current pattern of incidents of hate in Palo Alto. One of the Human Relations Commission's leading role is listening to the community concerns and then taking action. Over the past many months, the people of Palo Alto have brought to our attention several hate-based crimes which have targeted churches, minorities, and those supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. This year, our community experienced the desecration and vandalization of the University African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, the oldest Black church in Palo Alto, the unauthorized removal of First Congregational Church of Palo Alto Black Lives Matter sign, the posting of a Wuhan virus sign in front of a popular coffee shop, the posting of derogatory signs at three school properties this spring referring to COVID-19 as the Chinese 
virus, the verbal assault of Palo Alto council member because of his Asian ethnicity, the defacement of campaign posters of the only black candidate for council with a white lives matter sign, the distribution of white man matters let letters at private homes, the defacement of a student art Black Lives Matter, Matter project by an assailant wearing a MAGA paraphernalia, the vandalism and removal of at least 10 BLM signs from private property. These incidences in 2020, along with other incidents in recent years, including the unauthorized leaving of anti-LGBTQ materials at the library and anti-Semitic materials at gun show a disturbing trend. Since the initial drafting of this letter, there have been a rash of hate-based crimes in the Bay Area, which is especially concerning that many are violent attacks of elderly Asian American community members. Um, we at the HRC recommend the following six things, establishing hate-based crime units within Palo Alto, participating in the potential county task force to investigate hate-based crimes, perhaps in collaboration with Mountain View and or Los Altos, establishing school and community-based prevention programs, acknowledging the importance of data and collect the data for individual instances, establish of a hate-based crime line, understand, understanding law enforcement training on hate-based crimes. Thank you for my time. Thank you, Coloma. Our next speaker is Chuck Jagoda to be followed by Carol Lee and then Rebecca Eisenberg. Chuck, go ahead, you have two minutes. Chuck, go ahead, you have two minutes. You need to unmute from your side. Okay, okay, now, now you can hear me, right? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. And thank you for your many years of great service, Beth. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I'd like to speak also about the uh, man, Mr. Alejo, who was mauled by the officer, uh, you know, under the control of an officer. Um, I have to take issue with um, Mayor Dubois, who uh, said that... Um, the dog in, that the officer instructed dog mauling of a sleeping resident, he, he seems to say that it's okay as long as it is done according to uh, good policy and sensible rules. Um, I, I can't imagine he'd think that if it were he who got mauled, a, a young girl who got mauled at the express commands of a wayward officer. I, I really can't see any purpose for the things he says other than to play act and make it look like there's some reason for his brutal attack, for making the dog act so brutally. He's in command. He should take responsibility. The officer, Officer Engberg, was negligent, cruel, and um, it was very unnecessary. And the, the, the play acting was extremely annoying. <laughs> Um, I wonder how many $20 million awards it would take before the city of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Police Department realize it's time to require responsibility on the part of these agents of the city. And those $20 million awards can get even more expensive. They can start to add up to real money. I propose that for everyone's sake, each officer when hired should be required to purchase a self-insurance policy. It might make the officers think more about their actions and save the city a lot of money. Self-indemnification leads to closer scrutiny of one's actions. Police are way too free to indulge in random acts of cruelty. Instead of costing the victim and the taxpayer, the cruelty, negligence, and lack of restraint of one's anger and fears should cost the negligent, cruel perpetrator. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Our next speaker is Carol Lee to be followed by Rebecca Eisenberg and then Rohan Ghosh. Carol, go ahead, you have two minutes. Carol, try and unmute again. Unmute. Hello. There you go. I good evening, Council, uh, Palato Council members. Thanks very much for the opportunity for me to speak. 
And I'm here to uh, voice my concern and uh, oppo uh, opposition to Cato investment application for uh, R1 to PHZ conversion on Wesley Street in College Terrace in Palo Alto. Uh, my family and I, we raised two kids. We have been in College Terrace uh, resident for over 17 years. I remember the days my, my kids used to walk in, walk or bike to Escondido Village and uh, crossing the El Camino to the middle school and biking to Palato High School. Mm -hmm. So the high, den den uh, high density project uh, uh, proposed by Cato, uh, Cato Investment Project uh, Investment is totally wrong. It's the wrong location, wrong, wrong location, and it's going to be the very threatening project for the safety for the, the young kids or the uh, the, the homeowners or tenants living in Kaji Terrace. This is a totally wrong location because they are going to build a high density to convert uh, two lots in R1 into 24, uh, kind of like one bedroom or studio units in Westling corner of the uh, next to the Kaji Terrace library. So I urge the council and the Palato to create a uh, to create a long-term housing master plan that uh, details how much a new housing is needed and where it should go. But this would give uh, developers, uh, homeowners, and the housing advice attempt to work with. And we're not going to dis uh, discourage speculative developer from buying the land and uh, hoping for an up loan in pursuit of the profit. So we really appreciate the uh, city of Palato council member and build the grant avenue development and Palato for carefully working with nonprofits and uh, the counties to build affordable housing. But uh, the Cato project and their company, and it's a very wealthy management company is buying land in Palato and using the PHZ zoning as a uh, the host for maximum their return on investment. So they are don't they don't really care about the college terrace, the kids. Carol, your time is up. Okay, thank you very much and good night. Uh, thank you for opportunity for us to to think about our uh, concern. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg, to be followed by Rohan Ghosh, and our final speaker tonight will be Winter Dellenbach. Rebecca, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity again to speak with you. When I met with the mayor on Friday for 30 minutes, the mayor gave me the advice that I should speak out less at meetings. To clarify, Mr. Mayor, I would far prefer not to have to speak out at meetings. I would prefer if I could be pleased with what was going on with the job that you and your colleagues were doing. Um, unfortunately, I must speak out, although I'd rather not. And I recognize that this is about the fourth or so meeting that Aaron James and I are talking about this issue, but you still have done nothing in response. What of course I'm talking about is the vicious deadly attack on Mr. Alejo in Mountain View by the Palo Alto Police Department last June. And even though the mayor was correct, to, um, was correct that I said two in the afternoon instead of 2 p.m. And though it's correct that Mr. Al Alviso didn't um, own, sorry, my the name, um, didn't own the home. Most people in Palo Alto, including myself, don't live in homes that they own. The truth, is, the truth is, is that he, like the rest of us, deserve not to be attacked by deadly force, by the police force. I can't believe for, I just don't want to believe for a second that any of you have watched those nine videos that were released, because if you did, something about this dog attack would be on the agenda and it's still not on the agenda. When you watch these videos, first you'll notice that Palo Alto released only one video, a very poor quality grainy one for a city of our high tech capacity. Well, Mountain View released eight high quality longer videos. When you watch those videos, you'll see the Palo Alto Police Department shouting glee that they get to use the dog. You'll hear them say dirsh, dirsh, which means bite fight in check. You'll see them act with happiness as they set this dog on an innocent person and then swear, oh, who the F are you? When they start to realize they have the wrong man. Please watch it. You'll never sleep again like me. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker is Rohan Ghosh and our final speaker will be Winter Dallenbach. 
Rohan, go ahead. Good evening, Council. I really don't want to be speaking here tonight, but again, uh, a police officer of the city has engaged in wanton abuse of someone's personal safety and human rights. Uh, and I think the really telling part about this is that Nick Enberg, the, the police officer who set the dog to attack, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, the, the police officer who set the dog to attack Mr. Alejo, this isn't his first time abusing people's human rights. He, uh, in the same way, assaulted a high school student a few years ago and also shot someone going through a mental health crisis. So the fact is that there's, there's this vicious thug on our police department and somehow he's still there uh, supposedly here to protect us when he's, you know, going around attacking people like a criminal. And the fact is that I think members of this council who've been on, on council for a while or members who are new, you know, haven't really proposed anything to change this and have tried to water down the most basic attempts to try to prevent this from happening again. And I think that is absolutely shameful. Uh, this this is really shameful and we need to start, uh, first off, we need to find a way to fire this officer and make sure he's held criminally culpable for his actions. And additionally, dismantle the systems within our police department that allow this to happen so that this doesn't happen again. Finally, I'd like just to just say really quickly with the project on Wolsey Street in College Terrace, as a student, I really support the project because I want to find a place that I can afford to live here when I'm older. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. And our final speaker is Winter Dellenbach. Winter, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, I hope it's okay that I speak on this. I can't, I think it's not on, officially on the agenda. It's the 2019 Independent Auditors Report, which, uh, is uh, well, it's referenced on the agenda uh, on tonight, uh, but no formal presentation, which is too bad. I'm disappointed you won't be reviewing it and hope you will uh, be uh, reviewing uh, the IPA's reports in the future as a council. Uh, the 2019 report uh, is two years late. Uh, because of the dust up around the uh, HR taking internal uh, officer to officer complaints and giving them over to uh, the HR department. Um, this uh, 2019 report has five cases in it, one use of force involving a taser and four misconduct excessive use of force uh, 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 complaints. Um, all of them have recommendations from the IPA for the uh, PAPD to uh, hopefully uh, would adopt. They don't always adopt them, but recommendations meaning things that could be done systemically or policy-wise, whatever, to uh, change their uh, practice. So um, uh, that's important. Um, also, there's the supplemental report is included. That's the infamous case where the use of the N-word was used by uh, a current police captain uh, about another officer that's in this report. Um, so uh, what isn't in the 2019 report is the Gustavo Alvarez case from 2018 or the uh, Julio Arevalo case from 2019. So uh, there's a lot of catching up to do. And I know that we all look forward to that given our uh, commitment to uh, um, uh, uh, police reform. Thank you. Thank you, Winter. Mayor Bois, that's our final speaker. And we do have the votes for the unfinished term on PTC. 
Okay, can you tell us the results? We have Vice Mayor Burt voting for Berna Chang, Mayor Du Bois voting for Brenna Chang, Council Member Ku and Council Member Stone voting for Brenna Chang. We have Council Member Philseth and Tanaka voting for Kathy Jordan and Council Member Cormack voting for Jessica Resmini. So Brenna Chang with four votes is appointed to the unfinished term on the Planning and Transportation Commission. Okay, thank you. Uh, congrats to Ms. Chang and um, thanks to everybody that applied. Um, and thanks to all the public speakers tonight. Um, we're gonna move on uh, to item number two, which is minutes approval. Um, so I'm looking, looking for a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see anybody wanting to have discussion. I'm gonna mix it up a little bit tonight on the voting. Start with uh, Council Member Filsif. Yes. Council Member Ku. Yes. Council Member Stone. Yes. Council Member Tanaka. Yes. Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. Council Member Cormack. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, so that passes on a 7-0 vote. Uh, we're now on to city manager comments. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Let's see if we've got a uh, PowerPoint ready to go here. Just a few slides, updates uh, for the community. And if not, I will run it myself. It's, uh, someone from the clerk's office or me and be able to give me a flag either way. All right, so with that, I think I'm gonna go try to share my own screen here. Sorry, Ed, I'm having te technical difficulties. Oh, okay, it looks like we're looking at Jessica's screen now. Is that correct? Great, thanks, Jessica. Um, before we get into it, uh, the slides, I did wanna make one comment uh, for the public commenters. Um, would note that the criticisms and, and uh, personal attacks on one of our police officers uh, would really best be directed at the city manager. All of our officers do operate at the direction and on behalf of the city. Uh, and uh, as far as accountability goes, it certainly starts with the city manager, obviously uh, the chief of police also involved, um, but rather than uh, calling for the firing of any individual officer, I think that accountability is appropriately to myself. I uh, would note that the um, uh, incident of note has been uh, referred to the independent police auditor and there will be a full reporting uh, through the IPA uh, through the existing systems that the city has in place. So with that, uh, let's go to the uh, next slide, please. All right. We, with respect to our pandemic, uh, we have gotten early word uh, from the county uh, through its emergency operations center uh, that it is likely that there will be a, a change uh, tomorrow or perhaps as of Wednesday to move Santa Clara County into the orange tier. Here on this slide, we do a brief overview of the changes that will occur by moving into the orange tier from our current red tier, notably a uh, number of uh, indoor activities, including places of worship, uh, museums, movie theaters, uh, and restaurants at 50% capacity indoors. Uh, also a number of uh, other uh, uh, establishments, in particular retail establishments, going to uh, full occupancy uh, with social distancing and uh, sanitizing as uh, has become the norm. A uh, few other items of note, let's see, we've got, um, I think I mentioned theaters, but also hotels uh, for uh, broader travel. I think up until this point, it's been focused on essential travel. 
And now the hotel occupancy, uh, while uh, maintaining limits on, on the occupancy itself, will be open to full range of travel types. Uh, let's see, I think with that also notable that bars uh, will be uh, allowed to open outdoors. Uh, previously, up until this point, it's been only with food service, but now bars will be open uh, for uh, business outdoors and also offices while encouraging telework are allowed to open. And then notably last line here, as of April 1st, that professional sports and live performances will be allowed with up to uh, one third or 33% capacity. Next slide, please. Uh, just uh, part of our regular update, uh, vaccine rollout continues. Uh, we know that there are a number of uh, categories of uh, members of the public that are uh, able to get appointments. We also understand that uh, we heard today that uh, for multi-county um, uh, access that uh, Sutter PAMF uh, indicates that they're also using the MyTurn state uh, appointment system. There have been a number of criticisms of that system, but nonetheless, we understand that it is uh, operating. And so individuals are able to uh, use that as one more point of access uh, for those that are eligible. Also that uh, testing is continuing. Uh, we have testing uh, through Curative uh, at the Mitchell Park uh, uh, parking lot. In addition, we will be opening a new uh, city hall actually getting confirmation not in the building it's either on the plaza or in the parking structure uh, that will be having uh, uh, testing also available on wednesdays starting this week and also at mitchell park community center as of next week every uh, other week at mitchell park community center through the county next slide please uh, also noting that with the additional openings, uh, we are certainly inviting members of the community to come out uh, to all business establishment, uh, but in particular noting uh, that we have a pedestrian only access at California Avenue and University Avenue. Uh, we are uh, going to be increasing, um, we'll say both notifications as well as physical uh, impediments to cycling, uh, certainly on uh, California Avenue, as increased pedestrian activity is increasing conflicts with cyclists. So encourage all members of the uh, public to uh, walk their bikes uh, through these areas uh, as we look at uh, ways that uh, we can uh, make that a little more formal. And then finally, uh, at the county's request, and, and certainly our interest as well, ensuring that all members of the public are using face coverings and continuing social distancing even if you're vaccinated, uh, in, especially uh, in our areas where we are seeing increased uh, pedestrian activity. All members of the public, vaccinated or not, are asked to continue to observe uh, our standing social distancing and uh, face covering rules. Next slide, please. Uh, also noting for awareness uh, that, as we've reported previously, Stanford University will be welcoming uh, uh, their spring quarter uh, starting next week, March 19th, or 29th, excuse me, March 29th, uh, with juniors and seniors allowed to return on campus in person, not required to be on campus, but um, a number of safeguards that Stanford University is taking, including um, continuing remote uh, instruction uh, for those uh, both off campus on, as well as on campus, as well as increased testing uh, that will be provided for uh, students on campus. Uh, we will be providing additional communication and coordination with Stanford University as additional information is available. And then finally, uh, as the council and members of the community know, the campus itself is currently closed uh, to the public. And so we know that Stanford University is working with the state in order to identify the best way to um, unwind uh, those restrictions. Next slide, please. And then uh, just a plug for Wellness Wednesdays. Our uh, police chief uh, conducted an introduction to mindfulness for adults last week, uh, was uh, broadcast live as well as available now on YouTube. So if you miss that, never too late to, to catch up on your mindfulness uh, on uh, through our website, City of Palo Alto, 
paloalto.org slash be well, one word. Uh, next month, uh, as part of our ongoing wellness, uh, uh, will be our earthquake preparedness uh, session with Nathan Raymond Ramey. So we will be uh, comparing uh, ratings from Chief uh, Johnson to Nathan Ramey uh, next month and hopefully be able to increase uh, community uh, participation in these sessions. Nothing spells uh, wellness as preparedness. So uh, great opportunity for all members of uh, community to get up to date on uh, earthquake preparedness. Next slide, please. And then again, we'll be doing this on a monthly basis as part of our community wellness uh, activities. Then uh, simply noting some upcoming uh, council uh, discussion items, we'll be providing this each week. Uh, so rather than go through them uh, individually, I'll just note uh, this available for the public's awareness on upcoming items. Next slide, please. And that includes dates both through April, March, April, and into the month of May. Next slide, please. There we go. And it ends with the fiscal year 2022 budget actions, which will be coming to council discussion in May and June. Uh, so a uh, few of coming attractions. And I believe that's our last slide, uh, other than uh, links for ways uh, to stay up to date on what's happening with the city. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we're gonna start with our action items. Our, our first item is item number three. Uh, it's 855 El Camino Real, which is Town and Country Shopping Center. It's consideration of a change to the Muni Code to allow some ground floor medical use. Um, staff want to take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, City Council. Jonathan Late, Director for Planning and Development Services. Uh, let's see here. Your uh, This item uh, that's before you this evening, this ordinance, uh, pertains to the Town and Country Center. I think everyone... Um, certainly on the council and on the call is familiar with the, with the area located at the corner of Embarcadero and El Camino Real. Uh, this site, a rather large site, uh, has an existing uh, floor, floor area of about 170,000 square feet, most of that on the ground floor. Many of those uses are retail or, or retail-like in nature. Uh, there is some office on the second floor. Uh, the owners of the subject property uh, are requesting to uh, permission to be able to convert some of the retail and retail-like uses on the ground floor to medical uses. The reason for this are set forth in the um, staff report, and uh, I would imagine that the applicant's going to speak to some of those reasons uh, in their presentation, so I won't um, uh, reiterate it here. Uh, but I will note that the request has modified um, over the past couple of months. Uh, first, at a 20% uh, request of the ground floor area being dedicated to medical, um, to the current 10% that's being um, uh, proposed by the applicant and endorsed by, by staff. I'll note that the Planning and Transportation Commission uh, did recommend a 15% uh, of the ground floor area to be um, converted. Uh, to medical, but the commission was also concerned that um, the proposal was a, a more permanent solution to a what they perceived, some of them perceived as a, as a short-term problem, and they were concerned about the long-term uh, use of medical at the site. And so because of that, they imposed a couple of conditions uh, or criteria uh, that would apply, uh, including the requirement that any medical use that would, would be authorized under the uh, ordinance um, have an executed lease by the end of the year, and that after 10 years, the medical use would uh, leave uh, the site and return to a, uh, to a retail or retail-like use. Um, the uh, staff had some concerns about that, again, as noted in the staff report, um, and that was a concern also for the applicant for other reasons, um, uh, namely related to um, being able to attract a tenant and concerns about um, tenant improvements uh, that um, would need to be uh, abandoned after 10 years. And so um, the proposal now that's before you is 10% uh, or about 15,000 square feet of the ground floor. Uh, the request is to convert that much area to uh, uh, medical use. And the applicant will speak to the amount of vacancy that exists uh, already um, on premise. 
Uh, the council and its uh, consideration of the request will certainly want to uh, take into account uh, the public testimony uh, received at the PTC and, and yet to be received here this evening uh, before the council. And then also the uh, community and business uh, support recovery uh, discussions that the council has had and the direction that's given to staff in support of retail um, and, uh, and business recovery due to uh, our current pandemic. Uh, and then, of course, the council is aware of its existing uh, retail preservation policies that have been in place for a number of years now. And uh, this one would this uh, this ordinance would uh, modify that as it relates to town and country. Um, the city council has broad discretion on how it wants to approach this legislative matter. It could approve the project uh, as recommended in the um, in the staff report. You can modify uh, the ordinance. Um, or you can, um, you can turn it down, you can reject uh, the proposal. Uh, all of those options are uh, before the council. And if you do decide to go forward, uh, staff would recommend that you find the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and that you uh, endorse the ordinance that, that has been included in your packet. Uh, with that, I will um, end my presentation. And uh, I believe, Mayor, uh, the applicant uh, has up to 10 minutes to make a presentation. Okay, so uh, yes, I believe it's 10 minutes. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, um, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, second. In it here. All right. Um, good evening, members of the city council. Thank you for your time. Uh, let me actually just set a quick timer here so I don't lose track of myself. Um, my name is Dean Rubinson. I'm the director of uh, development for Ellis Partners. We've been the proud owners of Town and Country Village since 2005. We've managed a major renovation in 2006 and retenanted the property. Uh, in 2007 to 2009. And we're very, very proud that it's become an even more treasured asset uh, in the community. Um, but I'm here tonight, as no surprise, to express our real deep concern that town and country is in trouble. Um, it is um, not in trouble just because of COVID. It is in trouble because, as you know, and we all live in this world of Amazon and other e commerce giants. Uh, it is suffering from the, the, a two wave hit uh, beginning in 2016, 2017 uh, with the rise of e-commerce and last year, the second wave of, uh, of COVID, which uh, exacerbated the challenge of uh, e-commerce or the use of e-commerce, uh, as well as um, a, um, a elimination of our ability to provide personal services and um, elimination of our ability to provide uh, in, in uh, on-site dining. So what you see here is the, uh, the vacancy history of town and country. Uh, once we stabilized things in 2012, 2013, we were fortunate um, to be relatively stable in vacancy. And the bump you see in 2019 in up to 8.2% retail vacancy is a clear result of what began in 2017. Um, our uh, apparel, home good, books, toys, cosmetics users saw a 2% decline in, in sales volume in 2017 and an additional 6% sales volume dis, uh, reduction in 2018. Many of them began to uh, lose sales and then go out of business in 2019, well before the pandemic. Then we get a hit in 2000. 20, and we're now uh, at 18.6%, working our way into the mid-20s. Um, we do not believe that this is a short-term issue. As you can see, it is a beginning of a long-term trend that is only exacerbated by COVID. Um, the uh, site plan currently shown in red here are our current retail vacancies. Our office vacancies are in blue. We're over 33,000 square feet in retail vacancies. And we believe there's about another 20,000 that are uh, at risk. Um, we have been working very, very hard with our tenants since this pandemic began. 
We have, we started with 68 tenants. We now have 50 tenants and we have created workout deals with 40 of those 50 tenants. So we have sat down with every single one of them. We have put deals in place with 40 of the 50. Uh, those workout deals are, are uh, essentially uh, causing us to have to abate rent to keep people in business uh, to maintain the foot traffic there. We've abated to date over a million and a half in rent and the loft rent that is um, projected uh, because of those abatements is over $7 million. To replace the tenants um, that we have lost will be many, many more millions of dollars in uh, physical costs to convert spaces to new uses. So we have done everything we can. We have treated our tenants fairly. Um, we care very much about this asset and we believe that really um, allowing medical office use to some degree um, is a significant part of the solution to prevent a death spiral of town and country. Town and country relies on foot traffic and medical office uses to, um, will be a very important complement in the solution of uh, creating um, a future for town and country. Uh, we originally came to the city asking for 30,000 square feet of our ground floor space to be utilized. Staff said that they could live with 15 percent with with um, with 20,000 feet. After the PTC uh, discussion, that was very very fruitful and um, important. We said that we would be willing to drop it down to 15,000 feet. This is 10 percent of our ground floor. It is a de minimis amount. It is really an ancillary amount and or ancillary use to the retail uses there. Uh, there would be a modest increase from 15% to 21.4% site-wide, including our second floor space for office. And um, we have further offered as a part of this compromise, um, based upon what we heard at the PTC, to not put medical office uses uh, along any of our street frontages. We, we, um, we see that the site could look something like this if our proposal uh, that is a, a very fair compromise, which we, as we've read in the staff report, staff is supportive of this compromise. This is essentially the sort of ancillary de minimis impact that these medical office uses would have on the overall merchandising and the uh, customer experience at town and country. So this is an example of the places that these uses could go. Uh, we also um, want to highlight for you that there is a, a new face in, in medical office, very different than your old pediatrician or dentist office from uh, days of old. Um, the, the face of medical office is much more retail focused. There are concierge medical providers um, that are focused on wellness and focused on creating attractive spaces See, these are some of the uses and tenants that we've been in conversations with. And these are some images for you to see uh, to highlight what these uses might, um, uh, be look, might look like when you walk by them at Town & Country. They are much more attractive, much more forward facing than um, uh, doctor's offices or medical offices from the past. And we feel that the limitation in the amount and this new trend towards retail facing will create an appropriate mix that will enhance foot traffic, um, stop this spiral, and furthermore, allow our other retailers to benefit um, from that foot traffic. If you can imagine someone going to CVS to pick up a prescription and some other items after seeing one of these medical professionals or dropping off their child to go to an orthodontist uh, and going to Trader Joe's to shop during that, um, during that visit. Um, Town Country um, is um, a unique zoning um, setup within the city ordinances. Um, there, it has its own zoning right now, separate from um, any other um, zoning. It's within the CC Community Commercial Zoning, which only covers Stanford and Town and & Country. Town & Country has an overlay on top of that that limits our, um, our leasing ability. So making a change on a site-by-site -site basis here is not a new precedent for Town & Country. It was already treated as a site-by-site -site condition. Stanford, on the other hand, <clears throat> is not impacted in the same way um, because they don't have the personal services. They don't have the mom and pop local tenant base that we've 
elected to create and curate here. <clears throat> um, the um, sales tax impact to the city is very, very small. Even if all of these spaces were rented to medical office, it would be under a $40,000 impact per year, which is about 6% town and countrywide and less than a half a percent citywide. Uh, we do believe that um, the additional sales tax or any lost sales tax due to this change would be more than offset by additional traffic to the other surviving retailers at the site. Like I mentioned, 10, uh, CVS, um, Trader Joe's and all the others. Um, if um, this medical office use is not permitted, we believe that the potential loss in sales tax due to the failures of other retailers could be well beyond this 6.1% and this $40,000. I wanna stress that while Pally High and, Stan and, Stan and Stanford uh, will hopefully be coming back uh, into full uh, bloom over the coming months, those do not represent a significant amount of our um, uh, sales volume. They represent some of our foot traffic, but not a significant amount of our sales volume. So that will not be a solution here. I want to stress that we are in need of your flexibility and understanding. We have been the proud stewards of town and country for over 15 years. We treat this request with great seriousness. We consider our request uh, to be um, set up in a way that we can continue to be stewards of a great merchandising mix to restore the vibrancy despite the e-commerce growth, despite COVID. And we ask for your trust and understanding at this time. Thank you so much. I look forward to answering your questions. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's go ahead and see if uh, there are members of the public that would like to comment on this item. So if you'd like to comment, please raise your hand in Zoom. Okay, let's go ahead and do three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois. At this time, we have one speaker, Rebecca Eisenberg. Rebecca, go ahead, you have three minutes. Thank you so much. Try to get through everything. First of all, Ellis Partners does not need the charity of Palo Alto City Council. Ellis Partners bought Town & Country in 2006. It did not, did not disclose how much it paid for this property, but what we do know is that since 2006, commercial properties, all properties in Palo Alto have between doubled and tripled in value. That means that whatever Ellis Partners paid in 2006, let's say, $300 million, I'm just guessing, that town and country is now worth between $600 and $900 million. With the more than half a billion dollars that Ellis Partners already has made in this property, why does it need your protection in order to maintain its high rents? It doesn't even need these rents in order to see its profit. It already has profited unbelievably. Second, Alice Partners is outright lying about the fact of how it lost its tenants. I have at least five former tenants of town and country who would be happy to speak with you about how Ellis Partners actually refused to give them another lease when their lease expired. In other words, many of their vacancies actually were caused by their own refusal to extend a new lease to perfectly qualified and well-behaved tenants. The city has not looked into that. Third, Town and Co Ellis Partners said that it has done everything it can in order to fill those vacancies, but it hasn't lowered rents. We all are living in a cycle where cost of living has continued to go up while virtually no costs have gone down. Small businesses are suffering. Small businesses are hurting between giving town and country's owner, billionaire developer Ellis Partners a windfall here and giving some assistance to small businesses who rely on that location in town and country, why would you choose the billionaire over our suffering small businesses? Town, it, to fill these vacancies, all they have to do is lower rents. They refuse to do so. They do not need to rely on their continued rent increases for their to sustain because they have raised their rents every single year since buying the property. I'm a landlord myself and I've had to lower my rents. 
in order to maintain a tenant in the home we own that we rent out. Why doesn't Ellis Partners have to lower their rent? It's not fair. I'm very angry that the city manager and the city planning director did not do their homework about this. Oh, and last thing, why would you grant this when Stanford University's 100,000 people who are students and staff aren't even there, nor is the Pali and other communities? At first, let us reopen before you make such a huge move. This is a bad idea. Please don't do it. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Mayor Du Bois, that's our last speaker. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're gonna come back to council. I think we can do questions, comments, and motions in this first round. Um, anybody like to kick us off? Vice Mayor Burt. Yeah, um, thank you. So a couple questions for Director Late. Um, First, on the um, on the site map, there is uh, a building three. Is it? Yes. Uh, out um, uh, and and building one, uh, and they're both uh, out by um, uh, is that Urban Lane there? Uh, what are the current ground floor occupancy requirements for those areas or and uses? Uh, currently, it's it's retail. If you're getting at the type of land use, it's retail and, and retail like uses are permitted. Okay, and um, within the we we had the uh, applicant uh, give some examples of some uh, retail like medical uses, um, but would there are some emerging true retail like where uh, there can be either memberships or drop-in medical services and the like. This proposal, would it limit um, the types of medical offices to retail-like or would it enable any medical office? Yeah, right now it's set up for any medical office. You, you may recall that the council gave us direction to have a conversation with the Planning and Transportation Commission to really understand in more detail this uh, sort of medical, retail medical uh, use. We've not had that discussion and we've not narrowed that down at this time. Uh, if the council felt like it had a way to define that, uh, that can be incorporated into the ordinance. But right now it would just be a um, medical office. And has, um, has staff looked at the typical uh, lease rates for medical offices versus retail? Uh, no, not for not for this uh, application. Okay. Um, and let's see. And finally, the the applicant made an assertion that the uh, sales tax loss from replacing true retail with medical offices would be more than offset by the additional sales tax revenue from the foot traffic resulting from the medical offices, if I understood the statement correctly. Um, as staff uh, have any uh, thoughts on whether that seems to be an accurate claim on the face of it? No, we're not able to validate that claim. Um, we have heard that, uh, I mean, the argument is that you know, medical uses in and of itself would generate uh, some additional foot tra traffic, as you heard illustrated, and, and staff believes that to be accurate. Whether that uh, rises to the level of, of um, fully recapturing the cost of um, the sales tax generated by the retail use that would have been in that location before, we're not able to say. Yeah, and, and it seems that what we'd be losing is not only the, the direct revenue from the retail that would be lost, but also the foot traffic that from that retail that's lost. And so um, uh, it, I think in normal circumstances, the foot traffic from retail and the, the spillover impact on other retail from uh, uh, one retail establishment to another would exceed the foot traffic you'd get from the medical office plus you would lose the actual revenue from that retail. So 
So I, I, I was struggling with how that could, that claim could be close to accurate. Um, okay, uh, the, that covers my initial questions. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first question, the applicant said that they have rent abatement and, and agreements with 40 of the tenants, but specifically if, if uh, the applicant could speak to what form of, of rent abatement, are we talking about permanent rent forgiveness, a delay in rent, a reduction in rent? If you can give us some details there, I'd appreciate it. Could the applicant answer that? Yeah, hi, this is Jim Ellis. Uh, good evening, council members. I, I am uh, one of the partners and owners of the shopping center. Um, we have been uh, entering into a variety of agreements with these tenants, all with the interest of doing everything we can to keep them in business uh, and to keep them open to the extent law allows it. Um, we have uh, entered into um, abatement agreements um, that in some cases are short-term, i.e. through June to December of this year. Um, in other cases, we've entered into agreements where we have longer-term restructuring of rent um, in order to compel them to not give up uh, in operating their businesses. Um, uh, and as Dean alluded to earlier, you know, we don't always win that battle. Um, there have been several tenants that have simply elected to close and, uh, and, uh, really effectively terminate their leases, go out of business or just close this particular business if it's a chain. And, uh, you know, we have been working through those situations as well. And if I just might make one more quick comment with regard to the previous council member's comment, um, uh, you are making the assumption that there would be a retail tenant to occupy what we are requesting to be used as a medical office with a vacancy rate in the high teens approaching the mid twenties. Um, we, we have grave concern that we will not, on a longer term basis, have retail tenants to actually fill that space at any rent. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Uh, but to kind of just follow up, because I, I still haven't, you, yeah, I think you kind of, you danced around my question a little bit. So I just kind of want to focus back on exactly what we mean when you're saying rent abatement there. If you can give specifics, I mean, are you just saying, Hey, if you can't pay your rent, that's fine. We'll give you a few months, but you're gonna have to pay it in full come June, come December. Are you saying we've actually worked with these tenants to, to say, okay, you've been paying $10,000 a month. We're gonna reduce it to $7,000 a month. If you could give some, some detail there, I think that's really gonna help. Yes, thank you. Um, as I said, we've been doing all of the above. We have been uh, typically granting abatements and deferrals of rent. Um, and those abatements have ranged from anywhere from 30% to 50% reductions in their rent. That's That would be a forgiveness of rent, not a deferral. As you know, the county is allowing for mandatory deferral into, uh, to a date certain. Um, so we've been trying to be proactive with these 40 tenants that Dean referenced that are in trouble, and we've been proactively granting a write-off, or in other words, an abatement of rent, where we are not expecting that they have to pay it back. There are other circumstances where we have done, as I said, either a combination of abatement and deferral. Um, and you know, we hope that those deferrals will get paid someday. But to be honest, there are you know we will probably end up doing another round of write-offs, uh, knowing that many of those tenants may not be able to pay it. And can you give an, uh, an exact number as far as how many tenants have you lowered the rent for? Uh, approximately forty. And do you have uh, as far as kind of like. Uh, of the of the 40, 
what is the what's the average uh, that you what what would you say is the average as far as the the rent decrease? Because you gave a, a pretty big range there. Um, I would say on average it is about a third of their rent being evaded. Okay, thank you. I see I'm out of time. So if we have a, another round, Mr. Mayor, I, I definitely have more questions and comments. Sure, um, Councilman Bracou. Um, so thank you for um, both Vice Mayor Bird and Council Member Stone's questions. Um, a lot of them, I had them too. Um, so I won't go back into those, but I did wanted to find out, you know, medical use and medical offices has always been a question, a big question for me. Um, obviously some uses will might require more oversight. And then there are some that are more cosmetic or you know, that, that are not as, as much oversight needed. Um, so I have been, so I went into the, um, to the different sections, for example, packet page um, 59 under development standards. And there was medical office uses further regulated by section 18.16.050, small a number seven. And I can't find number seven in our code, um, in the municipal code. So, you know, I mean, I was just kind of wondering, it would have been nice to have gotten a list of breakdown of what medical uses and should there be an emergency vehicle or emergency response that is needed, what would happen in that, at, especially at that site. When I was over there yesterday to walk around, it was pretty packed. I mean, there was quite a lot of people there as well as vehicles going back and forth and people were, you know, enjoying their day over there. So should there be medical uses? What type are they? What type of, um, what, is, what is their um, level of use and how much oversight should be given? Um, so I, I saw your list that was provided, um, you know, Invisalign and some others, but again, I don't know how much, how much intensities they are in the, medicals, in the medical field. Um, then I also am, you know, the question that Vice Mayor Bird had posed in terms of the um, lost sales tax revenue and what the applicant has um, provided as potential um, foot traffic income revenue that could come in due to these medical spaces being there. Um, I would like to see backup data or some peer review on it before, um, before just taking it at face value. Um, in any case, um, I will, so can you tell me where is this section in the municipal code or am I just completely missing it? Uh, thank you, uh, council member. I, on packet page 59, I believe you're referring to the underlying text toward the bottom. Yeah. Okay, and that's a reference to section 1816050A7. Are you making it? Yeah. That's is, yeah. Is that that's new the, text. That's the new text right above it. That's underlined in section two, where it says number seven on that same page. I see. Thank you. So you're right. It doesn't exist in the code today. It's the new text that we're proposing to add. And that's the new text, but it still doesn't go into the different uses of the medical in the medical field. Do so we have that in our code in our code somewhere? Medical is defined in the definition section of our code. Right. The different uses though, how they're how they're aligned. If they are using so much anesthesia, if they have laughing gas, how much of it does it become something that we have to have further oversight? Is that defined there? No, no. That, that's regulated uh, by the industry to the extent that in, there are state requirements for us to meet um, you know, certain requirements for medical that are set forth in the building codes. We would evaluate that in our, in our plan review process. Um, but 
um, barring that sort of uh, establishment in, in uh, state regulations. We don't have anything beyond what the uses are um, in our code. Okay. Um, I have a few other questions, but I'll come back. Thank you. Councilmember Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois. Um, my first question is for staff, um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is something you'll have off the top of your head, but in the 18 months, let's say before COVID, so that'd be like the fall of 20, can't do, <laughs> 2018 through spring of last year. Um, let's just say in that 18 month period, what kind of applications did we get um, in the city to start a retail business that sells things like? Does anything come to mind? Um, I don't know if we track this, like were there four? Do you remember what kinds of businesses opened? I mean, we, we all have some familiarity with the businesses that have closed even before COVID, but do you have any, any thoughts, any things come to mind about the types of businesses, retail businesses that opened before COVID? Uh, no, we don't, I mean, I, I'm trying to imagine how we would actually collect that data. Um, I, there's probably a way that we can do it. I think it'd be labor intensive and I don't have an immediate number for you. Okay, Ms. Rabel, do you unmuted? Did you have something to add? I guess just uh, as, as um, Director Late mentioned, there are ways to track it, but it would be very difficult. Um, you know, most of these are done probably through use and occupancy permits, a change from one retail use to another. Um, you know, I've certainly have seen some of those come through. Uh, I wouldn't say that I've seen a lot come through. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and then a quick question for the applicant. Um, it looks like at least one tenant, I think LaBelle has expanded in this time frame. Is that right? Looks like they've taken over some space that used to be something else. That's correct. Are there any are there any other um, tenants who have expanded their space during this time? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you so much. That's very helpful. Um, so that's that. Those were the the main questions that I had. Um, I think uh, for me, it was helpful to look at the the comprehensive plan part of this and think about addressing the needs of the community. Um, and I, I think if we see an, a business that is expanding in the past couple of years, that suggests there's more demand for that service, right? And La Belle is going to be like the Meta Spa or Dermatology or some of the other examples there. Um, another example I was recently made aware of is um, I was talking with um, a parent whose child has a, unfortunately a traumatic brain injury and they're using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And unbeknownst to me, we don't have that here. Um, and so she's been driving her child every day for weeks to, I think, Los Gatos. Um, and the restore that's listed there actually provides that. Um, the syrotherapy, I think, is when you like get in something really cold. That doesn't sound all that appealing to me, but I know there are athletes who, who like it. So um, I think it's interesting to think about addressing the needs of the community that, that um, either are being signaled um, by expansions that people are, are creating or are being addressed by people driving other places. Um, you know, when we, I think it was council member Phil Seth last year who talked about, um, you know, we should do some experiments and, and I think 10%, 10% might be an experiment. Um, I do think it's important for us to look at these other categories and I so appreciate in the staff report, um, A, the maps from the tenants, super helpful. Um, and then also the vacancy rates. I know council member Tanaka is always asking for those. And so very helpful to have that data. Um, but I guess if I just think about this type of medical and where it might go, um, Midtown, we haven't talked about. Edgewood, it sounds like there's some vacancies. It wouldn't be downtown, presumably. If we're not doing nail salons on California Avenue, I imagine we're not gonna do medical there. So um, it'll just be interesting as we think about is, is this request a one-off um, and we can't know this now, or is this sort of the beginning of a bit of a sea change? Um, I think it's relevant that this, this site is near Pelta Medical Foundation. And I know my, my colleagues don't need to be reminded that our, our largest um, employers are, um, are in the field of medicine and healthcare. Um, so I appreciate the significant amount of information. Um, I'll just say that the, the applicant has shared with us. 
Okay, thank you. So again, uh, open to questions, comments, and motions. Councilmember Tanaka. Uh, let's see, yeah, the, I see the applicant still on. Um, so a question for you. You mentioned you had a statement, and I just wanted to push into it a little bit more, that you didn't think that you could rent some of the spaces, some of the retail, retail spaces at any price, in any rental space. Was that an exaggeration, or do you think that's actually really true? Um, well, you know, I, I suppose if you offered this space for no cost and we subsidized the operating expenses, we could, we could find people to occupy it. But, you know, we have a mortgage to pay and a ground lease to pay to the original developer of town and country village. So, you know, we, we have to charge something. Um, the reality is, is that medical, these medical uses we are trying to get you to approve are in the interest of just trying to stabilize the occupancy of the center. We do not believe that longer term there will be retail tenants that will pay enough rent for us to cover our costs um, in, in the absence of that use. And, I, and I'll just add that these, these medical uses um, are not paying a rent premium to what we would normally collect for retail rent. Okay. Um, so you mentioned you have debt on the property and you know there's payments you have to make to the original developer. Um, so you guys actually have some real co ongoing costs that you have to, um, you have to uh, uh, deal with. Was for 2020 was, were you guys in the black or in the red on, on, on this property? We are in the red. Okay. So, so right now you guys are actually paying more in your costs in terms of the debt service that you have to do to payments to the, to the original developer, pay, payments for the maintenance. That's higher than the actual rent that you're getting right now. Correct. So, so basically you would, to lower the rent even more, you would have to lose even more money. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and the other just item to factor in is with vacancy comes retenanting costs. And that includes significant, especially in this distressed situation, more money for tenants uh, to use from us to improve their space, along with other uh, costs like brokerage fees, et cetera. Okay. And, um, uh, so you guys have other properties too, right? Other retail properties? This is not the only one, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And how does the vacancy here um, at this center compare to other properties that you guys manage? Um, to be honest, this property has a higher vacancy rate. Um, and that is, in my opinion, because we have a, a larger percentage of uh, boutique and local apparel uh, tenants. Mm. They've been hit particularly hard by the longer term trend of e-commerce in addition to the effects of the pandemic. Mm. And so we are limited, for example, on being able to add more food uses to the center, restaurants or quick serve restaurants, et cetera. So, um, Centers that have more of those types of uses have fared better through this pandemic. Yeah, and I'll just add that the national tenants, we try to, of course, try to create a mix of local and regional and national, but places like Stanford, for example, um, are much more tenanted by national tenants who have deeper pockets and can survive these downturns and changes. Um, but um, even even with that, we're they're not in the position to be expanding right now. Many of them are failing um, as well. But the as Jim mentioned, it's it's the additional um, challenge of being small and local and being a victim of e-commerce. Um, so I'll, I'll make a few comments here. You know, I I read in a few places and you know, numbers wild uh, very wide, widely, but. Um, something like 60% of retailers are going to go under or 60% of the space. Uh, I don't know if it's true. I've seen some higher numbers. I see some lower numbers, but it's, it's pretty gris, gris, like pretty dismal. Let's put it that way. Um, and I, I think 
I think what was talked about in terms of kind of like a death spiral is really true. I mean, when if you if you see there's like a tipping point where if the center doesn't get enough critical mass, it just starts falling apart, and there's one thing after another. And I think at one point, town and country was actually there and came back, which is great. But it's looking like it's headed there right now. Uh, I agree with the comment earlier that you know this this is actually near uh, the Paulton Medical Foundation, so it's actually kind of kind of makes sense. Um, the kind of medical space that they're looking for seems, um, you know, at least in, from the rendering, seem to be um, kind of retailish, which is going to, it looks like it's going to generate the foot traffic uh, to the center, which, which it really needs. We're hearing from the operator, the applicant right now that they're already losing money. And, you know, it's, I, mean, I can only imagine how difficult that's got to be. Um, and so I, I, to me, what makes sense here is a staff motion. So I'd like to make the motion that uh, the, the staff recommendation, um, and hopefully I'll get a second for this. Second. Okay, uh, so it's moved by Councilmember Tanaka, seconded by Councilmember Cormack. Do you, do you wanna to speak to your motion? Uh, I kind of did already, but I, I think the main thing is, uh, you know, our city also needs this revenue. Uh, we need we need the tenant surgery to be successful. We need to actually have tenants there, and we need to create the foot traffic. So, the medical offices or medical uses are going to create that foot traffic. Um, maybe even benefit, uh, as um, Councilmember Correct mentioned, maybe some people who need these medical services to make them not have to drive to Los Gatos or somewhere far off. Um, so it could be a win-win from multiple angles. And you know we already have like kind of medical uses in that area, which which is nice. So it's not you know, it kind of makes sense, kind of fits together. And so I hope we could try this experiment uh, because I think we really need it right now, especially given the really, really uncertain economic times. Councilmember Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois. Um, you know, we've, we've spoken often about retail and services and the shift that's been going on for, you know, the past five years or so and how COVID is really accelerating it. Um, we also have a population that's getting older and grayer, as some of our, uh, our, um, our public commenters remind us. Um, and based on the types of tenants that the applicant is looking at, I do think they would fit with the other kinds of retail um, that are there. Um, I realize this is a, a bit of a stretch um, for some people in the community and perhaps for some of, um, you know, my colleagues, um, this is an extremely unusual time. And I think the time when we can make demands um, of um, is, it's changed. So um, I'm willing to do this at 10%. Um, and um, because I think it will also benefit members of the community. Thank you. So council members, Stone, you can speak to the motion or continue to ask questions. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. I, I have one question, one more question for staff, and then I'll speak to the motion. Um, how did Town of Countries, because I know in January 2020, their vacancy rate was 4.1%. How does that compare to other similar shopping areas in the city and the region? I know there was a graph included in the report, but I'd like some more kind of granular data with really just a point in time comparison of January, 2020 to really get a, really just get a sense of how successful town and country has been in a non, in a non pandemic setting. Yeah, thank you uh, council member for that question. We really do not have any more granular data than what's presented in the staff report. And, and even that data, the CoStar data we noted uh, is problematic and, and we wouldn't want to rely on it uh, 100% um, for uh, a number of reasons that have uh, we've called out in our staff report. But um, uh, that's unless Claire, uh, you have any more to add on that. Um, I don't know. I don't believe we have anything more uh, detail for you. Well, can you give maybe more more kind of ballpark? How does in your in your experience, how does a four point one percent vacancy rate for a shopping center like this uh, is that is that good? Is that is that bad? Is that do you do you think that's average? If you don't have the the data, maybe you just kind of have that sense. 
Well, I, probably as much of a sense about it uh, as you do uh, on that. I mean, it doesn't strike me as particularly uh, burdensome or, or high at 4%. Um, but I also think, you know, well, so I, I don't think that's particularly uncommon. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it seemed 4% 4, 4 seems good to me. You know, so I guess kind of speaking to the motion, yeah, you know, I understand the town and country wants us to focus on their current vacancy rate of 22.9% rather than the pre-pandemic rate uh, of pretty much 4%. And you know, I, I really empathize with that. I, I think a nearly 23% vacancy rate is an extreme shift. But the narrative the town and country has been hurting long before the pandemic, and this is a trend in the retail market, doesn't really hold water when the pre-pandemic vacancy rate was, was so low. And I, I think the, the graphs shown in Exhibit CA really show a similar trends uh, in just the natural ebb and flow of retail markets and, and showed all shopping centers are struggling right now, really with the exception of kind of a more, more of, well, Stanford Shopping Center being, uh, being somewhat of an exception. It just seems clear that the current vacancy rate is a result of the pandemic and we'll likely see a dramatic change to their vacancy rate in the coming months. I mean, with, with, the, with the continuing successful out, uh, um, rollout of the vaccinations, Pali students going to be able to start returning to, to campus and, uh, and going over to town and country, Stanford students returning to campus this spring. Um, I, I think we're going to be seeing kind of retail coming, coming back. Also, on a, another point, I don't really see how allowing medical offices or medical related tenants is going to achieve the applicant's goal of driving foot traffic back to town and country in order to increase the sales volumes uh, of existing tenants. And I, I kind of really look at the letter that the applicant sent, uh, the March 2nd, 2021 letter to Director Late, saying that it will take years for these uses to begin generating the level of foot traffic needed in order to assist existing re uh, retail tenants. First, the applicant objects to the PTC's recommendation of imposing a deadline of December 31st, 2021 for medical offices to enter their leases because, quote, it would be virtually impossible to draft and execute leases with five to 10 medical office tenants in that time. So we won't even get new uses in town and country in order to help existing retailers within the year. And then second, the applicant admits these type of uses take years to develop their customer base. And in objecting to the limited occupancy use of 10 years that the PTC recommended, the applicant wrote in that same letter, quote, these businesses rely on the surrounding neighborhood to become its regular clientele. This customer base will take years to develop. So if the goal is to generate increased foot traffic to town and country during the economic crisis, this change is not going to generate that increased use for several months, uh, if, if not years. And so I really don't see how, how this, this, this motion and this, uh, this plan is really going to help generate the additional foot traffic in town and country that's really going to be able to help the, the existing uh, retailers. And, and just final point, you know, I really think this is a good example of why we really need an economic development manager. Uh, within within the city, whose whose job really it is to focus on this uh, at a, at a strategic high level, um, so we're not doing these kind of piecemeal um, solutions. So that's those are my comments. I, I won't be supporting the motion. Councilman Bracu. Uh, my question was: um, Has has staff looked at the opportunity cost um, opportunity costs? for placing one type of business over another? I'm not sure I understand the question, Councilmember. Well, obviously, you know, we have retail that, you know, that this is uh, retail and retail like that a medical office or medical use is gonna be taking on. So what are the opportunity costs that we're gonna be losing out on or we're gonna be gaining on, you know, uh, should, should we do the switch um, in, five years and 10 years, you know, so I guess a study would have been uh, good to go with that in order for us to kind of take into consideration whether, you know, changing the type of business over another is a prudent way to go about. And since I didn't see it, I guess it wasn't in here. Um, I mean, the silence is there, but I- I would note, Council Member uh, Ku, that under resource impact, we do include some estimate of the difference in use, but again, it, I, I think where you're headed would require a little more um, scenario playing as to assumptions as to what would happen 
in in different um, situations. So we did not take it to that step. Understood, and 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 that's. And I concur with uh, Council Member Stone. You know that's why we do need some more uh, strategic, comprehensive planning using somebody who is uh, um, who knows this line of work and is not guessing uh, and providing these kind of answers to us. Um, with regards to the motion, I do agree with Council Member Stone uh, also that. A lot of this, uh, we're not looking at it strategically. We're not looking at it comprehensively. So we're going about saying that this is gonna be a pilot or experimental, only that this is gonna be permanent. This is a change in our municipal code that is gonna be permanent. And um, this is not the only property owner or only area of uh, where commercial business is that is hurting. Um, many areas, many property owners and businesses are hurting and so, I really truly think that we're jumping the gun on looking at this. First, we should be looking at the entire program comprehensively uh, and then going about making a decision with more information, with more information to help us decide, especially data. Um, one of the things that I've asked for before is, is for the city to, I mean, I know that we have um, a staff member ha that has been in connection uh, in connection with a lot of the community for up, Uplift Local and um, can perhaps put together a list of those businesses that have remained and are going to continue, those to ha that have shut down forever and those that have moved to another location and continuing on, whether it's in a bigger location, a larger facility or smaller. But these are information that would be really helpful uh, for for council members to understand what we're deciding on, especially uh, trying to come back um, um, for uh, an economic recovery. Um, I too will not be supporting this motion. Council member Phil Seth. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a question to the applicant if I could. Sure. Um, do, you, do, you, do you folks have a picture of sort of how much of your traffic in town and country village comes from, you know, is, is local in Palo Alto versus comes from other towns? I mean, have, have you folks looked at that? Have you got any data on that? Dean, do you have um, anything on that? I do not, I apologize. Not something that we, we track. We don't, we don't ask our customers where they're from. I mean, it could be some of our marketing people have some information and data that we could get back to you with, but I apologize. We don't. I mean, I mean, I assume that the town and country village people don't drive here from, from Sunnyvale to go to town. I mean, uh, to, to uh, Trader Joe's. Yeah. I mean, our, drive our, our from Sunnyvale to go to Trader Joe's, but some of the specialty retail, sorry, go ahead. Our, our trade area is, uh, and we do every five years, we do a pretty detailed study of who our customer is and where they're coming from. Uh -huh. But, you know, our trade area is, um, is up to, you know, on a regular basis is up to 10 miles or more away. So okay. we don't, if we draw obviously a lot of Palo Altans, but we also draw because of the uniqueness of our uh, of some of our retailers. We draw from many of the surrounding communities as well. Okay. 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 Thanks very much. Uh, I haven't said anything yet. So, I guess at a, at, a, at the high level, I just I just think all this request goes directly against our ground floor protection ordinance. And it's hard to imagine where we protect retail if not in a retail shopping center. Um, I'd, I'd like to see us work with our retail centers uh, to revitalize the retail experience, but um, as the economy recovers. Uh, but I, I find myself agreeing with uh, Council Member Stone, and I won't be supporting this motion. Um, Vice Mayor Burt. Yes, uh, first, a um, couple of follow up questions. Uh, there was a reference to street facing locations, and I'm not clear what's being referred to there. Are they talking about the public streets uh, or the what I'll call the interior streets? 
of town and country because there are certain buildings, building three, building four, building one, and then a portion of building five that I, uh, are not really facing the interior streets or the exterior streets, town and country. Uh, Director Late, uh, do you know what was being referred to by street facing? And does it only, were they only referring to public streets or what I was calling the interior streets? Public streets, Embarcadero and El Camino. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've been struggling with uh, the actual description that the applicant had talked about the, the types of medical uses that they um, are hoping to attract. And those are closer, or a number of them are closer to what uh, I think we might describe as retail-like medical services. Uh, and I think that that is a category that we should be um, considering not only for this location, but for some of these other areas of the city where we're looking at do, how do we loosen up uh, the, the retail uh, definition without abandoning it, uh, without just simply saying traditional medical offices can replace retail in a core retail area. And um, so uh, there are, uh, I, I really take, I'm taking at face value what the applicant said is the examples of the types of uses. Uh, and I'd like to incorporate that in motion, whether the makers accept it or as a substitute. Um, and that is, um, to allow up to the 10% as stated um, um, of uh, retail-like medical services uh, that which staff would return with a definition in code of, of that new retail category. Um, and that those would be allowed in the non- interior or exterior street facing locations of the shopping center. And that the period, initial period that they would be allowed would be uh, for the next, for leases commencing within the next two years. And uh, if the uh, maker and seconder accept that, um, uh, great. Otherwise, I'll, I will propose it as an amendment. Can I, can I ask the applicant just for their thoughts on, on this um, like proposal? Um, I, I would, let, me, let me just say, I, I guess no, I just one, one point of clarification. I'm not sure, uh, Vice, uh, Chair Burt, um, Vice Mayor Burt, the Exterior street facing would be anything straight facing El Camino and Embarcadero. I believe all of the other retail facades of the property are facing an interior parking aisle, basically, which are not, not a street, but all of the other retail faces a parking aisle. The only areas that don't are the rear doors. Um, I can't think of any places that we would actually be able to put these. So. For instance, where you have building three, does that have ground floor retail? I don't go to that location. Building three has ground floor retail facing south, which just goes from Jamba Juice over towards the courtyard um, by where the village cheese house was. That faces the parking aisle to the south of it. The back of the building is a cement block wall. So there are no other, and the side of the building is a cement block wall. Okay, so I will um, uh, I will delete the portion on um, uh, uh, the section that says and that they would be allowed in the non-interior or exterior street facing the shopping center. Deleting that portion. Thank you, and, and Jim, maybe you want to comment on anything related to the years. Um, yeah, I. I would just add that, you know, I, we believe strongly our interests are aligned on this. We've always wanted to uh, select 
medical uses that would be additive to the retail environment that exists and to improve upon it, not detract from it. So we are open uh, to um, your suggestion of, um, of retail-like medical, and we look forward to um, seeing what staff um, comes up with just for uh, administering that. Okay, well, then I will, I will accept it. I don't know about the seconder. I will also accept that. Okay, um, I'll just then speak briefly uh, to that amendment if I'm allowed. Um, I think that we, we want to strike a balance between retaining a true retail atmosphere and um, acknowledging uh, some transition in uh, the different uh, forms of retail that are occurring. And, um, and even though uh, I think that we will see some significant rebound from where we are right now, uh, we have an uncertain future in the retail. And I think this is uh, a modest uh, compromise that is something that we could uh, look at uh, more broadly in some other areas of the city uh, without opening the floodgates to medical office uh, replacing retail. Okay, uh, Mr. Rubinson, your hand's up. Did you wanna say anything else? Or no, I'm sorry, that was that was left over from before. I apologize. Okay. Uh, Mr. Late. Thank you. Uh, just on the um, on the returning to council with a definition for the retail health piece of it, uh, is it the expectation that that would return to the council in the second reading of the ordinance that needs to come back to you? Or is this a separate endeavor that we need to go back to the Planning and Transportation Commission uh, to uh, resolve first. I would hope it just comes back to us. So I think we have to move kind of quickly because it seems like there's a really there's a sky high vacancy right rate right now. And I think if we don't stem the tide, we're going to lose a lot more. So staff, thank you for that. Um, so staff would prepare a, um, a definition of, of um, retail health that uh, would be focused I think principally at the town and country center uh, for starters. And then as we work, and that will be reflected in your second reading ordinance. And then we will continue to work with the uh, planning and transportation commission based on the city council's direction in November uh, to further refine that definition uh, that may have more of a citywide applicability. Okay. so. Uh... Just want to remind council members, we get uh, scheduled for two more minutes on this item. Uh, council member Stone. Yeah, I'm trying to, still trying to understand the, the, the well, I, I guess I get the process of where this would go next. I'm, on, I'm uncomfortable with this not going back to, to PTC. I, I think already the process that has been carried out uh, on, the, on this issue with it having, having, gone, having gone to PTC, the PTC recommendation, and staff and the applicant working together to revise the uh, the proposal and it never going back to PTC when my understanding from that PTC meeting already had one of the commissioners who were on the fence uh, agreed to vote for the the for the motion coming out of PTC uh, based on those on those on that exact motion and now that has been changed uh, and I, I think this is an interesting suggestion, one that I would be open to, to revisiting the, the retail-like medical services, definitely not the medical office, but the retail-like, um, but I, I'd like to see it follow through, I think, the proper process. So I, I think that needs to go to the PTC. And if it's, so if it's just coming back to us on the second reading, I would vote against it. If it's going to the PTC and following that process, I would, I would support that with the understanding that this is not committing us to making this change at the, at the present time. Okay, uh, so I'm going to suggest we go ahead and vote on the motion. Um, start of uh, council member of Ku. No. 
Councilmember Stone? No. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. Vice Mayor Burt? Sorry. Yes. Councilmember Cormack? Yes. I'm going to vote no. Uh, Councilmember Felseth? No. Okay, so that fails on a 3 4 vote. Do uh, we... uh, Mayor? Yeah. Um, so I would like to uh, move that we um, move the, the same motion with the exception that um, the um, uh, item return to the PTC rather than directly to the council for a second reading. Second. I have a question. No. Okay, um, so we have a motion. Do you guys want to speak to your motion, Vice Mayor Burke? I need to. No. Council Member Cormack. Just doing some math. Okay. Uh, Council Member Coop. So the motion actually does. Um, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the motion does state that we do adopt an ordinance, right? So town and country would be able to proceed with this uh, ordinance and move forward with the medical offices or retail-like medical in that location that they specified. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, can I speak to that, Mayor? Yep. So that's, that's correct, Council Member. Uh, if approved, the ordinance would return to the City Council for a second reading, uh, but the other part would not have been resolved at that point. And um, in 30 days after the second reading, uh, town and country would be allowed to implement the language that um, uh, is included in the, in the packet um, this evening. So I, I think there's probably two options really if the council wants to proceed down this path. One is to remand the um, ordinance back to the Planning and Transportation Commission uh, for the sole purpose of uh, figuring out a retail um, uh, health definition. And, uh, or alternatively, you could continue this to a date uncertain. Uh, actually, yeah, you could continue this to a date uncertain and, um, and we could return to the council with that definition it's really up to you if you wanted to go through the Planning and Transportation Commission first or not. We did have notice public hearings. Um, it did go through a process and you're just trying to find out what this retail health definition is. So it would be appropriate also if you wanted to continue uh, to a date uncertain and then we could return back to the city council with the definition. Any other comments? Councilman? I was, um, my, well, my, my whole point from before, while I would, I like this, that I would have the definition of retail, like medical services and so forth. The point is, it's not discussed as a comprehensive, in a comprehensive manner for the entire city and for the other property owners in the other locations, other commercial districts. So um, it, it, it's a case of fairness for me right now. Um, so... That's why I asked the question of um, whether this would become an ordinance once we have the second reading for town and country specifically. And I, I think I got my answer. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Stone. Yeah, sorry, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little confused now. My, my understanding was that, that this was not passing the, the, the amendment, that what we were doing was, was revising the amendment to, to not allow medical office, but to possibly now allow retail-like medical services, depending on what, that what the definition staff comes up with, how PTC vets it, and then it comes back to us, not on a second reading, but um, I guess as a, by continuing this. That was my understanding. I, if the motioner and seconder can clarify that. That was, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Vice Mayor Bird. Uh, that was uh, the intention. And so Director Late, um, uh, what change in the uh, motion would be necessary to clarify that that's the intention? Well, I guess the part I'm struggling with is a Romanet one, which says you would allow this change 
subject to a new definition that the PTC uh, forwards on to the city council. And so you would adopt this ordinance, but they wouldn't not be able to, is it, is the, if the idea, we wouldn't be able to process any permits to convert any retail uh, to medical space um, without that definition. And if that's, if that's the intent, there's really no reason in adopting this ordinance this evening because it's missing that key right. piece. I think you can't say adopt an ordinance because the clock will start ticking, basically. Okay, so is that, and that's what I was trying to get at, what corrected, correction to the motion. So should it um, be to request staff uh, to um, uh, return to the council with a proposed ordinance uh, uh, subsequent to or including uh, the PTC recommendation on a definition of medical uh, or retail like medical services to be incorporated. So if it's your, uh, yes, Vice Mayor, if it's your intent to get the Planning and Transportation Commission's involvement, I would simply remand the ordinance back to the PTC uh, and solicit their um, recommendation on a definition for retail health. Everything else about the application would stay the same and we would return with the PTC's recommendation. Okay, uh, and uh, I did wanna include this uh, two year period for them Understood. to be able to, yes. We would All fold right. that into the, yeah, that should be a part of the, the motion as well, and we would include that. Okay, let's see if we can, if the clerk has magically captured uh, the intention here. And then I need to see whether the seconder agrees. So uh, then we delete B, is that correct, uh, Jonathan? Just, uh, uh, but one the small letter I would remain. Uh, well, no, I guess that it's all replaced. B is all replaced by the new A, is that correct? And that captures what we were talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose uh, you can get rid of C and B. Uh, a would um, uh, direct PTC to review the proposed um, ordinance for inclusion of a retail health definition. And um, two year limit on um, to execute a lease. Okay, and that replaces everything below. That's right, and then vice mayor and, and to the makers, uh, just a question, Do, would you want the retail health definition to apply just to town and country or citywide? Um, well, I, I, I would like it to be a new uh, retail definition that we could adopt at other, um, uh, other areas of the city, uh, but not be bound to do so. So that would be the next discussion. Okay. Uh, and this, and, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Please. I'm ready to weigh in when you're ready. <laughs> Go right ahead. Um, uh, two things then to add. Uh, one would be, um, I would like us to have a short time frame on when this comes back to council. Um, what does staff think is reasonable to get this in front of the PTC and get it back to us? Maybe I should ask for aspirational director late and then we'll back off to reasonable. Yeah, I know the PTC is getting pretty full uh, with, some, with some meetings, but um, Aspirationally, I'd say within the next two to three months, we can go to the PTC. And be back or just go to the PTC? PTC. And then it would take another six weeks or so to get to the council thereafter. Can we agree that it comes back to us before the council break? We will certainly endeavor to do that. Great. We will share that aspiration. Okay. <laughs> Bring the ordinance back to council for consideration um, you know, before the council's summer break. And then I think the other thing I think we should capture because it's changed since it went to the PTC is that the 10% square footage. I think the PTC had a different number. So I think it'd be appropriate for us to go ahead and make that determination tonight. Vice Mayor Burt, do you agree that we should include that in A? Um, I didn't, I wasn't uh, up to speed on that. So uh, please I think it. when it was at PTC, it was 14%. And then it's been modified between PTC and coming to us. So I think... Um, yeah, we wanted to say 10%. Yes. Yes. So we should incorporate that to... And the proposed ordinance did have the 10%. Is that right, Director Late? Yes, as I'm understanding... Okay. So that's captured. ...for the ordinance, but we need this retail definition to be added. 
this okay. retail health definition. And it would be planning and transportation commission. I think we should have an A um, to review for inclusion to review. Okay, that's fine. And so A2, where do we where do we want to put the ten percent? Okay. We need. To I, put it's included. I've, I've just verified it's included because it's in the proposed ordinance. Okay. So the PTC will, I'm sure, pick up on that. Okay, okay. I'm comfortable with this. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak again um, to this motion. So this still feels very much like spot zoning to me. I, I think that once Stanford and Pally are back, it'll be more than just a small rebound for town and country. I mean, we are, we are in this pandemic. And again, I, I think Councilmember Stone made some really good points. When you look at the data, um, it seemed like they were doing extremely well. And again, I, I would like us to um, continue to support our retail protection ordinance with uh, more retail experiences. I understand the change here is to try to get to retail medical, um, but I, I still don't think I'm gonna support this motion. Um, Council member, uh, I'm gonna go to Council member Phil Seth, he hasn't said much. And then Council member Stone, if, if your hand's up again. And Vice Mayor Burt, you're, yeah, thank you. So, so, so uh, I think this is the right general direction. Um, what I'm taking away or taking away from this, this discussion and the, and the analysis that preceded it the argument here is not really directly related to the pandemic or COVID. It's the broader notion that uh, the internet is changing the nature of retail and we need to respond. And the evidence of that, uh, at least presented here, is the occup occupancy statistics over the last five or 10 years uh, in town country village. And that the notion is that, and it's been said many, many times by many, many people, right? Um, in many arguments and so forth, that retail, if it's to survive, needs to, needs to change. Uh, nobody knows quite exactly how it's gonna change, but, uh, but it needs to change. Um, and it's a long-term kind of thing. I have to say that I actually like this, I actually sort of feel the opposite about this from council member Koo, which is, you know, I do think it makes sense to, to try stuff in a few places before we roll it out citywide, at least until, at least until we see other cities do things. If we're going to, we're going to break new ground, right? Uh, uh, I, I like the, the, the notion of proceeding carefully, right? Um, and I don't mean in a temporary sense, because what we're talking about here is rezoning 10% of town and country village for medical office on a permanent basis, right? As opposed to, or for something on a permanent basis, uh, as opposed to you know, a, a time-limited experiment. Um, I'm pretty impressed with the Ellis team. My recollection of Town and Country Village is when they took it over 15 years ago or whatever it was, is that it, Town and Country Village had become sort of slow and moribund and the Ellis team came in and recurated it and uh, you know, there was some controversy around that. There were some longtime tenants that had been there that weren't there anymore. But the result was, uh, you know, a dramatic uptick in, in usage of that area by the, the community. So I take what the Ellis team says pretty seriously here. I think they understand what they're doing, right? And so I think there's some gravity here on this. That said, in a perfect world, you know, are, are we ready to pull a plug on retail? I think that's, that's one of the things that's floating around the outside of this. Right? And in a perfect world, we'd be past the pandemic and we'd have some data to see if the assertion that, you know, in fact, vacancy rates are gonna, gonna continue to rise because of the pressure on, uh, uh, on conventional retail online, uh, uh, the online shift. You know, I, I, wish, I, I wish the pandemic hadn't happened for all kinds of reasons. One of them is obviously it's hurt everybody, but you know, we'd, we'd have a better picture of this. And so in a perfect world, you know, we, we'd come back and revisit this, uh, you know, 
you know, sometime after, as you said, Pally was back and Stanford was back and everybody else was back and destination, destination retail was somewhat back and so forth. We don't really have that luxury, right? Um, uh, at this point, right? Or at least we, or, or tonight, that's not the case. So those are the things I'm sort of juggling in my mind. I think that the motion that you've got is let's go, let's go think through some of these uh, a broader definition of, of retail. I think that's the right thing for us to do. Um, I'm not certain that if it comes back to us in June, I would vote to proceed with this right now. I mean, again, I, you know, if this is a long-term thing, it's a long-term thing. And uh, I, I, I'd love to see a little more data and uh, an end of the pandemic before we, before we really you know, throw the switch on this kind of stuff. That said, I think it is the right, uh, the right direction. Um, so that's where my head is at on this. And, uh, and you know, I've rambled on here, but I haven't said much before. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so I hesitate to go do another round of comments. Um, Council Member Stone, do you have something you kind of get off your chest? Just kind of a quick question of, uh, of the motioner and the seconder to be clear on something. Thing. Uh, and, and real quick, just want to say I, I agree 100% with Council Member Phil Sith as far as his kind of his view on this and also agreeing. I, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see what this revised definition is when it comes back to us. I am definitely not making any promises either way that I would vote on it. I, I really want to see this fleshed out a little more and to understand the details before uh, before moving. But I do like the idea that of possibly expanding this definition and having um, um, and just kind of seeing uh, with this uh, using town and country as a test subject uh, for it is is intriguing. But real quick, just a question of the motion or seconder. Um, so this would mean that we are not we're not entertaining medical office use within the ten percent of town and country. We are only entertaining the idea of a of a retail health medical, uh, sorry, retail-like use, correct? Correct. Okay. And I, Director Late, does that, does that need to be more clear in, in this motion that we, we're not asking PTC to re-exam, to, to examine the medical use, um, or is that, is, is the motion fine as it is? I, I'm imagining that there is a new definition called retail health, health or something like that. Um, which would be a new definition in our code. And, and, and that the ordinance then would allow that retail health uh, for 10% of the uses if endorsed by council. At the risk of snatching, what do they say? Defeat from the jaws of victory here. I do want to uh, ensure on behalf of staff and I start with director late, but also to a certain extent from the, the applicant, are we headed down a path that when we come back is perhaps broad enough to allow a project to proceed or will it be so tightly defined that both staff will be tied up in knots and the applicant may not find a sufficiently defined use to be able to, to accept. So, Mr. Lee, perhaps I put that at your feet. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I, we're happy to do what the council asked us, asked, asked us to do. Uh, and if this is um, moving toward, uh, you know, uh, a, a type of policy framework that the city council is interested in endorsing, I think that's fantastic. And we will do that to the extent that uh, council members feel four months from now or five months from now, whenever this comes back, that uh, they wouldn't be inclined to support it then. Uh, I, I'm not sure in the utility of going through this effort uh, when you have a lot of other things that you're asking us to do. Um, not that I need you to you know, pledge your you know, direction here, but I just want us to be mindful of that when you take your vote on this motion. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and call the vote. Um, I think we're at Council Member Stone. Yes. Council Member Tanaka. Yes. Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. Council Member Cormack. Yes. Um, I'm still going to vote no. 
Council Member Filseth. I'm still going to vote now. And Council Member Koo. No. Okay, that passes on a 4 3 vote. Thank you for that. Again, I just want to point out to Council, we have a very rich schedule tonight, so we're going to have to try to make up some time. Um, we've also had requests for breaks, so I'm going to suggest that we break until 730 and then we'll pick up our next action item. So thank you.
see see four council members. Um, so if you're back, uh, there we go. Let's go ahead and proceed. So we're going to move on to uh, item number four, which is uh, community and economic recovery work plan. Um, does staff want to go ahead and start a presentation? Yes, thank you. Oh, and actually staff has already got the slide up. I believe we are ready to go. So why don't we jump forward in the interest of time, we're gonna truncate our presentation uh, and our uh, maestro uh, director Nose will, or assistant city manager Nose will take the um, command of the presentation. So let me just make a, a couple of context setting comments. And in fact, uh, perhaps jump to the next slide in particular just to note that the item here uh, before the council this evening, something you've already seen. And so back at the end of January, both on January 25th, as well as in your priority setting session on the 31st or 30th, uh, you discussed the specific elements of a recovery work plan on that basis uh, and including um, uh, both what staff had presented at the time and the council directed us to add uh, several items of particular interest um, with the direction to come back and tell us what we could not do. Well, pleasant surprise, staff is saying we can do it all. And uh, at the same time, want to caution in advance that we're telling you we'd be tapped out uh, by doing it all. And so we'll walk you through uh, an overview of the work plan ahead, um, but do want to emphasize that point uh, that we do think we can uh, really make extraordinary progress with this ambitious work plan and uh, be able to get moving and keep moving on all the items that council had identified as uh, key elements uh, moving forward. Uh, so with that, uh, let me turn it over to ACM Nose uh, to then take us forward. Great. Uh, thank you, City Manager, City Manager Shikata. Good evening, Council. Kylie Nose, Administrative Services Director. Uh, and I guess in the room, helping out City Manager's office. <laughs> so again, really what, just kind of going down memory lane, what is on this slide is really here just for reference for the council and the public. These were the original work plan items that the council reviewed in January. And at the very bottom are the additional four projects that the council had asked staff to add to the work plan, reprioritize and work through. Um, so uh, as city manager Shikata said, we are here ultimately tonight to seek council's approval on the work plan. Uh, and that's what's before you. So high level, some things that have changed. Since January 25th, the council had their um, retreat and adopted four priorities for 2021. And there were items on this work plan that have synergies with those um, priorities for council. So you can see on the left in the green are the 2021 council priorities. And then the projects that are the primary, I shouldn't say the only, but the primary projects that are working to support those pri priorities. And then specifically the last one, economic recovery, we have the community and economic recovery work plan that's to the right, uh, where we have uh, still the same focus areas managing through the pandemic, community wellness and well-being, focused business support and city priority initiatives. And we have revised projects A through K. Um, on this plan, you can see we've denoted for the most part the same um, items that we've reviewed previously. Uh, we've updated the, the language and for areas that we've already adopted funding um, per the council's prior direction uh, and allocated that. We've also noted areas where as staff work to build out those items and return to council, um, we will identify funding at that time um, as necessary. So you'll see on here that C is provide and update a clear and comprehensive workplace activation plan. Um, that's one of the changes, excuse me. Another change is at the bottom, actually K, the initiate and return to council with recommendations for an updated Foothills Fire Protection Plan and required resources. So um, as we said, we didn't really, we're saying we we're trying to accomplish all of them uh, and how staff expects to be able to do that is also through uh, kind of articulating the scope of resources for these projects. So these projects and the work necessary associated with them is going to ebb and flow depending on the project. 
For example, as you manage through the pandemic, maintaining services while main, managing our pandemic needs is super high um, in terms of resource needs right now. Um, but that's because we're still in the pandemic. We're moving from the different tiers and we're opening, closing, reopening, reclosing uh, various things. But as the pandemic becomes more and more um, stable, then we expect that the staff resources associated with that will, will ebb. Uh, while others will start to flow as we move towards more community engagement for these larger projects, um, as we work towards um, building out, you know, new and existing community wellness uh, programs and projects, um, and things like the Fiber to the Home initiative, uh, potential ballot measures. So this is illustrative of hopefully the, the ebbs and flows that staff are expecting uh, in order to accomplish these various uh, projects. In the staff report, there are four areas that we've outlined that it would be helpful to seek uh, and have a discussion with the council on um, that will impact the work of staff in these project areas. Uh, specifically, we can go through them. One is the idea of um, hybrid council meetings or what council meetings look like post pandemic. So uh, currently there is uh, an emergency order that allows us to operate as we are um, where we are remote. Um, but ultimately, what does this look like once the um, pandemic uh, ends? And I don't know that ending is the right word, but I think you understand what I'm saying. So there are legislation um, that's out there that's looking at um, would we make any of those emergency orders um, ongoing. Uh, we have the supporting of the Wellness Wednesdays uh, that you've seen as in the city manager's reports. Um, also looking at adding a consultant based on your conversation just earlier tonight, uh, really bringing on a consultant to facilitate refining and defining a scope for the city's economic support um, and having that conversation with the city council. And the last one is uh, having staff working towards supporting um, augmentation of existing resources. So that means ballot measures. Uh, so for example, last time we did consultants for polling, analysis, um, and outreach services. Uh, and universal to all of these, obviously, um, we do have existing authorized staffing that may be vacant in certain areas that we would seek to fill uh, in order to accomplish the work plan that is before you. Next steps, uh, this is the same in terms of the work plan that the council previously uh, reviewed and provided direction on. Governance remains with the city council and each of these projects will be brought forward um, as appropriate and as needed for them. Um, and the community engagement is really tailored to each of the work items. And that's because they run such the gamut in terms of who may or may not want to engage on an individual project. Um, budgeted resources, staff are bringing those forward as needed. Um, and so I guess that's demonstrated by the, the approach that we've already taken just between January and now of identifying resources uh, needs and then bringing them forward to council for approval. Um, the one that's before you tonight is a net zero, uh, just reallocating money between two different pots in order to move forward on the economic work. Um, and then ultimately uh, we're seeking council's prior or approval of the, the work items and the work plan that's before you this evening so that we can get to work uh, and keep going on these projects and actually uh, move forward. The next slides we're going to just kind of quickly skim through uh, and therefore the public and the council um, in your packets in the record. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to actually move straight to uh, Director O'Kane, who will give a brief little update about community wellness and well being. Kristen? Um, thank you, Kylie. I'm Kristen O'Kane with Community Services. And um, community wellness and well-being is not only what we can add to our plate, but really to look at the, um, the existing programs and services that we're already providing and have been able to um, provide in a alternative way than what we had been doing in the past. So you've heard a lot about Wellness Wednesdays. I won't go into that. Um, but we are also looking at putting together a comprehensive community calendar that will be on the city's new website. So sort of a easy place for residents to go and search for either an event or a program or a volunteer opportunity um, that will 
it'd be much easier to navigate than um, what we currently have. Um, we also have quite a few upcoming community events that I wanted to share. Um, one is the May FET parade. So I've been told that last year was the first year since World War II that Palo Alto didn't have a May FET parade. So this year we are really trying to rally the community to keep the tradition alive through alternate activities around the theme, What a Wonderful World, celebrating children, diversity, and the world we live in. So you'll see more on that in the next week or so and more details on how the community can get involved. Um, we are also looking at movies in the park and hoping we'll be able to have musical performances as well um, as the weather gets nicer, people are really gonna be eager to get outside and see their neighbors. Um, even if it's from a distance, um, I think people are really eager to, to do that. Um, libraries and community services continue to offer teen programs, including our teen leadership programs that continue through the end of the school year and other programs to connect teens and provide them with valuable resources. So several programs coming out of the library that I wanted to mention um, are, the, are their book to action series, which is focused on the theme of racial equity and anti-racism education and advocacy. So this program takes the book club concept and expands it into a robust community-wide program that includes book discussions, a speaking event, and a service project. They're also doing a summer reading program, which is called Reconnect with Your Community. And in addition to that, um, they're working on a collaborative with um, Hewlett Packard and many community partners to gather unused computers and donate them to community members who may need them. Um, so a lot coming up and we'll, we're gonna continue to offer our typical summer camps and programs. Um, they might look a little bit different, but we're still gonna have them as a resource for the community um, and look forward to um, opening up more as much as we can as um, we move into different tiers. Um, with that, we do have a video that um, we're going to show you that is just a showcase of all the different um, programs and services that we are still able to provide to the community. Most are virtual, some are in person as allowed, but this really demonstrates how we've been able to connect and hopefully contribute to overall wellness as we recover from the pandemic and until we are able to gather again as a community. So um, hit it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh oh, do we need to restart that with the um, music that computer sound and enabled? Hold on. Apologies for some of those hiccups, but that really was a video to, you know, hopefully ground us on the community aspect of the ongoing work that's associated with this work plan. So 
ultimately, uh, before you tonight is the work plan for council's review and approval uh, across the four focus areas, as well as a net zero amendment to the budget, uh, moving funding between uh, two different COVID-19 recovery pots in order to facilitate that um, economic work um, associated with the, the work plan. Great, thank you. If I might, uh, Mr. Mayor, just make one last comment. Um, it might have been some confusion just in terms of the specificity necessary on Council's action. Other than the, the specific uh, appropriations action uh, identified, um, basically we're ready to roll with everything else. We do not need any uh, specific action as it relates to ballot measures uh, or uh, other items. Uh, those will be coming back to you in the upcoming months as the work proceeds. So, you know, we're gonna to go to the public first, but so the question tonight is really uh, just endorsing the prioritization that you, that you guys have come up with and then this fit shifting $50,000 to business and communication support, right? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so if you, let's go to the public for comment. If you'd like to speak to this item, please raise your hand. And um, we're going to go ahead and go with two minutes just because we're behind schedule. Any members of the public that wish to speak to this item, please raise your hand at this time. At this time, we have four speakers. We have Don Jackson to be followed by Lauren Smith. Don, go ahead. You have two minutes. Don, go ahead, you have two minutes, there you go. Honorable council, I'd like to voice my support for two areas under consideration in the community and economic recovery work plan. The first area is work to support the fiber to the home initiative. Telelearning and telework from home have been a crucial capability during the pandemic. And they will continue to be an important tool in reducing future commuting and business travel in support of our decarbonization goals. Unfortunately, all this teleconferencing has highlighted the significant limitations of existing broadband service offerings by commercial ISPs. As part of the fiber expansion project, CPAU staff have been working with a consultant on plans, costs, and proposals for fiber to the home network. My understanding is that this work will be presented to both the UAC and council in the next month or two. And it is my hope that this will provide us the basis for making a commitment to proceed with high-speed symmetric broadband. If staff needs additional budget and or headcount to complete or carry forward this work, I fully support that. The second area is work to update the SCAP and refining our electrification goals. Electrification is not going to be easy or without cost. It's important that we decide as a community what level of support and effort we are willing and able to make toward these goals so that we can focus our time and resources on the programs that council adopts. I'm looking forward to upcoming staff reports with proposals and estimated costs and that they will, and my hope is that they will provide the context, data and estimates that we'll need to make decisions of how to move forward with electrification. Again, I support additional budget and or uh, staff to facilitate this work. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Don. Our next speaker is Lauren Smith to be followed by Rebecca Eisenberg and then Monica Young Arima. Lauren, you have two minutes, go ahead. Good evening, City Council and thank you for the opportunity. At their February 1st retreat, City Council adopted three priorities for 2021 housing, mobility, and sustainability, roughly speaking. Two of these priorities, mobility and sustainability, are particularly particular interest relative to the impact of providing fiber to the premise or fiber to the home. Namely, sustainability. In the context of the changing climate, fiber to the home reduces vehicle, vehicular traffic and by default, carbon emissions. New revenues help build fiscal sustainability, both for fiber to the premise itself and other city services, for example, uh, electric 
as highlighted earlier via SCADA and AMI. Secondly, mobility, improving mobility for all, reducing the need for vehicu vehicular tra traffic and by default carbon emissions. And interestingly, and certain, certainly something worthy of a study would be the further beneficial results from fiber to the premise initiative, namely making biking easier and safer, improving the safety of our residential streets, improving the quality of life for Palo Alto citizens, that is faster internet, increased bandwidth, greater reliability, and fiber supporting demands, broadband demands for the foreseeable future. And when speaking about the, the economic activity within our city, given the effects of the global pandemic, we must consider the huge business benefits of fiber internet connectivity, namely speed, cloud connectivity or access, reliability, signal strength, broad bandwidth, symmetric speed, latency, security, resistance to interference, cost savings, and support for HD video. Finally, the city of Palo Alto has the financial wherewithal to get this done. In addition to a fiber fund in excess of 30 million and the city's ability to raise funds via traditional methods, our US Congress is currently developing an infrastructure bill that does include broadband development similar to the infrastructure bill passed last summer. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg to be followed by Monica Young Arima and our final speaker will be Chris Robel. Rebecca, go ahead. I'm very grateful for this agenda item and the wonderful presentation given by the city staff. Um, unfortunately, looking at the video, I couldn't help but be reminded of how much we've lost due to the budget cuts that were created by the city council in response to our huge budget crisis caused by the pandemic and the fact that we don't have a more uh, ver varied source of, re of revenue for our city. Excuse me. What I wanted to say in this regard, sorry, I had, to, I had to quiet people in the background, is that for example, I saw the beloved Palo Alto Children's Theater whose budget was cut in half. I saw photos of some of our most beloved small businesses, some of which, were driven out of business by the greed of private landlords, such as Ellis Partners of Town and Country. And I saw, perhaps most movingly, Teen, Out, Teen Arts Council. I urge all of you on City Council to Google Palo Alto Teen Arts Council, where there you will see a gallery that I urge you to watch. That gallery is called Art in the Time of Isolation. And in that gallery, you'll see some of the most moving and heartbreaking works of art by some of the gifted and hardworking teenagers in our community who express in the ways that only well done art can do, how challenging this time is for our teenagers, how difficult it is for their mental health, for their stability, their ability to keep their relationships. This is an absolutely horrible time. And the teenagers speak for themselves. Please research that and look at that you'll also enjoy it. I urge the city council not to rely on the advice given by our city manager who has supported things such as the ex exploited, exploitative um, demand by Castilea to take over a residential community and the similarly exploitative demands by billionaire landlords. Please hire a, a development manager as councilperson Stone so articulately argued for. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker is Monica Young Arima to be followed by our final speaker, Chris Robel. Monica, go ahead, you have two minutes. Monica, go ahead, you have two minutes. You need to unmute from your side. Unmute, okay. There you go. Um, did you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Well, honorable council members, city managers and staff, thank you for the presentation of the community wellness programs that you have. Um, under the situation right now with the Asian hate crime, I was wondering whether some of these programs that you have like movies and books would include something um, involving more peaceful staying together. 
and or some education about the history background of some of the Asian um, Americans that are here long time ago. Not just everybody could be sent back home where they come from so easy. So that's what I would like to request to consider having some programs that will help on that aspect. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. And our final speaker is Chris Robel. Chris, go ahead. Great. Thank you, council members. Um, I wanted to speak on one item I noticed that was uh, covered by um, Kylie, which is the about a potential ballot measure. And I, this is the first I've heard of this, honestly. I don't know uh, exactly what's being thought there, but there was some mention, I think, of a parcel tax. So I would um, wholeheartedly urge you to make sure that's clearly understood by everybody. And uh, I know that you talked about um, doing so, but uh, making sure we understand that. From my standpoint, I think the first thing should be reducing city spending as much as possible. That means you know, fo focusing on the organizational structure, how can it be optimized? How can we reduce, how can we make sure we're getting the, the lowest possible price out of our contracts, dual sourcing, et cetera, settling for a Chevrolet and not necessarily a Cadillac in every instance, et cetera. And then after the city spending has been optimized as, as much as possible, and that does not mean reducing resident services, by the way, but optimizing it and still giving delivering the value to residents. Then the second point is um, how can we, um, you know what I look, let's look at the business tax element of it right the, and I I think that's we're the one of the only cities that does not have this and I really think the businesses should be bearing the brunt of this of any additional tax that's uh, being proposed so I'm will be wholeheartedly against any parcel tax or further tax on residents um, and uh, appreciate your consideration and making sure that that's socialized early and often thank you thank you Chris Mayor Du Bois that was our final speaker Okay, thank you for all the public comment. I know the last time I used that Cadillac analogy, somebody corrected me, it's probably Chevy Volt instead of a Tesla, at least. Um, all right, so let's come back to council. Um, again, unless unless people really have a change to the work plan, this is really a question of a $50,000 transfer tonight. So let's see if we can get through it somewhat expeditiously. Um, so does anybody want to have any questions, comments, or motions? Council Member Corman. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois. Um, I know you're anxious to get through them, but I, I do think this is the most important topic we have, and I appreciate staff bringing it back. So a um, couple questions. Um, what's the date for the May FET parade? We should let people know and get it on our calendars. Director O'Kane, it's usually the first Saturday. Right. Um, thank you for that question. So we're going to start um, ramping up April 1st um, with the final event being the first Saturday in May, which I believe is May 2nd. Okay. Um, or is it May 1st? Um, All right. The first, first Saturday, Saturday in May. May. All right. Everybody mark um, but it, <laughs> So it's not going to be also the typical parade that we've experienced in years past for um, because okay. of the pandemic. So we're doing a sort of hybrid model. We'll look this forward year. to hearing about that. Um, and let's see, well, um, I guess I'll just do other um, questions. Does the city anticipate doing a car parade for graduations again? That was actually one of the few huge hits we had last year. Um, is that something that the city is contemplating and chatting with the school district about? Well, I'll just, as uh, the awkward space fills the moment, um, jump in and say, we haven't talked about it at this point, but certainly would look forward to working with the school district on that. Okay, maybe the city and school liaison commissioners or commission members are listening and can take that. Council Member Cormack, if I, if I can, I'm the, as a student activities director at PALI, I, I basically am in charge of graduation and those events. And that is absolutely something that- All right, I why don't you Pally put on your other hat and refer it to yes. yourself. Okay. My, it was my Great. Pally Viking helmet. So yes, that is something we're, we're interested in doing and we'll be having communications with the city soon on that. Thank Great. you. Great. Great. Um, one of my questions is about the new online platform for multi-way communication that's in section H. What, what, what does that, what does that look like? Help me understand. Sounds exciting. So I'm sure there are ways we can use it. Does it have a name? 
Um, well, it starts with the new website. So that's one component of it. And uh, as we've talked about before, certainly um, light years, if not just years ahead of our existing light, uh, website. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we are working off of an existing uh, platform we have called Esri and maybe familiar for anyone that works in the GIS space that is able, uh, allowing us to build direct communications on top of it that will help us. Uh, aggregate information at a neighborhood level, excuse me, neighborhood level, as well as um, uh, take advantage of a number of other tools that we already have in place. So um, we're uh, believing that that will enable us to get something up and running very quickly uh, that will do both uh, facilitating communication, allow people to subscribe to particular topics they're interested in, and also connect us with uh, or connect residents with other uh, groups uh, that are uh, interested in, in specific topic areas. And with that, uh, Megan Horgan Taylor may wish to expand on what I just described, uh, but if not, I can leave it at that. Good evening, Council. Megan Horgan Taylor, Chief Communications Officer. Uh, Ed actually did a great job explaining the platform that we're uh, work partnering with the IT department to curate. Um, and so I'm just available for questions if there are any additional ones. Well, that's great. Um, just uh, doing a little foreshadowing. Uh, Council Member Stone and I are working on a colleague's memo and it sounds like this might be have some applicability to helping neighbors work together and find each other. So glad to hear about that. Um, I wasn't clear, section F, page 101, about the service agreement for, um, the, is that on our utilities bill or is that a separate bill? I know we've been asking for on-bill financing for other things a ton, so are we actually finally getting that or is this something else? Are they billed separately for this um, workplace safety? Uh, Council Member Cormac, can you say Yeah, page 101, it's section... I think it's F. F. This is the technical support for workplace environmental upgrades. And this one in particular. Energy service is, agreement. That's what it is. Yes, ESA. Yes, thank you. Let me see if Director Batchelor is able to jump in. Don't see him here. So I will jump in myself. So this actually builds on an existing program we have for commercial customers uh, to enable them to, um, again, both do initial assessments of upgrades that will be necessary, as well as through this program to be able to finance it uh, through, through their bills. So this is similar, um, but again, the, the on-bill finance uh, discussion has primarily, I believe, been focused on residential customers. So this is an existing program uh, for commercial customers. I see. Okay, that's helpful. I see my time has expired, but I do have um, some additional questions and comments for the next round. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. No problem. Uh, Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just kind of want to thank staff for for all the all the work you've been putting in. And I, I'm really excited about all the, the different events and just kind of a thinking outside of the box uh, approach that that uh, that our city staff has been doing to really engage the community and, and create some sort of some sense of community and, and normalcy during this incredibly challenging year. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm really excited for the increased opportunities that it looks like we're working on and uh, hopefully to have a summer where we're going to be able to have people outside and and really trying to enjoy the city and, and their neighbors again. Um, so really just thank you and and and, um, and hope we can do more of these type of uh, events in, in the future. Um, so a few few questions, a few questions and some and some comments. And actually, let me I'll, let me just start with the the, the kind of the comment regarding community recovery. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be really important to make sure that we're that we're utilizing our nonprofits more and helping them you know, helping them complete their jobs, uh, especially now during the pandemic uh, with and with all the financial issues that we're having. I, I think the the nonprofits that we have in the city are we're. we're we're so fortunate to have some of the some of the greatest nonprofits around that do so much heavy lifting for this for this city. And so I think one of the areas where I'd really like to see um, us invest more in is in our HisRap funding. I mean, the fact that the fact that we spend as much on our HisRap funding as it's almost the same price as it costs to install a, a bathroom in, in, in a public park. Uh, and I think we owe them. I, I think we owe them more. They do far. They do far 
so much great work in our community. So I'd really like to see how can we better continue to partner with them and to really uplift them so that they can continue to do the great work that they're doing. And it just kind of reminds me of some of work that we used to do when I served on the Human Relations Commission. And one of the things that the, that the HRC did back then, and I'm wondering if the city staff can find a way to be able to kind of pick this up and, and continue to do this as far as being hosted by the city, because it, it was a big lift for a commission to do. But what we did was we hosted various um, su uh, hosted summits with different nonprofits uh, on, on particular uh, nonprofits that were kind of focused on, on particular areas of interest. So one example, we did a senior citizen summit that was really uh, led by Chair Jill O'Nan. And it brought together all of these nonprofits who served who who served senior citizens within the community, and brought them into the brought them into the same room in in order to be able to talk with each other, understand where do we have gaps in services, where do we have some overlapping services. They were able to exchange information and network, and it was a really powerful event. So I'd really like to see maybe if the city can start um, can can start forming those events. And I, and I don't know is that is that something that the city that the city has been doing over the last few years and. I'm just unaware of it or, um, or something that, that they might be interested in doing. Um, thank you for that question, um, Council Member Stone. Um, so we have been doing some additional, um, the human services staff have been doing some um, community meetings like that. They focused on LGBTQ um, issues and concerns and had, um, various community meetings related to that. I will say that for the past year, um, our staff has been meeting regularly with our nonprofit service providers in Palo Alto. I believe it was weekly and now it could be bi-weekly or once a month. And it's really resulted in them being able to exchange information. They have helped each other out and, um, you know, La Comida provided meals to another organization that needed extra meals. So we're sort of serving as the convener of those nonprofits and organizing it, but it's really a way for them to discuss their challenges, opportunities, and how they can share resources. So that is continuing to go forward as well as a similar meeting for child care providers in Palo Alto. And if I we could... will be doing a summit, sorry. Go ahead, please. I was so just going to mention We are what... just going to be doing a summit on um, the status of women and girls in Palo Alto. And I'm not sure if that's the exact name, but um, I believe that will be happening in May. And it will model um, the same format that we did for the vaping summit, which was over a year ago um, that we held that. If I could uh, perhaps just dovetail with that and, and note that from a programmatic perspective, as, at least as it relates to this community and economic recovery, the specific examples that, that Kristen, uh, Director O'Kane mentioned are, are definitely within the wheelhouse. We've also got lots of other work that's happening. And so, for example, ISRAP funding will be coming to the council and uh, as a separate item, uh, as well as in the context of your overall budget strategy, uh, some discussion, additional discussion on uh, community needs and how best to meet them between both city provided services and nonprofits. So um, for the purpose of this work plan, I do believe that the, the community calendar that um, was mentioned earlier will be a particular focus point, but again, it's by no means the, the limit of what the city's doing in this area. Thank you, that, that, that's helpful. I'm excited for the HISRAP item to come back to council. And just a, a quick follow-up question then on that. Do you know, are we able to use the, the 12 back towards us? So I don't know if I cut out there, my, my computer froze a little bit. I believe you did, but nonetheless, I think you're referring to the 12 million uh, in American uh, recovery or relief program, as it's been called. I think we're still looking uh, at the confirmation of particular eligibility requirements. But again, we certainly expect that that will be part of the council's discussion uh, as a part of your development of the upcoming fiscal year budget. Great, thank you. Okay, I, I put up my hand to jump in line. Um, so uh, given the impacts, I would certainly support more funding for human services grant programs. And, and I think, again, what Councilmember Stone said, not, not blanket nonprofits, but really specifically uh, his RAP programs. Um, one thing that wasn't in here, I, I would like to broach, I think we need to start to think about when we would end the state of emergency for the city. 
Um, I think we're close, you know, we're now functioning kind of with the new normal, but, uh, and, you know, we're pretty stable. So just something we should maybe start to think about. Um, just kind of quickly to run down the list. Um, item B, um, you know, I wonder if we're at a point, maybe not now, but soon where we could start to automate um, some of the information, maybe links to county. Um, again, I think the communication has been a huge success, um, but at some point it feels like we're going to need to figure out how we can automate some of this or at least ramp down the amount of staff, staff time it takes. Um, on item D, uh, again, thank, thanks to staff for all the effort and looking forward to seeing some events resume. Um, item F, the workplace upgrades. Uh, just one thing struck me. I wonder if there's a potential revenue opportunity there for the city. Um, could we do some bulk buying uh, for some of these upgrades, you know, and offer a lower price in the market, but potentially mark it up a little bit to cover our costs. Um, item H, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the fiber business plan soon. Um, item I, which is the redesign of university. I personally think we should reconsider this one. Um, we should really understand the expected capital cost and um, factor that into our CIP list. So right now we're spending 150,000 on planning um, but we could use that money elsewhere if we don't think we're going to prioritize <clears throat> that project in the capital project uh, list. I mean, I think it's potentially multi-millions. I heard at one point potentially $10 million. And again, so I don't know where council would rank that. I also feel the focus on university is a little premature. I'm starting to hear more and more from the community about an interest in closing Cal Ave more than the university. And, you know, again, the impacts on a through street um, university, you know, we're talking about a potential closer, closure of Churchill. We're talking about Castilea. Um, if we close university, I just wonder what the impacts are going to be on Embarcadero. And if, you know, heaven forbid, we'd have to talk about widening Embarcadero. Um, I just really think it feels like this is a major capital project that would likely require um, an EIR. And so do we need to spend that money on planning right now? Um, in Cal Ave, I think we'd still need to understand, you know, traffic impacts, but it's not a through street. Um, and the other thing I think we need to start to talk about and uh, is how the city's gonna charge for the use of public right away. Um, if this is an ongoing thing, you know, we really are transferring land for public use to private use. Um, item J, um, is critical and needs funding. So I took this as the business tax. Uh, I think one of the speakers brought this up. And again, it's it's marked with a dollar signs question mark. And uh, I think we need to take advantage of this time. We should get as prepared as we can this year so that we are ahead of schedule going into 2022. We don't find ourselves kind of behind schedule again in terms of planning, figuring out what kind of tax, doing the polling. And I know they're separate items, but, you know, as I read through the report, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, I would shift that 150000 from the university planning to the biz tax planning. I think that's an investment that will deliver additional revenue in the future if we get a business tax in place. Um, so otherwise, I think the plan looks really good. Um, I would support making a change, though, on that 150000 for for planning. Okay, um, Vice Mayor Burt. Thank you. Um, so I support uh, the comments by um, a bunch of my colleagues on uh, items such as the need to increase the HISREP funding and how um, the ARP, the federal uh, latest uh, federal funding program uh, has directed you know, massive dollars to local jurisdictions. Uh, we're anticipating about $12 million. And my understanding of um, the the uses in principle, which as the city manager said, we're still trying to understand them uh, more specifically, um, are that uh, the federal government's looking to help uh, cities uh, fill holes in loss of uh, a revenue so that we don't cut essential services more but also to respond to new needs that have occurred as a result of the emergency. 
whether those are upgrading buildings uh, of our own civic buildings to make them healthier and safer, uh, or uh, and I should say uh, meeting social service needs. And um, and I think we should look very seriously at a significant portion of those additional dollars going to meet additional uh, community needs that have arisen. Um, I do really appreciate uh, what uh, Director O'Kane talked about on, on the work that's been done of convening nonprofits. We had previously had in the city uh, a council of nonprofits, and I don't know, I, I wasn't engaged with it, and I don't know its real status and how it um, intersects with the, with the uh, kind of convening that we're doing right now. Uh, can Director O'Kane or the city manager uh, add any light on that? Um, yeah, thank you for that question, Vice Mayor Burt. I don't have history on that Council of Nonprofits. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, city manager. Oh, I would just note that uh, we are in touch with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, not specific to Palo Alto, uh, and that within the Palo Alto um, geography, uh, the, the Nonprofit conversations, I think, have been more sector specific, whether it be child care or senior services or the like. Okay, well, we can follow up on some of that. Um, I, I do concur with a good portion of what the mayor said about um, this 150,000 that's for University Avenue redesign. I thought from the outset it, we should be looking at the redesign uh, of Cal Avenue University uh, and that. Uh, at this point in time, I don't think a grand master plan that would take years and millions of dollars to fund is what our, our first priority should be. As we're really looking at recovery as opposed to long-term solutions, um, I think we want to put those resources where they'll be most valuable in the near term. And frankly, uh, to have uh, some simple live performances on University and Cal Ave, a couple of stages uh, where we could have uh, local musicians, uh, perhaps featuring youth musicians and, and from the schools um, and, um, and also other types of uh, a simple performance. Uh, they, with the way those streets are now more pedestrian fares, I think that would have a big impact there. Um, also, as uh, Director O'Kane was talking about some of the uh, movies, and I was thinking about uh, the comment that Monica Young Arimus had made. There are some really incredible documentary films that, uh, including many of them uh, that are in the portfolio of our local UNAFF, the most underrecognized and most significant annual cultural event in our community. And it's a nationally and internationally recognized documentary film festival that we have taken too much for granted. And they have uh, films that would be great resources uh, for to, to work with us on a whole bunch of different events uh, thematically, whether it's on climate change. And they had one this last year on megafires. Pre the film was made preceding the latest California megafire. And just a whole myriad of, of things like that on social justice, because this is their, their whole theme was based upon the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So for 21, 22 years, these films have been on all the breadth of themes around that. And uh, I think we, we just have a great resource. Uh, they are very willing and able to uh, collaborate with us and we should tap into that. Um, as far as the, uh, the, one, uh, the item on the, um, uh, uh, the public facilities and the upgrades uh, on both workforce safety uh, for um, as we begin to uh, uh, bring more workers back. Um, I saw in the staff report that that we're supposed to get an informational item coming forward. Um, I'm frankly concerned that we're still uh, too behind the curve on this very critical thing is how do we make sure our work environments are safe now and as we scale up that we're prepared uh, for each of these different scenarios that uh, are ahead of us. And my understanding was since this was going to be a living document, 
We don't have to wait for some point in time where it's hit this completion phase to be able to um, update us. And so it's been several months since I raised this issue and uh, how soon can we get at least an interim uh, version and with an understanding, it's just gonna evolve. It's not something that is carved in stone. Uh, Council member, or sorry, Vice Mayor Bird, uh, totally agree. And uh, I think we could uh, get it over to you within the next week. Excellent, okay. And um, finally, I just wanna say, I, I think um, this is a, a really strong report and, um, and a lot of excellent activities that the staff is doing uh, to be responding to a whole bunch of different demands. And um, I, I wanna say thank you for um, all the work that everybody's doing um, and how, how dynamic they're, they're being in the, in the response as we're hopefully entering our next phases. So uh, Council Member Tanaka, you haven't spoken yet. Council Member Kuhn, Phil Sith, if you wanna speak, I'm gonna start a second round. Um, Council Member Tanaka. So I, uh, yeah, thanks staff for putting this together. Uh, I like the idea of trying to get faster, cheaper, more reliable internet. I think that's gonna be important even after the pandemic. So I think we wanna encourage that. Um, staff kind of started this presentation. I'd like uh, to actually get a response to it. They said we could barely do everything. There's like 18 items on this list that you guys could barely do what's on this list. And I, I guess, you know, I found in life, it's always better to do a few things really, really well. Um, so given that, um, I mean, it, 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 it does seem like a lot of things, right? A lot of, and, you know, plus the ongoing business. So can, can the staff talk about the risk involved with trying to do all of these different things all at the same time? And, you know, we're still trying to get through one of the worst economic recessions that we've had in a, a long time, plus a medical emergency and all this other kind of stuff. Can you guys talk about the risk factors involved in all of this? Sure. Um, appreciate the question, Councilmember Tanaka. Um, I think it's certainly fair to say that there is risk involved with the work ahead. And part of what um, we would like to establish once we get the green light from council, and I'll use the term green light, is uh, some ongoing reporting on how we're doing. And that um, we've envisioned potentially, and now staff will um, kick me under the table if they could uh, say a monthly report that does a uh, red or uh, green light, yellow light, red light on the status of each one of these uh, projects uh, as we proceed. And what that'll accomplish a couple of things. One is to give you actually a sense of how we're doing and where there may be increasing risk um, within each individual project, but also as the council takes on other topics to get to enable us to be able to give you feedback on, well, the latest thing that uh, has, has be suddenly become a priority presents a risk to our ability to complete an existing priority. So um, we're hoping that uh, doing some type of regular reporting like that would allow us to stay in sync and stay in touch uh, for the council uh, over the months ahead. Well, um, thank, you, thank you for that. Um, it seems prudent to be kind of tracking carefully, but I'm also thinking that it might make sense to also take a few things off the plate versus trying to uh, cram everything in and, and do kind of a subpar job on, on more things. Um, so, you know, in light of that, uh, you know, the city's, um, I know you guys are still working on it, but it looks like we'll get about over $12 million with the federal stimulus, which is great. Uh, we can sell it, definitely use that. Uh, and I was just listening to the comment of one of the speakers earlier, one of the public speakers who talked about trying to optimize spending first. And you guys know that I'm into that. So, um, yeah. So, you know, what I'm thinking is rather than trying to do a ballot measure now, when things are very precarious. Um, and we just got, you know, we're probably gonna get this $12 million rescue stimulus. Um, I, I think what we should do is we should take this off the plate now. Um, and, you know, when the economy has recovered, um, some of the businesses are back on their feet, we can reconsider it. But to me, it seems a little bit premature given where we are, given all the things that staff has to work on and juggle right now. Um, it seems premature to kind of get this in here. Um, so I, I don't support shifting the 150K to from the from University Avenue, which you know, if you guys have been there recently, definitely need some revitalization um, to something that is kind of in my mind premature and stacking more work on staff's plate at this point in time. So I I, I will not support that. Um, and I but I do agree that 
that um, uh, you know Calaf and you know perhaps more of a permanent type of closure for Calaf does seem to be highly desired. I've talked to many community members and a lot of the business owners along the street seem to be very supportive of that. So I think I think that does seem to make sense. Um, and um, so, but I, I think I think the name of the game here is to do a few fewer, fewer things better versus a lot of things kind of poorly. So I think we should keep that in mind. Uh, but otherwise, the, the work plan seems very exciting, and I really am excited about the. Hopefully, we'll get better, faster, cheaper internet. Thanks, Councilmember Ku, and then I'll go to Councilmember Cormac unless Councilmember Felseth wants to jump in. First, I just want to say I had no doubt, no doubt that uh, Director Nose and uh, Director O'Kane would be able to put this together and bring back this plan. <laughs> no doubt. So um, really grateful for what you guys have been have done and also for putting together that all the community involvement that has been going through that video that we saw. It was uh, very encouraging to see that. Obviously, you know, um, within the community, there has been, uh, there's a lot more to, um, to heal. Um, I wanted to make sure as we're moving forward with our plans um, that the engagement, um, I know that you have instituted the community, um, community checkup um, city manager. And somehow I think that, um, we need to kind of get the word out even more, especially on some of these projects that's coming through, um, uh, especially if we're going to imp imp um, impose the design downtown and redesign California Avenue for the street closures, the community, especially the next, the neighborhood next to it has to be involved in that discussion. They have to be. Um, the other part is a lot of these public spaces that are being used, they're public spaces. So I really would like to hear their feedback on how they feel about it, including the EV uh, electrification if, um, um, projects that are going through in our garages and how it is um, more of it is being um, um, leased out and sometimes um, not charged for the rental rate. So I think that that needs to be explored a little bit further, how much to be uh, putting EVs in there. Um, another is in terms of working with the business, uh, if purchasing in the city, if it can be looked at to be purchasing more with local businesses, if there's that possibility, perhaps we can have more, um, um, uh, help with the economic rebuild. Um, then a question that was asked prior, but I didn't get the full um, answer on is the new website's uh, multi-way communication. Can you give me a little bit more um, kind of light on that? How does it work? <laughs> what is multi-way? Sure. Um, perhaps I'll ask Megan, uh, our chief communications of official, to take a crack at that one this time. <laughs> Since the city manager translator may be a little hard to read. Sure. <laughs> uh, Megan Horgan Taylor, chief communications officer. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Councilmember Koo. Um, so the the opportunity is both two way information and conversation through a new online platform. Platform. So for example, uh, maybe Director O'Kane has um, created a potential program for volunteers to help support uh, cleanup of parks or, um, you know, cleanup after an event or something like that to help support and connect the community together. This new platform will share that information and help connect that out to um, neighbors and the community that are looking for new volunteer opportunities and then be able to share that through the platform with their other neighbors and their other community um, connections that they have. And so it's a, it's a way to share information from the city, but also for the community to share information with us in a different way. So it's different than social media, um, which are great and there's wonderful strengths about using those, um, but it's a very streamlined process uh, where we can engage with the community in a different way. Okay. If, if I could add one more example, um, at the risk of 
confusing to everyone. Um, this, this platform actually feels a bit like a Swiss Army knife. And uh, so it will give us the ability to do a number of different uh, things, including get community feedback on our services. So uh, Council Member Tanaka in particular has been very um, focused and, and uh, consistent in, in making sure that we're aware, whether it's net promoter scores or other ways of getting feedback directly from residents on the, their impressions and uh, reactions to our services. So this, is, this platform will also enable us to do those kinds of one-off uh, feedback um, uh, uh, tools uh, that we will be implementing across departments. And just to couple with that, the new website will also have a survey function. So when you're online and you can't find what you need or you have a specific question and you do this, you, you type it in the search and it's just not there for you, there will be an opportunity for um, the community to have direct input to us uh, so that we can help them with what they're looking for as well. So there's other ways for us to connect the community to information and to the assistance they need. And will it be faster. Yes. Yes. When we do searches. <laughs> yes. Okay. Faster than not moving for sure. Yes. It will yes. actually search what you're looking for. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, one last item, I, and that was the uh, dynamic workplace and the living document that was brought up earlier. I was wondering, and I appreciate it coming to us in the next couple of weeks, but I was wondering if it could be also located in a central location on the website, maybe in the manager. Uh, page or in your in the city managers where we know to go look for it if there's some if there's something that we're looking for or if there's an update that has been done and we didn't realize that it came to us could it be located somewhere central so we know where to go and find it great point sure we'll, we'll uh, identify the appropriate place for that purpose okay um, so I think that's about it I I I really appreciate all the work that was put into this and making sure that, um, you know, we, we do um, come out of this pandemic in a, in a, in a measured and planned out way um, with what funding we have available. Oh, I just remembered last question. Um, <laughs> I, sort of your way over your time, but oh, you just, I'll come just, back then. It's go really ahead, just wrap it up. Okay, so there was a, a letter that we received from uh, Congress late, um, Congressperson Eshu about the community project funding. And I was wondering, uh, and I did forward it on to you. I don't, you probably received it also, city manager. I was wondering if there's any monies in there that we might be able to apply for, especially for the fiber to the home, for the parks, the, and so forth. Yes, uh, staff is working on putting together a handful of projects that we believe might be both both qualify as well as be competitive uh, for funding. Um, as, as you may recall, back in the days of earmarks, they tend to be a very political process. So we do know that uh, the criteria appears to favor projects that are, whether you call it shovel ready or can be implemented quickly. So with an eye to that, uh, we are putting together a, a range of projects that we think might be uh, good candidates uh, that we can advance through our uh, Congress member's office. And we'll, we'll loop the council in as that takes shape. Thank you. Okay, thank uh, you. Council Member Felseth and then Council Member Cormac, thanks for your patience. Yeah, just, just briefly, thanks, because I thought the whole thing was, was very comprehensive and I'm delighted there's bandwidth to do it all. Um, one question, uh, there's a couple hundred thousand dollars allocated to community outreach on fiber. And so the question is, do we have enough information yet to put $200,000 to useful work on community outreach? on fiber? We do, and in do fact- not have to, Do we not have yet to put that to work? Um, I, yes, I believe we do. Although I think we, we may have an action that needs to come back to council for specific authorization on next steps. Uh, that said, I've gotten a preview of what the UAC is gonna hear next month, and it's super exciting. There's just uh, been a tremendous amount of work done uh, through our consultant Magellan and um, with uh, some of the testimony you got uh, earlier this evening, I think it reflects uh, the excitement we expect to hear from the UAC and uh, desire to move as quickly as we can. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I, I jumped right into my questions last time. So forgot the part where I said this is an awful lot of work. And I think we've gotten to the point where there's enough specificity in there that, um, you know, everyone's confidence is increased, uh, that we're covering all the bases, um, and that um, you're going to be able to do it all, which is kind of amazing. Um, I did just want to say thank you to Director O'Kane and the whole um, department on the art that we've had throughout this time and and going forward. There was a lot of that in the video, and, and I just wanted to to note that that's been one of the few things that we've been able to do that's been, uh, pardon the pun, a bright spot. <laughs> um, okay, just in order, we haven't yet talked about open meetings. So starting with uh, item A, and I so appreciate the staff saying um, it's AB 399 or 339, 399 with amendments. Um, I'm very supportive of us having a way for people who are not able to come in person to participate. Um, whether it's that they're, you know, immunocompromised or, it's, you know, who knows what the reason is requiring people to come in person. I think, um, I think it limits the number of people who can participate. So I look forward to um, us supporting that and being flexible. Um, item C, libraries. People want back into our libraries. So I'm just going to say that out loud. Um, I think we're getting to the point where some of the rules are gonna change and we've had a lot of really legitimate questions. Um, and even if we look at um, some of the changes as we go forward to orange. So any sense on when we're gonna let people back in libraries? Thank you for that opening. Let me uh, give the opportunity to Director Ken. Thank you for the question, Council Member Cormack. Um, I'm really happy to say, yes, we are almost there. Yay. Um, we are planning to do phased reopenings of the libraries. So more will come, I think middle of April, we will actually open the children's library. And um, then, the, uh, then the Mitchell Park Library and then the Rinconada Library. So plans, we're just making lots of plans. Um, going into a limited reopening is uh, more challenging than general reopening. So we're looking at lots of things, but staff are really excited about this. Well, I think everyone's excited. And just so people get a preview, when you say a limited reopening, that means people can come in for a short period of time and perhaps not use the computers. Is that what you're referencing? Yeah, at the beginning, it would be by appointment. Um, there's only, you know, we're still in um, red tier. Even if you go into an orange or yellow, it's still, um, there's a limitation of how many people can be in the building. So um, that's what we're looking at. Um, but we really do want um, our community members to enjoy the facilities. Um, so we're working on lots of things, but we are very excited about it. Great, well, that's a good piece of news. Thank you. Thank you, Director Camp. Um, next is section D. So um, I appreciate the, all the thought that's gone into community wellness. And I think there's something missing um, which is mothers, moms, parents, families. There's a lot of segments there, but if we look at who's really been affected the, the most, I think in some respects, it's women who've had to leave the workforce. It's women who've mostly been working and trying to manage remote school. Um, I think the mental health needs of moms are well-documented. So I would encourage staff to think maybe it's in conjunction with the summit about the status of women and children but I think there's a component missing there um, that would support our families, um, specifically moms, but parents more generally. Um, so I'll just throw that out and staff is thinking, don't need any action per se. <clears throat> and then um, just as we get to Jay, um, just wanna push back a little bit on the fact that we were behind last time on the business tax. I, I certainly didn't feel that way. I thought we were in a very measured pace and we were right on schedule making our decisions at the appropriate time um, in order to be on the ballot last year, which we ended up not doing. Um, it, with respect to whether or not we do a documentary transfer tax, I'm sure we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about that in finance. I saw it referenced, it's, it's, um, it wouldn't be my choice. Um, I do think there, there might be an argument for a parcel tax, even though some members of the public would be opposed to that. So all of that will be happening at finance in some level of detail. We'll have to restart this and you know, I'll just make my pitch about sources and uses of funds. So I think there'll be a why conversation. I encourage members of the public to, you know, to tune into finance um, probably in June after the budget when we'll start looking at what tax measures might be appropriate for which 
for which reasons. And I think there'll be a wide variety. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Burke. Uh, no, I'm, that was a lingering hand. Oh, sorry. I thought I went up in the middle there. Um, so I don't know uh, if people agreed or disagreed with my comments. I guess a question for staff. Um, you know, if we pause the University Avenue planning, uh, would that take some things off the plate? Like how far along is that right now? Um, let's see, I believe we are currently looking for a consultant to assist with that work. I did want to provide maybe just a couple of data points that might be of use for the council in considering that one. Um, did want to ensure it's clear that from, certainly both from staff perspective as well as to the extent we've talked to downtown stakeholders that the ultimate goal of that work is to set it up for private funds. And uh, so the infrastructure that would be uh, conceived as a part of a future project would be primarily, if not exclusively, privately uh, funded by adjacent property owners. Part of the business case that needs to be evaluated as a part of that is what is the, the rate effectively or the value that we can charge for use of the public space. So that includes parklets. So for example, uh, the parklets that are already in place in the longer term, should the council choose to allow uh, parklets uh, to continue to be a, a, stand, a part of our downtown um, uh, environment, then we need to set rates uh, for the use of that space. And uh, so part of this work would be enabling us to do that. So just wanted to note that uh, coming out of the cost estimation uh, in this work would be both for the infrastructure needed as well as for the rates uh, for public use of, of the public right of way, I'm sorry, business use of the uh, public right of way. And then the, the one other uh, piece is to note that, you know, we have been able to maintain this somewhat delicate uh, ceasefire on the discussion of uh, keeping university closed versus, uh, or closed to traffic or, or reopening it. And sooner or later, uh, the, the pressure will come to uh, reopen it. The council is, is aware that there was quite a bit of community uh, support uh, for keeping the streets closed to vehicular traffic. So we, we one way or another, will confront uh, that issue. And so this planning is really uh, to try to position us for a longer term strategy uh, while recognizing there will be a near term sort of choice uh, that needs to be made uh, to, the, uh, to the reopening. And Brad turned his camera on, so I suspect I covered the basis he wanted to. Um, uh, and if not, he can chime in. Looks like he's keeping it off. <laughs> so in, in terms of your, your basic question on other things uh, that would come off, come off or be possible based on that, you know, I, I do think this does relate to the overall CIP um, uh, priorities. Uh, since this work is largely at the um, preliminary or concept level, it uh, would involve public works and uh, outreach but not, not a great uh, work effort from other departments as may be the case in some of the other projects. Yeah, I mean, like most things, we, you know, we all have different priorities and it's easy to add to the list and really hard to take things off. And um, do agree with council member Tanaka that, you know, focusing some could be good. I just feel like it's unlikely we'll agree on, on how to focus. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and make the staff motion and if anybody's interested in um, pausing the university, they could, they could propose an amendment, but I'll just start with the staff motion. I'll second. Okay. And again, I think, I think overall, this has uh, been a good discussion and really appreciate staff bringing this. Um, I, I don't really have anything else to add to the motion. Councilmember Member Carm Carmack, do you wanna to speak to it? Ha having had a second round, no, I feel I've spoken enough. Great. Member Tanaka. I spoke about this earlier in my comments, but um, I don't support uh, Part M, which is the going for a ballot measure. I don't feel like we have optimized our spending. We're going to get $12 million from the federal government. I think we owe it to our constituents that we uh, try to do all that we can before having to burn them more, especially during this economic downturn. So to me, it doesn't, it doesn't seem appropriate. So I, I'm, I'm not going to support that. I don't know if there's support to 
vote against it, but if not, then I will ask for it to be uh, separated. So we're not really listing the parts in the motion. Um, so I guess you could ask for a second. I don't know if there's a second, but um, I don't support that part of it. So um, I don't know. Uh, so th that part I don't support. So uh, I don't know if we can separate this, but if we can, I will like to have that separated. Mr. Mayor, it is a severable component. If you want to call it out on the motion and vote for it, vote, have the vote separately. Should we list, you know, so it, uh, should we list all the different items? Because uh, I mean, the motion is just to adopt a staff plan. If I might, it, maybe in A or work plan, you could say A through L, and then we could have a C that is part M. Okay. Does that accomplish this? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, council members. Uh, if you refer to the staff report on page five, uh, all the lettering has re been redone. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't know what M is. It's J. I I, he was saying okay. M. I, was, I wasn't. Okay. Sorry. I, 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 just, I'm, I don't have the paper copy. I have the electronic version. I, and this, the letters are different. But basically, whichever the one is about um, a, a new tax. A ballot measure. People, sure. Yeah, ballot measure. So that would be item J. So yeah. Okay, J. Sorry. That's okay. So then part A would be A through I and K. Yep. Okay. And then C would be... J. Okay, any other comments? Can we go ahead and vote on this? So we'll, work, we'll vote on A and B, and then we will vote on C. Um, starting with, yeah, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Burt. Uh, well, I, I just a uh, quick comment. I, you know, I, I want to respond to uh, Councilmember Tanaka on this because he had said that. Uh, we should uh, defer uh, consideration of the business tax uh, because of the economy and wait until it recovers. But uh, I, Council Member Tanaka has opposed this adamantly um, at every circumstance from 20 and 2017 and 2019 when the economy was booming. And so I, I think that we should be more uh, forthright in our positions than to uh, claim that it's because the economy is down versus that he's opposed it in principle, no matter what the economy is. Okay, thank you for that comment. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the vote. Uh, so again, voting on parts A and B, uh, starting with Council Member Stone. Yes. Uh, Council Member Tanaka. Yes. Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. Councilmember Cormack. Yes. I vote yes. Councilmember Filseth. Yes. And Councilmember Ku. Yes. Okay, and we will vote on Part C. Uh, Councilmember Tanaka. No. Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. Councilmember Cormack. Yes. I vote yes. Councilmember Filseth. Yes. Councilmember Ku. Yes. And Councilmember Stone. Yes. Okay, so that passes on a 6-1. Okay, let's move on. Thank you very much for that. We're going to move on to uh, item number five, which is review and direction on the 2021 capital projects. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Let me ask uh, our Director of Public Works, Brad Eggleston, to kick us off. Okay, good evening, Mayor Du Bois and Council. Uh, this item is a follow-up from your March 1st mid-year action. And uh, per council's direction on that day, we're providing some additional information about capital projects that have contracts where we're expected to approve contracts before June 30th of this year. Uh, and we're hoping to get your direction about uh, whether to proceed with the projects. Uh, so with that quick introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Assistant Director of Public Works, Holly Boyd, who will walk us through a very brief presentation. Hold on a second, I'm trying to get my uh, video on here. For some reason, it's not cooperating. We can see your slides for what that's worth. 
Yay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I will start then. Can you still see the slides? Yes. Is it in presentation mode? No. <laughs> no. It, I knew it kicked itself out. <laughs> Bear with me a second. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor Du Bois and uh, other council members. My name, as Brad said, is Holly Boyd. I'm the Assistant Director for Public Works Engineering Services. And I have a very short presentation tonight. So I'm gonna go through this quickly. So um, I wanted to give a brief overview on how we got here tonight. Um, as part of the fiscal 2021 capital improvement program budget process, the following objectives were used in proposing and approving projects. Uh, they include reducing carryover funding to keep up spending on essential infrastructure rather than falling behind and requiring new funding sources or levels to catch up in upcoming years. Uh, includes positioning shovel ready projects to take advantage of favorable construction market pricing, typical of a recession, and to ensure a steady flow of projects to minimize peaks and valleys and project delivery staffing needs as this would reduce efficiency and introduce bottlenecks in productivity. So additionally, staff has identified 2.7 million through the reappropriation process for the fiscal 2020 budget. Um, a list of projects were included in table one in the staff report. And then uh, also more details on the reappropriation process will be provided to council as part of the upcoming 2022 budget discussions. So then on finally on March 1st, as part of the mid-year budget report, staff brought forward projects that had planned design or construction contracts expected to be awarded by the end of fiscal 2021. So council requested additional information, which is included in attachment A of the staff report. So here is a partial snippet of attachment A. Um, I'd like to walk through one of the projects so you can understand the information provided. So for example, the Charleston Arrasadero corridor project at the bottom of the slide, um, the fiscal 2020, 2021 adjusted budget includes the 2021 adopted capital budget and any carry forward reappropriation and adjustments that have been made. This number also includes salary and benefits. The estimated contract amount that would be brought to council is the base contract with 10% contingency added to it. So in this case, the engineer's estimate is $6 million plus $600,000 for contingency for a total of $6.6 .6 million. It's important to note that the budget amounts may be greater than the estimated contractor amount. For instance, in this case, the budget amount includes components other than the estimated contract, such as staff costs, utility connection fees, some contract costs from the previous two phases of the project that have already been spent. So the next column, the project summary includes a description of the project. The next column is the status of the project. In this case, the project is currently out to bid and bids are due next week on March 30th. In general, all the projects except for the handful that are still under design are shovel ready and have had significant staff resources invested in bringing them to this current status. The next column after that is critical elements issues. This phase completes the 2.3 mile corridor safety project, including work at major intersections. Um, the restricted fund column, this column includes any grant funding, impact fee funding, et cetera. For phase three of the Charleston Arrasadero corridor project, there are, no, there are no restricted funds. However, this project would count towards the maintenance of effort requirement to continue to receive SB1 funding. Um, time sensitivity is driven by grant deadlines, safety concerns, or project coordination. For this project, it was rated as high for safety concerns. And then finally, potential phasing. Uh, the last column, this project is phase three of three planned phases. Um, it can be potentially further phased, but it will increase the cost. So here is the complete list of projects that were included in attachment A. The projects include or range from park improvements, building upgrade projects, and street improvements. So finally, staff requests the council provide direction on how to proceed with the fiscal 2021 capital contracts planned to be approved by June 2021. And with that, I will turn it back over to Mayor Du Bois. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. 
If I might make one more comment, Mayor, um, my apologies for that. Um, just in terms of uh, your discussion, would like to uh, just maybe state the obvious here that you have quite a range of options as to uh, where to go and direction for staff could be uh, on one end of the extreme, identify any specific projects that uh, council would like us to hold on. Um, if there is uh, either individually or by category, uh, a set of projects that the council would like to hold on, then we'll, we'll uh, perhaps uh, request clarity on what the next step might be, whether it be, for example, holding on award until consideration of your upcoming fiscal year budget. So that would be um, one example. Uh, and again, uh, a range of options along those lines to on the other end of the extreme indicating that uh, you're comfortable with our proceeding with a set of projects, in which case, uh, as uh, Assistant Director Boyd pointed out, I think we're, we're ready in short order to proceed with next steps. So with that, um, back to you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so again, we're going to go to the public, and um, again, we'll do two minutes of speaker. Thank you, Mary Du Bois. Any member of the public wishing to speak on this item, please raise your hand at this time. We will. You'll each get two minutes. Our first speakers are No Bolins, to be followed by Sonia Bradsky and then Robert Neff. Are No, go ahead. Dear City Council Member and Mayor and uh, Mayor Du Bois, I'm Arnaud Boulens speaking on behalf of the Palo Alto Council of PTA's Traffic Safety Committee to voice our continued support for the Charleston and Westadero Plan Phase 3 funding. This weekend, we copied you on a number of letters of support for staff's El Camino Real encroachment permit application for Phase 3, which were sent by corridors, corridor school PTAs over the last couple of months. These letters demonstrate that PTAs have been doing what we can to actively support staff's efforts to get this important safety project done as quickly as possible. A year ago, a boy on his bike was killed at El Camino Real in California Avenue. This was a tragic and unnecessary loss to our community. El Camino bicycle and pedestrian crossing hazards have been well known and documented for decades, but safety improvements for people who walk and bike continue to be delayed. The committee was therefore surprised and disappointed to hear that council is considering cutting or delaying the third and last phase of the Charleston Arrested Era Corridor project, which already has been delayed multiple times over two decades. According to data from the Transportation Injury Mapping System, TIMS, of the University of California, Berkeley, since 2009, nine collisions have happened on the intersection of El Camino Real and Charleston Arrested Era, and 16 on the intersection of Middlefield and Charleston. The Charleston Aristadero Corridor serves 11 public and private K-12 schools, and many students must cross these hazardous intersections on their way to and from school. As part of the last phase of the Charleston Aristadero Corridor project, these hazardous locations would finally see significant safety improvements by providing continuous bike lanes along the corridor and through these intersections. Over many years, school um, corridor school site PTAs have consistently supported the Charleston Arcedero Corridor project so students can walk and ride safely to school. We urge you again to ensure that funding is available for phase three this year as planned. Please allow this project to move forward without any further delay, preventing further unnecessary injury crashes. We thank you for considering our comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonia Bradsky to be followed by Robert Neff and then Rebecca Eisenberg. We will continue to take hands through Sonia and when she's finished, we will no longer take um, speaker hands. Sonia, go ahead, you have two minutes. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Sonia Bradsky. Uh, I'm actually living right off of Charleston and Arostadero. Um, I bike everywhere all day long. I'm going up and down Charleston and Rostadero multiple times a day on my bike. And the El Camino section is pretty terrible. Uh, that really does need to be fixed, which is this phase three of the Charleston and Rostadero corridor. Please fund this phase three as soon as possible. Do not delay. This really does need to be fixed and it needs to be completed. Uh, the others have been funded, phase one and two, and phase three does need to be fixed at El Camino. So please 
fix this and help all us bicyclists go up and down Charleston and Rosadero, um, especially the you know children that are going up and down, um, and all of us adults. Um, and I really appreciate everything that City Council does and and the City Manager. Uh, please fund this as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. We know we'll, we will no longer be taking any further speakers. Our next speaker is Robert Neff to be followed by Rebecca Eisenberg and then Penny Elson. Robert, go ahead, you have two minutes. There we go. Good evening, council members. I speak to strongly encourage you to maintain funding for the Charleston Rasadero Corridor phase three in the capital plan. In this phase, the project will upgrade two sections of this corridor that are long, long, long overdue for their improvement. The goal of our bicycle network is to make it easy to get to destinations safely and comfortably on fairly direct routes. These two sections will finally make important connections safer and more comfortable for all cyclists. Specifically, the route will finally connect the bike lanes on the corridor across El Camino Real. This is an important route for students who use the corridor, particularly all of the Gunn High School students from Green Meadow and other Southeast neighborhoods. It is also used by many commuters from South Palo Alto towards the Stanford Business Park and to connections south via bike lanes on Foothill Expressway. It's been on my commute for 24 years. Second, this plan will connect bike lanes continuously east from Middlefield across Fabian in front of the JCC and across San Antonio connecting to the relatively new buffered bike lanes on Charleston and Mountain View. This is another important connection particularly for anyone in South Palo Alto who wants to get to a hardware store, the REI, or even Costco by bicycle. I use that route too. The city is considering more development, especially housing on Fabian and San Antonio. We need to greatly improve the bicycle infrastructure in that corner of Palo Alto. There are no bike lanes on either Middlefield or no continuous lanes on Charleston right now. While I have tolerated the corridor for years, riding in the traffic lane with 30 mile an hour traffic, we want this to be safe and comfortable for all, and even for me as I age and mellow out. I strongly support maintaining the funding for this and completing the corridor. Finally, an added benefit is that this, these street imp pavement improvements will also help justify our SB1 funding from the state. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neff. Our next speaker is Rebecca Eisenberg to be followed by Penny Elson and then David Cole. Rebecca, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you. I often wonder how our city manager and city planners advice would be changed if they had children in public schools like I do and other community members. The fact that our city staff has cavalierly disregarded the safety of our youngest residents on their bicycles as shown with their failure to even consider the safety of children on bikes with regard to Castilea's garage. And now they're just lumping in Lord knows what category, some essential safety measures for children on bicycles near gun high school shows their lack of understanding of what, our, what makes our community special. And that is our public schools and the safety of our children. Disregarding safety measures like these will literally not just kill children as a child did die about a year ago, as Mr. Bolins articulately and heartfully mentioned, but it'll destroy everything about our community. I was there at the city council meeting where city council gave directions to the staff, which I, it was mostly by council member Bert. And here's what I heard. Prioritize these projects according to a way that makes sense. Also, wouldn't it be nice if you looked into alternate means of funding? What I saw here was an irrational lumping of projects together using categories like shovel ready instead of categories like urgent safety measure. This would have been a pretty simple thing to do. List the categories, list the projects that go to public safety, list the, category, list the projects that are nice to have, list the amount of money, prioritize the ones that go to public safety, research the projects that we can receive public funds for. It's not so political, Mr. City Manager, as I've been explaining to you for a long time. Actually, this money is available to everybody who applies. Like right now, the $1.5 billion for the taking that you can spend, we can spend on housing. This wasn't a good job. Please do better. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. 
Our next speaker is Penny Elson to be followed by David Cole and then Star Teach Out. Penny, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so I wanna first, I wanna start by thanking uh, project manager Holly Boyd for the great work she's done so far in this project. Um, this traffic safety project was a mitigation plan supported by a nexus study and impact fees for multiple developments, including hundreds of new affordable housing units with nearly a thousand new housing units in total, in addition to other development in the corridor service area. The mitigation plan was created by community members and staff and developers all working together. It enabled our community to get to yes on housing that in aggregate greatly exceeded comp plan projections at the time. It was supposed to provide, ensure that we maintained safe routes to school for children who live in this area and not just to school, but also to local community centers and shopping centers, playing fields, public parks, and 11 public and private kindergarten through 12 grades, 12 K through 12 schools. Safety is, should be a very important consideration here as Arnaud Bolins aptly pointed out with his um, crash stats in his earlier presentation. Um, phase three will finally address the most hazardous intersections on the school commute corridor. Middlefield Charleston and um, is, is a big problem as his, as his numbers pointed out, but also El Camino Real, um, the approach there, the bike lanes completely disappear, which means that students and all other bicyclists have to merge with motor vehicle traffic in order to move through that intersection, an eight lane state highway. Um, this is also the case down near San Antonio Road where the bike lanes also disappeared. And that is a problem that will also be rectified um, with the next phase of this plan. So I see I'm running out of time. I just wanna to say to thank you for your time and, and ask you to please move this project forward expeditiously. It's already 14 years past its original promised deadline. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Our next speaker is David Cole to be followed by Star Teachout and then Sri Shandila. David, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you, Council. Um, in the previous uh, item, Community and Economic Recovery and Strategy, staff did a wonderful job of pointing out how that plan and the strategies uh, dovetail very well with the city priorities set uh, for this year. And then when we get to this capital improvement plan and others, we see almost no mention of city priorities. Instead, we see shovel ready, we see other items. And I would like to see council in general um, maintain the priorities that they set for the year when they talk about and address capital improvement projects, all capital improvement projects, um, particularly in the area of climate change. Um, you know, you vote with your dollars and if you're voting to, to build roads and do other things, that are uh, making climate change worse, then we're never gonna get ahead with this, um, with our goals uh, to address climate change. And in particular, I'd like to speak in support of the Senate of the um, Arastadero Charleston project and that that does increase alternate forms of transportation in that corridor that have been sorely missed for a long time. As many of the speakers said, there's safety issues there that are paramount for people traveling in the corridor. So I think in general, um, well, I support that, that project, but in general, we need to, would like to see council think about the council priorities whenever they're spending money and make sure that we spend it appropriately. That way we don't get things, um, I mean, that's part of the reason why we got a $40 million parking garage in the middle of a pandemic uh, because we're paying attention to other priorities and not those of, of climate change and other issues. So thank you very much and please support that project. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Star Teachout to be followed by Sri Shandia and then Audrey Gold. Star, go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, I really appreciate your time to speak tonight. And to all of you on the city uh, staff who I know are cyclists as well. And um, just really appreciate the fact that there have been so many unknown community members and people who have deep feelings about this project and have committed to it over many years. Would really love to see you move forward on this. I've been biking through Palo Alto for oh, how many decades now? You know, almost three. And um, I confirm many of what has already been said that this, it's an important uh, value that we have safe routes, not only to, our, to schools for our children, but also safe routes just for daily living. I try to bike everywhere that's within about a three mile zone. And when I think about that, um, the heading towards REI and that whole area, it can be a bit daunting on a bicycle. And um, I live in Barron Park and with the new development on Maybell, many cyclists avoid Arasterdero and come down Maybell to get to Briones and, and Gunn. But that too will become even more congested than it currently is and quite dangerous to be honest with the mixing of uh, vehicles and bicycles. So um, please continue to um, move forward on this project and thank you for all your, all your hard work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sri Shandia to be followed by Audrey Gold and then James Flasterer. Sri, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening, honorable city council members and Mayor Dubois. My name is Sri Sandilia, and I'm a ninth grader at Gunn High School. <clears throat> I'm the president of the Gunn Bike Club, and I frequently volunteer at Silicon Valley Bike Exchange. I would love for the Charleston Arasadero Corridor Project to be built ASAP, phase three. The implementation of these continuous safe bicycle lanes at El Camino and Charleston slash Arasadero, at that intersection, makes riding to school much, much safer. It's better for Terman and Gunn students, which is in the thousands, and it's a very, very important part of all these children who are going to be biking to school. Um, as articulated by almost every other public speaker tonight, um, the importance and the safety of this project is paramount. Um, as uh, Mr. Bolins mentioned, there have been 25 accidents along this corridor. And as mentioned multiple times, a, a child was killed um, exactly a year ago. And this cannot stand. This is a really big um, issue. And I would, I would strongly urge you from, and I, I think I said, when I say this, I speak for myself and all my fellow students um, from sixth graders to through 12th graders, all the kids like the turn and gun, that this is a really important issue and we would love to have it be fixed. Uh, thank you so much for considering my comments. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Shri. Our next speaker is Audrey Gold to be followed by our final speaker, James Flasterer. Audrey, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, and I just wanna echo uh, many of the previous comments and I don't wanna repeat the effort, but I do wanna highlight the fact that the bicycle infrastructure in South Palo Alto um, just doesn't have the same um, underpasses that are at Cal Ave, Embarcadero and by PAMP that North Palo Alto um, has benefited from years. So it is really important that um, we really focus on this, uh, the, the cycling uh, safety in South Palo Alto. And that's where a lot of the new housing growth is coming in. And again, uh, as a volunteer with the South Routes to Schools program, um, we're so fortunate that uh, so many of our kids are able to bike to school. It really makes a difference in the, the local traffic. And these projects are so important to making both students and their parents uh, feel that it is safe for children to be able to get to school um, using, um, using bicycles or walking. So I just strongly, strongly urge you to, uh, to get this project funded. It's been in the planning for, for decades. And I think it's really gonna be a wonderful asset to our community. So again, thank you for all the work that you're doing and please, please fund this project. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. 
And our final speaker is James Flaster. James, go ahead. James, go ahead. You need to unmute from your end. Sorry, didn't know I was muted. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you, city council members and Mayor Dubois. Uh, I'm Jim Flaster. I'm speaking as the Gunn High School um, PTSA Transportation Safety Representative, also co chair for the PTA Safe Routes to School Committee, and also parent of two Gunn High School students and a 17 year resident of the Charleston Arashadero Corridor, as well as a bicyclist. Um, the previous two phases of the Charleston Restadero project were completed and the corridor is actually much safer for students commuting by bicycle to all the schools and preschools for that matter that occupied the corridor, as well as the general public that travel by bicycle or traverse the intersections. Phase three is scheduled for bids. James, you broke. Those major intersections, which were you know, in the final portion of the project construction, which has stretched over eight years um, and much longer in the planning and impl implementation phases. The last two intersections lack important features um, like the continuation of the bike lanes, uh, safe median refuges, proper markings, and sidewalk improvements that are much needed. So, in normal times, up to 900 students per day commute up by bicycle to Gun High School, many of which either use Charleston and Arastradero or across it at some point. 900 is a lot, but actually many more could still use it. Phases one and two have contributed to a continuing increase in these numbers, yet there are still issues at Middlefield and especially El Camino intersections that cause concern for many of the student commuters, and that limits access for these bicyclists. The GUN PTSA has supported the Charleston Restaurant Plan throughout and urges the city council members to move forward with phase three, with funding and proceed to the bid stage. Thanks for your consideration and supporting the Palo Alto PTSA students, as well as the city's bicyclists and pedestrians that will be benefiting from safe travels at these intersections. Thank you, James. Mayor DeVoise, that was our last speaker. Great, <clears throat> thank you to all the public speakers. Um, I'm gonna suggest we take a short break, unless anybody objects. <laughs> Wait, no, no objections. <laughs> All right, so let's break until uh, 9.25. If we can make it a short one, come back in seven minutes. Um, I think that'll be good. Thanks.
All right, I see four of us. All right, you're back to five. Okay, so um, let's come back to council and start our discussion. Um, again, this is a pretty open-ended staff recommendation. So, um, Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois, and I want to thank the staff for uh, column seven. Um, the descriptions are really super helpful. Thank you. I fear you may have set a new standard for us going forward. Um, but truly, I, I do feel like we have a much better understanding of the importance of the projects, not just a description of them. Um, couple quick questions. Um, do I take from page 110 that the parking lot at Arastradero, since it does not show up in attachment A, is now not happening in this fiscal year? Uh, I, I believe we, uh, this is Brad Eggleston, Public Works Director. I believe we've already made the improvements or oh. some of them are in the works. Okay, great, right. good. Um, and my next question is gonna be for Director Nose. Uh, hopefully she's still with us. Um, hello. Um, could you refresh my memory about how far we would be, we are anticipated to be below the BSR target at the end of this year? Uh, some... We are not expected to be below the BSR target by the Okay, end. so we're gonna hit it now. Um, if we are, it's maybe within $200,000. Okay, um, great. We're, we're basically at the target. And that assume all of these projects that are listed here are fully funded and will still meet the BSR number. Yes. Okay. And then where is the, explain where the 2.7 million is going that staff has already carved out of these before bringing it back to us. Sure. Um, that's, will be part of obviously the ongoing budget conversations. Uh, some of it is going to help offset the, uh, frankly, continued low TOT estimates. Um, I think if the council remembers on January 25th, when we talked about the projections in the general capital improvement fund, uh, when we were talking about the public safety building debt, um, there were scenarios where we were going negative um, over the five-year period. And so what staff is working on balancing is that five-year period and making sure that we're solvent across it. Okay, great, that's helpful. Um, just in general, um, I'll be interested to see where my colleagues are on this. I mean, we have four playgrounds. A lot of them have to do with surfaces and um, old playgrounds. So I hope we contemplate those all together. I know the parks have just been incredibly well utilized during this time. and. Um, even when uh, people are allowed to do more things, I think, um, you know, there'll still be a ton of use and interest. Um, just a, a short trip down memory lane. Um, sometimes people talk about like, well, people don't come and ask for things. So maybe they don't really need them. Um, I wasn't really that familiar with the city. And then suddenly we got a new playground at Seal Park and I certainly hadn't asked for it, but it made such a big difference to my family. So just because people aren't here asking us to replace things that are over 20 years old, I, I still think we should do the right thing. Um, and, and keep those things moving forward, especially when I read about the accessibility concerns on some of the, uh, the surfaces. Um, and reading about the PCI of 44 on the street maintenance one was concerning. So as far as I'm concerned, um, <laughs> Director Eggleston, you, you know, we'll, we'll just move ahead on that one. Um, I did have one question about one of the medium level ones, the downtown parking guidance, PL150002, it's on page 115. Um, is that easier to do now while there are potentially fewer people using the garages or is, does it not really matter? I mean, I saw there was a reference to this, one of the city hall things it was easier to do when people aren't there. Any thoughts on that one? I think it's, it's certainly easier to do when people aren't there. Uh, not impossible to do the work otherwise, but it probably in, uh, encompasses like closing entire levels of garages uh, while the installation is taking place. Tougher to do if they're full of cars. Okay. Um, we heard a lot of testimony tonight from, from um, members of the public about Charleston and Rastrodero. And I wonder if staff could just um, describe phases one and two. Um, you know, for those of us who weren't on the council, then would you say that the objectives were met? Did accidents go down? Um, did the number of cyclists go up? Just as we're contemplating phase three, I just wondered if we had any data on the effects of phases one and two. Holly, I'm not sure what we have in terms of data, but can you try to speak to that? 
Yeah, so phases one and two were completed. They didn't really get finalized until right when the pandemic started. So I, I, I would refer, I don't know if Philip is online still, but um, I don't think we got good um, traffic or bike counts afterwards. And I'm not even sure if they were done um, because they wouldn't be very accurate given the lockdown that ensued afterwards. So um, while they were under construction, there were, you know, the, bi the bikes, um, students did continue to use and bike to school. We didn't see a drop during the construction in 2018 and 2019. Uh, hi, yeah. Philip Cammy, Chief Transportation Official. Not, not much to add to that. Just, um, you know, we had hoped to do post-project um, counts, but um, obviously they're a bit limited by the uh, circumstances. So that's something that we'll have to follow on another day. Um, however, anecdotally, we have heard um, that uh, quite a few people are using them. Thank you. And Councilmember Cormac, perhaps while Philip is on screen, uh, at least as a reminder, um, you mentioned earlier the downtown parking guidance uh, project. I think the word medium probably doesn't do justice to the issue of time sensitivity of this project. So Philip, could you expand on that just uh, for a second? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, one of the, the key uses um, for the automated parking guidance, apart from the customer um, um, use of it, which is to really help them to, to find a, a parking space more quickly, but um, it does allow us to um, more um, maximize the um, capacity utilization of the um, parking garages. And um, doing that actually can um, allow us to offset parking that's occurring in other places. And, you know, the specific program that we're really interested in offsetting is the RPP um, employee program in the neighborhoods. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're balancing, you know, visitors that want to come for lunch and the employees that want to park in the garage and anyone else. So that's a really critical tool for us to have in our largest garages. Thank you. So no, no other hands. So I think we're done with this item. No. Oh, okay. Council Member Tanaka. Um, so uh, in this report, did the staff contemplate the federal funding? Um, or is this, I like, assume we don't get any federal funding? This is just assuming the, uh, the current funding that's in the capital budget in this year's capital budget. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think there was a thought that federal funding was necessarily available um, specifically for any one of these projects. Okay, so, so none, of, none of that 12 million can actually be applied towards any of this. Uh, well, my understanding is that probably much of it could if, if that's the, the choice that, that was made for how to use the funding. Okay. Um, okay, so if we do get the funding, then we should be in better shape then. Yes. Okay, okay, good. Um, and um, if we don't get the federal funding and hotel revenue you know, stays kind of dismal, what does that mean? For these projects, in terms of in terms of their funding, well, these these projects that we're discussing this evening are already fully funded. They're, so they're even fully if, funded if, even they're fully funded even with the lower uh, TOT revenues that were uh, planned for this fiscal year, and I think those estimates were even brought down further at mid year. Um, and, and those sorts of figures, as well as lower projections for upcoming years, are uh, what Kylie was mentioning in terms of the planning and, the, and what the 2.7 million uh, return was going towards. Okay, so if, even if the hotel revenue stays the same and, you know, worst case scenario, we don't somehow get that federal funding or can we, we can't apply it to these programs, we're still going to be okay in terms of um, back to... Uh, Councilmember Cormac's question about the BSR. So we'll still be good with all of that. I, I think so. And, and with respect to the capital budget, I guess what I'd say is that if those revenues were less than what we're currently planning for, uh, then as we're developing the five-year CIP, we, we would look at that and reprioritize and make adjustments. You know, just as we did last year, actually, um, 
the capital budget that was adopted last year, even before the mid-year adjustments, had a reduction of $19 million uh, from what had originally been planned for that fiscal year uh, in general fund transfer and TOT revenues. Uh, so, you know, during the budget process, we uh, cut projects, we made a lot of reductions, we moved things in the around in the budget to adjust to that. Uh, and if we had news in the future that was even worse than we're planning for now, we, we would continue to do that. Okay. Um, so um, is the list an explicit priority in terms of what staff thinks, like from the, from the most important to least, or is it, I wasn't quite sure, at least what's on in the, in the PDF file. It's not prioritized. Not prioritized. It's just a, it's a list of the projects and meant to give some of the information about what makes them important. Okay. Um, is there a plan to actually actually prioritize them, like from most important to least important? Well, the, the plan uh, to the to the extent that that council gives us direction to proceed would, would these are projects that in the short term we would be awarding contracts for very soon. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, um, and it, it's not like we're going to be okay because we're going to get some federal funding. And I hope the hotel revenue doesn't stay the way the way it is. So hopefully, we'll go back up. Um, but if it doesn't, right, then I would assume we would start cutting the stuff that's less important, right? Right, and and mostly from my point of view, I would envision we would be doing that through the budget process, uh, rather than through the, the the projects that you know we've already put the staff work into that are kind of ready to go. Okay, and have you guys already been actively looking for like federal grants that we might be eligible for some of these projects? federal state grants? Uh, on, on the projects where we're aware of funding sources we have, uh, I, I'm not sure that any of those are, are listed here. We do have some projects uh, here like the street maintenance that do have various uh, funding sources from the state like, like SB1. Uh, there's other projects that I think uh, maybe aren't on this list just because of, of where they are in terms of being ready to award a contract that do have grant funding. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're, we're always watching for opportunities to apply for grants. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry, uh, Vice Mayor Burt. Thank you. Um, so first, at, uh, at talking about this at, at a high level, um, what we've had in the last year is uh, a drastic drop in our revenue. Uh, we actually didn't cut, make significant cuts to our capital spending plan. We made significant cuts to our transfer to the capital plan, which basically mean, meant that our infrastructure balance or reserve shrunk drastically. And so the dollars, the total dollars that we have available for this year's and upcoming year's infrastructure projects were shrunk as a result. But we kept pretty much pedal to the metal uh, on, the, on the projects. Um, so now what we're experiencing is uh, a decline in the construction costs. And Brad, or can you just briefly give us uh, a sense of uh, what you're seeing in that regard? Well, recall that our, our biggest project, the public safety building project, I think was about 5% under the engineer's estimate. Uh, the project, the kinds of contracts we've had the most of have been street maintenance contracts. And I think one of those was nearly 20% under the estimate. Um, and some others have been in the 10% in the under range. Okay, so that kind of range, we'll call it in the neighborhood of 10%. Um... Uh, and we don't know whether from here going forward, it'll go up or down. Um, and the other factor that's happened uh, that uh, Mayor Du Bois had brought up in uh, the previous meeting is the cost of borrowing has uh, dropped drastically, that uh, the Fed is basically subsidizing uh, the availability of funds at really artificially low rates. And so we were, we, historically, we only considered bonding on real big projects like the public safety building. 
Uh, but I wanted to um, uh, raise the issue of potentially as, as our cash flow is low now, interest rates are extremely low and construction costs are down. Um, whether we should be looking at a couple of these other large projects like Fire Station 4, maybe even the uh, Charleston Rastrodero project um, uh, to bond against and to conserve our infrastructure dollars so we have enough dollars for what we really need. We may not be able to do significant transfers in the coming years. And so really conserving those dollars from a cash flow standpoint until we're fully recovered uh, may be a real wise thing to do. So Brad or Kylie, can you shed any light on of what size of a project does it make sense to consider uh, a bonding against? Because too small, it's, it, it costs more to, to um, uh, go through that process than it's worth. I, I can just say that on the projects that I've worked on doing bond financing, uh, on those ones to date, and it's, it's not my area of expertise, but we've had roughly the same fixed costs that were in the scale of, of several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, I have heard there are, are other ways of uh, doing that financing where it can be scaled more to the, the magnitude of the, the funds that you're seeking. Okay. I don't know if Kylie would weigh in more on that. Sure. Um, how we typically finance in this organization has been through certificates of participation. So from that perspective, there is a fixed cost to issue the debt. Um, it's usually about 250000 plus or minus, depending on the size of the debt. So to your point, there is a scalability aspect of it. The other aspect of it I would also just bear to mention is the ratings um, of the city. And one of the reasons we um, have such a low cost to borrow is we're rated as high as we can. Um, and the more we go after borrowing, the more at risk that rating is in play. Um, and normally um, that would be something, you know, I'm not saying that we have a poor credit. I'm just saying we are significantly impacted by COVID-19. Um, and if you read the current most recent rating information that was released from both s ps and Moody's, they cite weakness there um, in terms of our financials and the impacts of COVID. So one thing I would really strongly encourage um, council to consider and staff can obviously go back and talk with our advisors is what additional debt would do on our credit um, in the financial markets uh, from that perspective. Although as the rates have dropped so much, the debt service cost goes down. And so <laughs> we get to carry more debt without harming our rating at the lower interest rate? Um, not necessarily. Uh, the rating agencies don't just look at the debt margin. You are absolutely right that with that lower cost, um, it helps you from a debt margin perspective. But when they look at our financial solvency, they're looking at more than just the debt. Um, I'm not saying that that's the only factor, but I'm sure. saying that as the interest rates go down, if all other things were the same, we could borrow more without it, it harming us because the interest rate has gone down and the amount of debt service that we have uh, didn't increase um, uh, because the, it's just lower interest rate. Uh, sure, and that decision would be up to the rating agencies. Right, um, so it's something that I, I want us to really look at in particular for the um, uh, fire station number four. Um, I did have one quick question. Um, what happened on the theater seat project? On the theater seat project, there's a, a fair amount of funding in the project this year. Uh, I believe we have a, a relatively low cost uh, consultant contract underway for evaluating what a project would look like starting with children's theater. Oh, and so we had in the budget for FY21, the replacement of all those theater seats, I think of the main Lucy Stern theater. Right, so we're, we're not moving forward with replacing those seats this year. Good, uh, Brad, would you we're doing... explain a little further on the scope of work and where we are with the project or Kristen perhaps could chime in as well. I think this is um, in, in, important for the council to understand. 
And I'll ask Holly to jump in and correct me if I've got the theater wrong. Uh, she's closer to the details. But, uh, you know, the project started out with uh, repairing broken seats. Uh, as we looked into it, there were ADA accessibility issues and potential safety issues uh, that had to do with, with seats uh, blocking people's uh, being able to, to exit aisles. Uh, so we brought a designer on who's doing a full evaluation of, I was thinking it was the children's theater, but I may be mistaken. Uh, and they're going to look at all those issues and actually look at what the cost would be and what a design could look like to solve all of them and give us a cost estimate for that. Okay. So that's come out of the, um, that's no longer in this capital budget for this year, except for the designer cost. That's right. Okay, good. So, Councilmember Member Burke, can we come back to you? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Council Member Filsa. Yeah, thanks. Um, I had a question of staff. So, you know, we have this action in front of us with, you know, a number of contracts and there's a $2.7 million identified and so forth. Um, if we say, okay, this is good and we approve this plan. I mean, there's some things that are sort of out for bid in the various state because we're catching this in the fly, right? I mean, it's very short term tactical stuff. Um, can we adjust or change our mind or munch things later on? And if so, how late do we have? Well, you absolutely can uh, right up to the point where we bring something to you for approval. But um, okay. I think that that's, that's really part of why we're having this discussion is that we don't want to put in the staff time to bid a project, you know, right. write a staff report, then have it pulled from consent and take the council's time right. to make a different decision at that point. Right. Because, you know, I'm sort of mentally trying to synchronize this with as you guys are too, with, with the budgeting process that we're, we're going through at the moment, which is only a month out or something like that. I mean, I mean, the missing piece of information for us in all this is, you know, how much do we need? Okay. I mean, is 2.7 million, is that a lot or a little, right? And, you know, I think the problem is this is all stuff that you kind of got to look at long-term steady state now. It's not just about moving, you know, moving this from this year to next year, next year to this year and so forth. I think all our intuition is that we're gonna to have to cut our capital budget over the next five years and potentially longer, you know, for the, for the readjusted world that we're in now. And, uh, you know, how much that is, you know, until we see the new budget at least, right? I mean, we're all just basically throwing darts, right? Um, so I'll throw a dart, right? which is if I had to guess, I'd say it's somewhere between 10 and 15% of the year uh, of, of the capital budget each year for at least the next four or five years and potentially longer. Uh, and that's assuming that we get the $12 million from the feds and spend it on capital. So it seems to me that the, the tricky question for tonight is, you know, are we making calls tonight that are gonna constrain our ability to make decisions over the next several years, okay? So for example, one way to do this, I mean, I don't know if 10 or 15% is right, but let's say for the sake of argument, it's 12%, right? One way to approach this is we say, we cut everything 12%, right? So you name it, Rincon Auto Park, Charleston, Astro, every, every, we just take 12% off the top and, and do the best we can with that, right? That's not the only way to do it. We probably would not actually do it that way, okay? but. The decisions we're making is if there's things that we don't cut 12%, then there's some other things we're gonna to have to cut more than 12%. Right? And so, uh, and I think that's the thing that, that we're all gonna sort of be struggling with this evening is that, you know, how do we get our arms around this thing? Granted that we'll know more in a couple months when we've been through the budgeting process, but, you know, we can probably take some estimates there. So I like, I mean, I like $2.7 million just fine, okay? but I'd really like to be able to change my mind later after I see sort of the next wave of numbers if, if necessary, right? And that's, that's sort of where my, my thought process is on this right now. Um, thanks. Okay, uh, Councilmember Stone. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks to city staff for bringing this back, back to us. Um, and I want to also just thank all the community members who have advocated over the last over the last week and sent us emails and spoke tonight in regards to the Arrastadero Bike Boulevard project. Um, I definitely I know I know I haven't heard any of my colleagues talking about removing that from the the list of to do projects. So I'm glad to hear that. I just want to make sure I I kind of put out there. I think that that project is is absolutely critical. I mean during during discussions that we've that we've had over the last couple of months on uh, on the budget and and cutting back on the infrastructure project, I know I've made clear that I want to see projects going forward, infrastructure projects going forward that uh, are only absolutely really kind of necessary. Uh, and I think I think health safety and um, especially the public safety of uh, of young people, well, just of anyone biking, but especially students along this corridor, uh, are in my view absolutely necessary. So um, I'm hoping that we can make sure that we include the the bike boulevard there um i also thought some really good comments i thought david cole's comment on really aligning our capital improvement projects to our to our city uh policies and priorities was spot on i i don't think that's something that we we do too often but i think that's always important to kind of keep that lens in place and uh fortunately a lot of these projects i think do fulfill that i mean just for example the in for the Arrastadero project there definitely is helping us meet our, our climate change and our, our SCAP goals. So um, keeping that there. And I wanna uh, compliment Shri, the, the gun freshman who spoke very, very well articulated uh, his concerns and that of his peers along that, along that corridor. Uh, I encourage all council members to go out there and, and see the dangerous conditions, especially in the AM commute. Of course, right now is not a good time to to do that, given the the limited students that are returning to to gun, it's just a couple couple hundred, maybe a few hundred right now who are who are going back. So you're not going to get a, a, a true sense of it, but the really dangerous intersection there, um, especially approaching El Camino, and and, and I think that is that's got that needs to be our, our top concern. A um, couple questions for for staff here. I just wanted to, to be clear on um, on page 110 of the packet at the very top, table one, projects with funding in fiscal year 2021 expected to be returned to fund balance. So those are those are projects that are e that have either been completed or staff has decided we're going to table them temporarily in order to be able to save that 2.7 million. I'm, I'm just trying, trying to get a sense, uh, trying to get a, a, a better understanding of that table. Yeah, that, that's right, council member. Um, a number of those are projects that have been completed where all the funding was not expended. So we're essentially um, proposing to return it to the fund balance in this year's budget process. Um, and then in some of them, with the, there are some of those projects where we've been having the discussions with council about what's critical and what's not. And we decided these really are projects we can return the funding for now and, and plan for them in the future. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and thanks for, for taking, um, kind of responding to council's direction in the, in the you know, past several meetings uh, regarding our concerns about that. Um, going, moving to the, the various park improvement projects, I, I feel like there's, uh, and, you know, we're going to get more into that with the, the Ramos Park renovation discussion, but I, I'd like to see kind of how much maybe that we can cut out of some of these Im improvements to, to be able to, yeah, I, I think I, I don't have a clear understanding. I mean, the, the attachment a one is, is very helpful, but I, I don't have a clear understanding as far as like what is truly necessary, how dangerous this is, is this equipment? I mean, part of me agrees with council member Cormac saying, well, you know, we, we need to do better. And if this equipment is that old, we need to replace it. The other part of me considers, well, if it's all all of these parks have equipment that's over 20 years old, and are they, are they, are, are, do we just want shiny new equipment, or are they truly, are they truly getting to the point where they actually pose a true danger for for kids? And if that's the case, I'm I'm absolutely ready to move on and and start replacing those. But I'm you know, given they've already they've all been going for 20 years or so now. Um, so if if you can give a little more clarification on that. Well, one thing I would say is that probably none of these projects uh, cause a terrible problem if, if they're postponed for a year. It's the kind of roll down effect of if you postpone it and pull and defer it by pulling the funding 
and spend it somewhere else, and we're doing that in a lot of places, then we end up pushing back a lot of work and, and building up really a, um, a catch up deferred maintenance backlog, which was the whole thing we were trying to address with IBRIC. Um, I, I would ask Kristen or Darren Anderson if, if they'd like to, to jump in and maybe speak a little bit to what they see as the concerns about those uh, older playgrounds. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Brad. This is Darren Anderson with Community Services Department. And thank you for that good question, Councilmember Stone. Um, I think with each of them, there's components that are critical. So you've got the broader project, which usually includes the playground and a few associated amenities. There are parts that could last a little longer and there are parts that need to be done right away. Maybe we just look at one example of Ramos and this is applicable at the others too, that there are elements. So Ramos playground, 26 years old, uh, portions of the surfacing that we called out, they're way too hard. So if you went out there and looked at them, they don't, they're not crumbling to pieces, but they do not pass safety tests and they need to be replaced. So we've costed out those parts. So this is the minimum that has to happen is $15,000 of surfacing repairs at Ramos Park. And if we don't do that in the next, you know, this is a little bit arbitrary, but somewhere in the next six months or so, we may have to close down that, part, that playground. The other thing to consider is with a 26 year old playground, parts fail at an increasing rate as it's older. Parts aren't always accessible for a playground that, that, that old. And sometimes when you buy a new part, it triggers multiple repairs that can get rather expensive. And soon it starts to beg the question whether it's cost effective to be stringing along a playground that's so old. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. It's like having a 69 Chevy that you wanna keep maintaining, otherwise if it all breaks down, you're, good luck finding the parts, right? Okay, perfect, thank you. Jump in. I'll start with a few questions. So, I think I think we did Fire Station Three as design build, right? Are are we considering that for Fire Station Four? Uh, no, we did it as a, a traditional design bid build. Okay, uh, I mean, would we say design build wouldn't have? Would, I don't think would have worked very well with our ARB process. That's that's really the thing that's kind of limited us there before on these types of projects. So again, uh, if it helps us save funds, is that something we should consider for Fire Station 4 and just, you know, create a new process to handle that? It's something that we could potentially look further into. Um, the, the issue we've run up against when we looked at it be, uh, before for some other projects, uh, for instance, where we really looked long and hard was the Cal Ave Garage project. And Ultimately, we decided it didn't work well with our process because, because of the fact that by the time we get through our ARB process that, that's really needed to scope out the project to the point where you could develop bridging documents uh, for a design build, you've already gone way beyond what the typical level of design for bridging documents would be. So, you know, the, the design build process uh, is supposed to save the most money when you've got kind of a, a, a less defined scope and you're able to, to turn that over to someone who can look for the ways to find money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's where we hit the difficulty. You know, uh, again, what I'm hearing is over the next four or five, six years, we're going to have a huge gap. And if we don't, don't start cutting now or at least saving money, we're probably going to have to cancel projects in the future. Right. So I think it's kind of a question of where can we scrimp and save? Um, you know, again, I don't think we're talking about outright ending any of these projects right now. But again, you look at the big dollar items, Charleston or Astadero, you know, my question there is really, is there a way we could value engineer that a little bit and, and get the cost down a bit? Um, on the magical bridge, you know, the... Um, hasn't been around that long, it's $400,000 to replace the material. You know, is there a longer life material we can use or should we expect to spend $400,000 every six or seven years or eight years, whatever it's been, um, which is a lot. Um, and, you know, all these projects are great. I mean, I'd like to add the Roth building and Carberly to the list, um, you know, but we're gonna have this shortfall. So, and we still face uncertainty. Um, 
I also started to get, you know, concerned about inflation, which we haven't seen in this country for a long time, um, rising interest rates. Um, and I know we have a great credit rating. You know, we are very unleveraged as a city. Um, and again, so all those things kind of make me think if there is a way to use more debt in the short term, we should. Um, you know, and then when I look at the parks, I mean, I agree. When you're talking about a wooden structure that's 20 or 25 years old, and two hundred thousand dollars to replace it, it seems really reasonable to go ahead and do that. And I also understand, you know, we want to be efficient. If we're doing work, let's do a cluster of work at once. But I just think somehow we got to get into a new mindset and and really try to save money. And so, as an example, and I'm just throwing out made up numbers, but just kind of how I'm thinking about the problem is, you know, could we consider minimal improvements to Rankin Auto Park? just the critical pavement, potentially save a million, a million and a half dollars there. Um, could we cost engineer out $500,000 of Charleston or Rastadero? Those are our two big dollar items. Um, could we delay, the other one that jumped out to me was just delay the lighting upgrades for the tennis courts. I mean, and they, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have lights, they work, we, but we wanna go to LED lighting. Um, you know, and, and that would be $200,000 there. And so we would end up with two, two and a half million dollars that I'm just saying, let's put it on hold tonight and then come back during the budget process. You know, we would have this contingency fund. And as we go through the budget, we could decide whether we want to restore those or use that money elsewhere. Um, I'm just, Kylie, is that the kind of thinking that's helpful? You know, just... Again, I don't, I don't think tonight we should go down to the details, but again, if we just said, let's slow down a couple of these and then just pull them into the budget process and once we get a little bigger picture. Uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, Mayor, I, you're saying overall pull a few that cause pause that you wanna review later, but then the other ones would move forward? Yeah, and I guess I'm looking for direction again, and not not pausing the entire projects, but saying, can we save even more money on some of these projects? Um, and that would again potentially give us a little more flexibility, um, and that we would, you know, address it in a month or two as we go into the budget. But sure, um, I'd actually ask Director Eggleston to opine uh, in terms of the impacts on the specific projects, but uh, that seems like something we could morph with. Yeah, it, it sounds like the idea could be even that if council wanted to determine an amount that they ask us to value engineer or shave things off of projects such that we would plan for you to head into the budget process with some amount. Uh, in my view, that's probably more workable to give us that assignment than it, than it is at a council meeting to try to go through projects yeah. one at a time and figure out what that is on the fly. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And that's really what I was trying to say. I just yeah. was trying to give an example. Uh -huh. so, okay, I'm out of, out of time. Um, Vice Mayor Burt, was your hand back up? Uh, that was a carryover. So whenever we start next round. Okay, well, um, Council Member Ku, I don't think you've spoken. Council Member Tanaka, uh, you did speak early on, I guess. All the questions, well, actually, um, most have already been asked and said, um, although I did find one thing that was not asked on the street maintenance, it identifies uh, over 11 million. So is that, how much is coming from SB1 and how much is from other grants and what is our share? Well, I guess, what is our share? Uh, I'll ask Holly in a second to give those numbers and then I'll try to explain a little bit of why that number looks the way it does because I realize it's confusing in your report. Okay, thank you. Do you want? Oh, oh okay. yeah, Holly. You so <laughs> the $11 million um, is the adjusted 2021 budget. So last year when COVID struck, um, 
three of our street resurfacing projects for fiscal year 2020 were paused and were awarded later in June, two in June and one in August 2020. So that totals about six and a half million dollars of that $11.6 million. So that money has already been awarded and spent. The three projects are, uh, the last one is almost complete. Um, of those two, uh, the projects, the SB1 funding, we get about 1.2, 1.3 million dollars a year. Um, they, it has to be used for street improvement projects. Um, and then additionally, last year, we had about two million dollars in grants. So about, I'm gonna say, four, about six, seven million dollars of that, 11 million dollars is in either in grant funding, SB1 funding, Measure B and VRF funding. Um, the gas tax funding and the SB1 funding, while not glamorous, they are used for street improvement functions. So if we don't have a transportation project or any kind of streetscape or street improvement project, they get assigned to street resurfacing. Um, and so the money we have available for fiscal year 21 is about $4 million of that $11 million. So those are really the two projects that are in the estimated contract amount are the two contracts remaining for 2021. So 4 million will come from the general fund on our side. Did I hear that? Approximately, yes. Approximately, okay. And then um, is there a deadline for the grant monies and SB1 monies that has to be used? Well, the SB1 funding is every year we come to council, usually in the spring, we're planning on coming to you next month. We have to adopt a resolution and council has to assign a project with specific lo street locations for this project. So the deadline is really the resolution in the spring. And so, um, we're getting ready next month to come to you guys to ask for, to be assigned. Really, we've, we've chosen fiscal 2022 street resurfacing projects, but that is something that could be used on a different street improvement project, such as Charleston Rossadero. Mm, oh, I see. Okay. So if you don't want to spend the money on street resurfacing, that is something that we could at least assign on this list of projects. We could come and say, that, that we want to use that SB1 funding, which is for 2022, is about $1.3 million. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Brad, did you have anything to um, add? She really covered it all. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, on the uh, Civic Center waterproofing study and repairs, mm -hmm. obviously the leaks are pretty bad in there, if that's what I understand. Um, is there further damage, you know, like mode and all that, that we need to look into, or is that just basically um, contained? It's contained right now. Um, the membrane still has a lot of elasticity in it. However, we really need to address the expansion joint and the planter boxes, which is what this funding would do, um, is to repair those locations. Okay. And of course, you know, um, Mayor has said about the, the parks, um, play areas. Um, I think those are, those are important areas for the younger folks who, who needs, um, you know, these areas outside. Um, thanks for ask, answering the questions. Okay, thank you. So we're going to start a second round. I think we should start to get to some motions. Uh, Councilmember Filsa. So uh, let's say for the sake of argument that in each of the years 22, 23, 24, 25, we had to cut $9 million out of the capital plan, which is about 70 or $80 million each year. So if we ask staff to save Four million dollars tonight. Then, if it were nine million a year for the next four years, then it would go to eight million a year over the next four years. So, what if we asked you folks to save another two and a half million tonight? What would what would happen? Another 
uh, council member, are you referring to another two and a half million beyond the, the yeah. 2.7 million? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we would go back and look at these projects and uh, look for what we viewed as, as the least critical uh, parts of some of them. Right. And potentially look, uh, there might be some of them where we could just potentially do less work. That would, that would be kind of the hope, you know? I mean, the more you can downscale, the less you have to cut, <laughs> you, have to, you have to stop, right? <laughs> and vice versa. Um, and then suppose, the, suppose we went through the budgeting process over the next month or two and came back and said, you know what? Actually, we only need to find, you know, 2 million a year uh, gap. Uh, could we then put, uh, put some of that money back? Probably because I, I think the way we've described this when we first brought this list to council, you, these are things where we expect to provide to uh, bring uh, contracts before the end of the fiscal year. But yep. the reality is we probably won't manage to, to pull all of those through the process. And frankly, okay. some things are a little bit on hold um, while we have this, you know, have this conversation, things that might otherwise have been out to bid right now. Understand. Okay. Um, I guess I'll make a motion then. Uh, move that move that staff find another two and a half million dollars in savings off the uh, twenty fiscal twenty one capital plan. I'll, I'll second it. And uh, you know, capital and operating expenses aren't easily fungible because operating expenses a dollar of operating expense is a dollar per year, whereas a dollar of capital is a dollar, right? But at some point, at some point, there is a nexus between those two things, and uh, if we can't, you, you, you know, there's going to be a trade-off between these things, and I think we're all sick of cutting services, right? So that means we really got to dig hard on the capital plan now, and uh, you know, there's just stuff we're not going to be able to afford to do right away. Um, and when I say right away, I mean not postponing a year, but postponing many years. Okay, so, so, just to correct, but I think we got to go through that exercise. Sorry to interrupt you, Eric. I, I think it was two point five million, not twenty million. Yeah, sorry. Correct? An additional, an additional two point five million savings. So that's a total of, uh, if I do my arithmetic right, five point two. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember okay. Sanka, do you want to speak to your second? Well, I I think. Um... I think it's always easy, it's always easier to add money back than to take it away. And I think uh, Councilmember Phyllis has talked about kind of the need. And for me, I think it's just a prudent thing to do. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the economy. Um, sure, we're going to get money from the federal government, but um, you know our revenue still is is down a lot. And uh, there's a lot of other needs that we have. So I think we need to start looking at this and try to do some value engineering. Try to um, you know, really prioritize what, what's just truly needed. Because not everything I think is truly needed. Um, I actually did have a quick question for staff though, um, which is on table one, which is uh, on page three of, uh, unfortunately I'm using electronic and you guys are using paper version. So I don't quite know what, what, what that maps to, uh, to what you guys are looking at. But on page three of the staff report, um, on PE 08001, Ricanardo Park Improvements, I thought table one is one that's not going to be in there already in a 2.7, but then I see that again on, on attachment A, um, second line. So I don't know, maybe Seth could also talk a little bit about that. I was, I saw that. that that's there because uh, at the mid-year, actually, we reduced that project by the amount of the new restroom that we were planning to add. Uh, so there's all there's already been oh, some value engineering on that project to the tune of, I think, maybe $350,000. I see. Okay. That's why it's on the twice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Burt. Yeah. Um, so um, thanks for the motion. I think this is in the right ballpark. Um, as we look at um, the uh, attachment A and what, what staff has provided on the status, um, as Brad mentioned, a, a lot of these projects, some are out to bid, some we and we're due to get back uh, shortly, but a bunch of them are just ready to go out for bid. And my understanding is that it's about, uh, you know, there's a, that whole bid cycle and then before be ready to 
uh, even have a prospective contract to the council. It's uh, maybe about three months anyway. So that puts us into the next fiscal year uh, as it is. And that uh, what we're probably looking at is on these projects, um, a few things maybe get value engineered and reduced a little bit. Um, but for the most part, we're rolling them into FY22. And then we get a better opportunity to wade into the capital project for, projects for FY22 and really go through that prioritization. Uh, and so this, this is a necessary interim step uh, to um, kind of carry us through to that next budget. Uh, and But I think it's it, it'll be relatively painless to um, probably do uh, what's in this motion uh, because it doesn't mean we're eliminating those projects for the most part. It, I think it means we're just pushing them out into the next fiscal year, uh, which may be only uh, almost the same amount of time as they would have been if we hadn't taken this action um, because uh, uh, these co contracts, for the most part, haven't come to the council yet and aren't imminent. Um, so I think for that range of reasons, this uh, this dovetails well with our our more thoughtful budget process coming up in the next couple months. Uh, Councilmember Cormick. I find myself confused. I've heard three different things. I've heard cut things, value engineer existing projects. I've heard maybe there's some that shouldn't be on the list and I've heard just move them to next year. So could council member Phil Seth restate his intent here? So I, I understand it. And then maybe I'll just check with staff. I think that uh, we should cut the 21 cap fiscal 21 capital budget by another $2.5 million. And, uh, and any of those methods you know, are fine. As long as it comes out of the capital budget, yeah. What, what it shouldn't come out of is the budget stabilization reserve or operations or other kind of stuff like that. Um, you know, the Zen of this is that ultimately the capital budget comes from, from two places, right? Actually three. Some comes from grants, some comes from fees, and the rest of it comes from whatever free cash is thrown off by the general fund, okay? The majority of that comes from the general fund, okay? Fees and uh, fees and grants are smaller. So we just took a 20% revenue hit on the general fund, okay? So, you know, ultimately the capital fund comes from that, okay? So if we're gonna cut revenues in the general fund by 20%, we're probably gonna end up cutting the capital budget ultimately by 10 or 15 percent more you account for the and the, the grant component right so we're going to have to do this right and so the most important thing is you know the the savings we're talking about tonight comes out of the capital fund and uh uh and not out of uh uh sort of the other the other pockets now if we defer a million dollars one year you know we're going to have to defer that million dollars again the next year and the next year and the next year. So um, I think in the short term, it's okay to think about, you know, year to year deferrals, but, you know, from a top down perspective, you really got to look at, it's a permanent, there's going to be a permanent cut in the capital, capital budget. And, you know, it's almost certain in my mind, but again, we won't know till we see the numbers. It's almost certain in my mind that the cut to the cap, the annual cut to the capital budget over what's forecast right now, is going to be much much larger than uh, two and a half million, and, and probably larger than even five million. Um, but well, you know, we'll wait till we'll, we see we'll the numbers there. in the budget we'll process. We'll get there. We'll get there in a month we'll, or so. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see when staff goes through it and, and, and does it right instead of us hand waivers. <laughs> I'm going to interpret this as a is not really savings because I think that's a misnomer as a reduction in expenditures, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I mean, All right. So that's that. Uh, that just I was I was getting hung up on that. So. So you're really basic, that, and so you just did the math. You added it up, it's 20.7 million, you have your 12% and that's where you came up with the 2.5? I got a much more detailed spreadsheet, but uh, again, well, I wanna see staff. level ties to yours. Uh, so my, 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 mine are all wrong, staffs are the ones that are right. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, let me just ask staff then, um, if we had the full five-year capital improvement budget in front of us right now, 
um, do you continue to believe that these four parks are the parks that should be done first, right? Out of all the 36 parks, these are the four projects that should be done before any others. Darren would be the greatest authority on that, but if he wants to speak, what I would say first is a number of these parks projects already have been deferred many times. So right. I, I suspect that the ones we're talking about now um, are those ones. But Darren, would you want to weigh in? Yeah, just just briefly. Thank you, Brad. And thank you for that question, Councilmember Cormack. It's a, it's a challenging one to give you an accurate answer on. I, I think I would say for the most part, that's true, that these are some of the oldest playgrounds in our system. And they've got elements that are critical in nature. I would I think you could make an argument that some of the other elements of the capital project, like for Ramos, there's striping of a basketball court. Well, that's not critical. That's a nice to have. The playground is in the more critical category. There are other projects in that five-year budget cycle that are also very compelling. Uh, Bullware Park, for oh, yeah. example. For sure, um, but we're not ready yeah. to do that one yet, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. We but we'd like to be in this be. in this five-year cycle, though. We'd it's like coming. To be. Yeah. It's coming. Okay. That's helpful. Um, I'm not happy to support this motion because um, none of this is um, happiness inducing, but um, I will support it. I, I will just say, I think we are now at the point where there are things that aren't going to get done or happen. So value engineering now will be, okay, this one part at, at the Charleston Rastadero won't happen. This one part of Rinconada won't happen. Not it'll happen later or in a different manner. Um, and I hope, I hope my, colleagues agree with me and that the community, you know, is getting ready to understand we, we will not be able to do everything that we, we had hoped for. Can, can I chime in for just a second? I know it's Councilmember Carmack's time, but I'm, I'm out. On that, so it's up to the on, mayor. On that topic, you know, I think this is the, this is the process by which, you know, we make the painful grappling of, you know, what are the must haves, what are the should haves and what are the nice to haves? And, and, and we're gonna go through this and this is, this is the process by, by, by which we get there. Okay, so I think, it's, I think it's time to vote. You know, it'd be great if we can negotiate down a few projects in the bidding process, but we'll see, we'll see what staff comes back with. Um, and I would say, hopefully the next item, Ramos Park, we can go through based on this discussion. Hopefully it'll, it'll go fairly smoothly. Um, so we're bidding, we're voting on this motion. Um, I'm going to start with Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. Councilmember Cormack. Yes. I'm a yes. Councilmember Philseth. Yes. Councilmember Koo. Yes. Councilmember Stone. Yes. And Councilmember Tanaka. Yes. Great. Okay. So we're now on to item number six which is specifically about park improvements at Ramos Park. And let's see, perhaps I'll, I'll lead in as Director O'Kane uh, gets prepped. We do not have a staff presentation. I believe that we're, we're intending to make here, recognizing that we needed to be flexible given the outcome of the last discussion. I suspect, and I'll, I'll venture out, and uh, Kristen and Darren can correct me if incorrect, we, be to go ahead uh, with the adoption of the ordinance uh, for the purpose of establishing the master plan uh, for the park overall while recognizing that the actual capital improvement projects will be scaled based upon uh, the action you just took. Scaled down <laughs> based on the action you just took. That's correct, um, city manager. We don't, um, we don't have a presentation like you said, we're here to um, answer any questions you might have. And Darren did give a good summary in the during the last item on Ramos Park and um, what would need to be done in the near term versus the long term. So just, just for the members of the public, it might be useful. I saw a lot of emails about the fence, uh, the bathroom is in this, is in the, in the staff recommendation. Could you just talk to again, I, what I heard the city manager say was we, we would pass this, but then that timing and the phasing would be determined in the future. Is that what we're saying? That's right. So the park improvement ordinance doesn't 
put a time frame on the project. So we could complete it in, um, we could do one component of it. We could do it all um, at one time. The, the park improvement ordinance, ordinance is just a process in the pro or a step in the process of the project. It doesn't um, commit us to doing anything within any certain time frame. Okay, so with that, I, let's go to the members of the public, see if there are any public comment. Any members of the public that wish to speak on the Ramos Park Park Improvement Ordinance, please raise your hand at this time. We have one speaker, Rebecca Eisenberg. Rebecca, go ahead, you have two minutes. I'm not gonna take up that much this time. I just was hoping for a clarification about what happened with the off-leash dogs pilot because I was one of the community members who very much favored it. And in this long discussion, um, I, I guess maybe I didn't have patience to get to the bottom line of what the decision was. Um, if off-leash is not in this um, pilot, pilot isn't at this park, I hope that the city will continue to um, consider and off-leash options for our dog friends. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Mayor Du Bois, there's no further speakers. Great, let's bring it back to council. I see Councilmember Cormack and then Councilmember Filsa. Um, I'm happy to move. Um, are you waiting for, mo ready for motions, Mayor Du Bois, or not? Yeah, we, we can do motions. And... Fine, I'm happy to move um, adoption of the ordinance with the removal of section D5. It's on package page 125 and number one. Um, and if there's a second, I'll, I'll explain. Well, I'll second that. Great, thank you. Um, we have had a lot of um, emails about the dog park, which is not included in this. And according to the email from uh, Peter Jensen on the staff, that that uh, chain link fencing was directly related to the dog park. So that in the event there's a dog park, I think we're gonna have to come back and do a separate ordinance anyway. Um, and I do just want to be responsive to the, uh, the members of the community who were concerned about us blocking that off. Um, leaving the rest of it, you know, um, uh, I think, I think makes, um, makes sense. Yeah, just to speak to my second. So, so again, if we're passing the ordinance tonight, um, the dog park was the one area that I did want to talk about a little bit. And I, I agree um, about removing the fence. And I, and I really wanted to ask staff about, I like the idea of piloting an off-leash dog park. And, you know, as a dog owner, the, the hours actually made a lot of sense to me, kind of early morning and dusk. You know, those are good times to take your dog out. And it would, again, I like the idea of the pilot. And, and really the question was, you know, could that idea come back but not have a fence? And, um, I mean, I know people off leash dogs in other parks where there aren't fences. So, uh, well, how would a staff think about that? Um, Darren, could you take that, please? Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, the Parks and Rec Commission has been working on the dog park issue for quite some time. We hadn't originally thought about Ramos as a site, except for during the first community meeting, a member of the public said, hey, what about a dog off leash program or a dog park here? And that's why we started exploring that particular site. The public feedback was initially supportive of the idea of the off leash pilot, the Parks and Rec Commission less so. Um, and ultimately we just said, I think the commission settled on this not being the right site, but they are committed to continuing to work on an idea of an off leash pilot. And so we're gonna try to find the right location. The current thinking is that Ramos might not be it. Okay, well, I mean, if, if you go back to Parks and Rec, I guess, at least for this council member, I, I think it could be a good location. It's, it is a nice park with a lot of green space, um, but I think we should be open to like just testing this idea of an off leash program. <laughs> but without necessarily putting up a bunch of fences in our parks. So that's it. Um, all right, so we're commenting on the motion, uh, Councilmember Ku and Councilmember Stone. So I wanted to ask, you know, um, based on what staff had said or what Darren had said was minimal, it'll take about, was it Darren or was it Brad? I forget, I'm sorry, um, 15,000 in order to bring it to safety right for this particular park so 
is the, for example, the bathroom dollars going to be allocated to something to be used elsewhere? Or is that still kept in the fund um, if it's going to be built at a later time? How, how, how would that, that funding work? Maybe I can help answer this one, but, but Public Works, please feel free to interject if um, I misstep at all. The bathroom funding comes from a different source. That's park development impact fees instead of general fund. So that's from a separate CIP, and we thought it made sense to combine them because the restroom was part of the park's master plan, and they specifically called out this park, Ramos Park, as a potential site to explore. Um, so depending on council direction, that could be part of this, or if you prefer to use that money elsewhere for something comparable. Now, that, that impact fee money cannot be used for maintenance or replacement of existing. So it's got a different criteria than the general fund. Okay, thank you for that. Um, um, in the pilot off-leash, uh, the off-leash program that was discussed at uh, Parks and Rec, didn't the topic of enforcement come in to discussion as well? Yeah, there are a number of challenges, as always, with this kind of thing. It's a little touchy and it can be impactful in ways you don't necessarily anticipate. For example, the off-leash hours also impact the adjacent use of the athletic field. And so there were concerns about um, overlap there of dogs interfering with different athletic events on the main turf, even though we, since there's no fencing, there'd be nothing to stop them. The enforcement issue was certainly another one. We had met with uh, animal services and the animal control officers joined our early conversations on where we could do this, how it would work. And they reiterated numerous times that they just are spread too thin to really be enforcing the rules, which makes it a little sketchy when you've got a given set of hours, who would stop people if they exceed those hours? And the answer is, it'd be hard pressed to have someone there. And, and, and for people to call in in case there is a problem to report, would there be any officers available to respond or even personnel? For animal services, it would, it would be the kind of, they'd have to be called and they express that they're spread really thin and it might be a challenge to get there in a timely manner. Okay, thank you so much. Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of uh, quick questions. So are, how would, um, are we, are we approving, kind of a process question here, are we approving the full amount that's within the report or is staff now gonna take the direction that we just gave in the last action item and cut off the fat from, from, from anything in, um, that's being currently proposed to? Yeah, we're, we're approving the, we're the improvement ordinance without any dollars okay. today. Thank you. Um, and then, one more question, just as far as like the timeline on the construction, uh, the, the staff report said that the construction would occur in the summer, would take about 90 days. Kind of curious why we would, why we would do the construction during the summer when the construction process would take up pretty much the entire summer. And I would imagine that is when uh, most people are using the, using the park. So is it possible to just delay this to another time where the park is gonna be less, less busy? Yeah, I, th I think that is possible to delay it. Um, there are impacts depending on how it shakes out with other CIPs that we have enough staffing to do them at, at the same time, but we could certainly look at that. Okay, perfect. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no other hands, I'm uh, gonna suggest we vote on this. Um, I think we're starting with Council Member Cormack. Yes. Um, I vote yes. Councilmember Filseth. Woof. I mean, yes. Councilmember Baku. Yes. Council yes. Member Stone. Yes. Uh, can I get another woof? <laughs> Councilmember Tanaka. Yes. And Vice Mayor Burt. Yes. Great. All right. Well, thank you. That's um, 7 0 on item number six. So we move on to our last item tonight, which is a colleague's memo. Um, of a resolution denouncing and condemning and combating racism, xenophobia, and intolerance against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Palo Alto. Um, 
I assume there's not a staff report for this. Just go. Okay. So okay. I'd like to go first to uh, council members on the on the memo, um, either Councilmember Tanaka or Councilmember Koo. Well, thank you. Well, first, I want to say thank you for bringing this topic, um, this colleague's memo so soon uh, to, to the whole council for discussion and hopefully for adoption. Um, I also want to thank my co-sponsors uh, on, um, on this memo, uh, Mayor Du Bois and Council Member Tanaka. Um, you know, these, um, these occurrences, these hate crimes that has been happening in, in the Bay Area and throughout the country is just something that is unacceptable. And, you, you know, I would have preferred that we would be looking at something that is uh, about all racism, racism against everyone. Um, at this point, though, because the focus has been on uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, um, we do want to bring this forward and also the resolution um, if um, the resolution is also asking for our, our uh, counties and other cities to support in this and to work together with uh, Palo Alto and for all of us to work together uh, in combating and denouncing um, racism. Um, you know, for Chinese uh, immigrants, I mean, this has been um, happening ever since the 1850s where um, both European and Asian immigrants came to the United States seeking to improve their economic well-being. Um, so, um, but for some reason, the Chinese immigrants were regarded as a bigger threat. Um, they were, we, were, we were seen as racial threat to pure white America and there were seen, we were seen as an economic threat to, to free white labor. They were, we were depicted as a disease threat. A lot of anti-Chinese rhetoric hinged on portraying Chinese people as fil filthy and disease ridden. Um, there were also, we were also seen as a religious and moral threat as heathens who threatened a Christian America. Um, but even before the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act of 18, uh, 1882, the Page Act of 1875, um, was one of the earliest pieces of federal le legislation to restrict immigration uh, to the United States in the 19th century. It was designed to prohibit, pro to prohibit immigrants deemed undesirable, defined as Chinese collie laborers and prostitutes from entering the US. So does that language sound familiar? Um, you know, and I look at this as we move forward and with the analysis by the Center of Study of Hate and Extremism for California State, from the California State University in San Bernardino, um, they examined that hate crimes in 16 of America's largest cities, it reveals that these crimes in 2020 has decreased overall by 7%. However, those targeting Asians uh, rose by nearly 150%. Um, so we, and, and this is demonstrated by, you know, the killings in Atlanta and, um, and, and sadly what happened today. Um, and these actions actually, and these attitudes often pit communities against communities, minorities against minorities, which is why I'm saying that this needs to stop. You know, we, as long as we're only about our own ethnicity and protecting our own ethnicity, we're always gonna pit, be pit against each other and the racists are gonna win. We're not gonna win this battle as long as we, we do not stop scapegoating each other and raging against each other. Um, so I would like to ask that people redirect their focus and demand for better education, demand affordable health care, demand equal protections and opportunity and stop the radical yelling in the wind so nothing is heard or done. Uh, and I hope that we will adopt this resolution and move forward to address hate altogether for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to let, uh, so we're going to go to Council Member Tanaka and uh, I'll speak on the memo and then we'll go to the public and then we'll come back to Council. So go ahead, Council Member Tanaka. 
Yeah, thank you for uh, supporting this memo and thank you for uh, moving this on the agenda. I, wish, I just wish it was a little bit earlier versus this time now because I, uh, both uh, Councilmember Ku and myself was at a um, anti-hate rally yesterday. Um, it was actually pretty well attended, much more well attended than I thought it would be just because it was so, it was so, so last minute. And, it, you know, it, it's, it was kind of interesting. I think in Palo Alto, we were probably in one of the most liberal cities in the, in the country most open-minded cities, but and I was, as I was talking to my fellow protesters there, I was really surprised to hear so many first-hand accounts of racism, of discrimination towards Asian Americans. Um, and, you know, all of, a lot of Asian Americans have done well, where we, you know, got to be here in Palo Alto, but, but the amount of racism that, that people feel is quite alarming. I was really surprised just talking to my, I was, I was talking, I was surprised just talking to my fellow Asians that I'm not the only one that's feeling it here in, in our city, but others are as well. And, and, and not only are they feeling it, but a lot of times it's not reported. And I'm asked, should, they re no, should this be reported? You know, should a police report be filed? Um, if someone throws a cup of water on you, is that, is that a hate crime? Is that, should, should, should we file a police report or should we just ignore it? And unfortunately, a lot of times, a lot of Asians just ignore it, right? It's, we don't make it a big deal. But, you know, what's happening, and... and well, I don't think it's as bad as it has been perhaps in the past. And, I, and as you guys probably know, I'm, from my dad's side, I'm Japanese Americans. From my mom's side, I'm Chinese American. But from my dad's side, for the Japanese, it was no better than the Chinese, right? I mean, my great grandfather came here in 1880 from Hiroshima, a long time ago, over 100 years ago. Um, he, my grandfather, my dad were all put in internment camps during World War II. My, my grandfather died of tuberculosis, never made it out, right? My, my dad was only five at the time. He, he, got out of the camps when he was 10, after he got out of the camps, there was tremendous anti-Japanese discrimination. Probably the same manager could talk a little bit about some of that from his, his ancestry, but it was tremendous, right? My dad, it was so bad, my dad dropped out of high school. Um, and, you know, growing up myself, I, I felt a lot of racism. And, you know, when I came to Palo Alto, I mean, it's, it seemed like a very, very, um, open-minded city, I, I didn't really feel it. And in fact, I talked to my kids and they, my kids don't really feel it. And I feel like we've definitely progressed from, you know, imprisoning people <laughs> because there is a certain ethnicity to now where my kids feel very little of it. So I felt progress. But, you know, recently we see a lot of this um, anti-Asian hate. And I, I don't quite know where it's coming from. I, I know this, this virus and all that kind of stuff, but it's, 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 it, I mean, the Asian Americans living here are not the Asian Americans living in Asia, right? We are here, this is our country, this, we've been here for quite some time, some of us. And yet it's, that's, that's I think that, that gets confused. And, you know, I, I think Councilman Cook could probably talk about this as well, but, you know, it was interesting yesterday, there were actually people who, who, you know, spoke out against the protesters, which was interesting, right? This is here in Palo Alto, right? Um, and, um, you know, that was surprising, right? Um, and so I, I think that, you know, as, as a uh, ethnic minority, we're one of the largest in Palo Alto. Um, and for most part, you know, we get this kind of racism and we kind of ignore it, we kind of take it, right? But, you know, I think the problem with that is it leads to, um, it, there seems to be this escalation where now even Asian elders are getting beaten up. Like <laughs> the people who can't defend themselves, you guys probably heard about this, at least if you haven't, I hope you heard about it or like six Asian women get killed in Atlanta, right? And then, you know, the police spokesman says, oh, this is not, the guy was having a bad day. Like, oh, really? Okay, <laughs> what, 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 what do I do when I have a bad day, right? I mean, it just, I don't know. It just seems not appropriate, right? And so I, I think we can't keep going on where we, where these acts of racism happens in silence and nothing happens. Um, I think we should track this better. I asked um, uh, the police chief, or I forgot, was it maybe the police chief or someone from the police department here, like, you know, has there been any, any incidents reported? And the answer is no, none, zero. But God, I talked to a lot of people yesterday and a lot of people, it wasn't just me, a lot of people, even you know, this recently have had experiences and it's like, what's going on here? Like there's such a disparity between what's, but would you, would you talk to just your fellow, fellow neighbors and to what's actually being reported and felt? So I, I think, I think we could do better right? As leaders of the city, we could do better. We should try to do better. Uh, we should try to, you know, we have very liberal ideals in the city. I think we can live up to that. I, could, I think we could be, I would love for us to be 
race blind. <laughs> there's, there's no racism. I, I, I think a lot of my kids actually kind of feel it. I talk to them, they don't really feel it. They don't think of themselves like, well, I'm Asian versus whatever. But um, unfortunately, that's not true everywhere in our city. And I think we want to get there. So I hope you guys will support this resolution. And, and I would actually, I prefer to actually have a little bit more teeth in this resolution because I can, was, there's some incidents happening in the schools and other places that this doesn't quite cover. But um, anyways, that's, that's enough, enough. We should probably hear from the public. I just want to say, uh, we should lay the scourge of racism to rest. Uh, the very fact that racism degrades both the perpetrator and the victim commands that if we are true to our commitment to protect human dignity, we fight on until victory is achieved. It will forever remain an accusation and a challenge to all men and women of conscience that it took as long as it has before all of us stood up to say enough is enough. Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. It's in your hands to make a better world for all who live in it. Those are all quotes from Nelson Mandela. And uh, I think they're powerful sentiments uh, from a powerful person. Um, and as I said in my State of the City address, I think we as a city value belonging and that sense of welcome. And I think it goes beyond um, things like tolerance and inclusion. You know, to me, those are just minimum, minimum bars. Um, we wanna truly embrace others uh, Palo Alto is 33% Asian, and the Palo Alto that I know is proud, proud of that diversity. Um, we, we got a letter today uh, from Bob Winslow. You know, our Palo Alto Neighbors Abroad organization, um, we have sister cities all around the world. Three, three of the nine cities are Asian, China, Japan, and the Philippines. Um, and the student exchanges and the cultural events we do build relationships and friendships. Um, both Yang Pu in China, as well as Nanjing, supported us during the pandemic by sending a PPE to Palo Alto. And we also have this very long history of Asian Americans who have lived here for a long time. Um, so I think we all need to stand up whenever we see any of this hateful behavior happening against anyone on the basis of race. And I want to thank the HRC, you know, way back to the beginning of this meeting uh, for bringing forth some suggestions tonight on ways that Palo Alto can really lead on this issue. Um, they talked about education, school and community-based prevention programs, um, establishing a deeper hate-based crime expertise within the police department uh, beyond the general training that all of our police officers already receive. Um, potentially participating in a countywide task force to investigate hate-based crimes. And, um, and, then, and they also underline something that I think we already highlighted last summer, which is the importance of data in collecting data across of individual crimes to really look for patterns of bias. So I expect that we will make progress on all of these items. And uh, I really want to thank Lydia and Greg for bringing this uh, item tonight. So let's go to the public. And then we'll come back for some council comments and to pass the resolution. Um, city... the... Go ahead. Did you want two minutes or three minutes? Two minutes, given the hour. Any members of the public that wish to speak to this item, please raise your hand at this time. We have Rebecca Eisenberg to be followed by Monica Young-Arima and then Aaron James. Rebecca, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you so much for having this motion, which I entirely and fully support. I, in particular, I applaud, admire, and entirely support council member Ku's articulate, high integrity and courageous words. Thank you for those. Oh, and for council member Tanaka's as well, which I also appreciate. As I said, I wholly support this item in its entirety, and I look forward to you passing it unanimously. Moving forward, I hope that you can deep dive into some of the following items related to this troubling and important issue. First, there have been known incidents of violence against Asian Americans, not only by non-Asian community members and outside of the community members, but also by police officers. 
I urge the city council to look into the Palo Alto Police Department's potential targeting of Asian Americans, at, especially given the Palo complaints and incidents that Palo Alto Police Department has had regarding other ethnic and racial minorities in the past. I hope that as a sum in totality, we can clamp down on violence against minority groups, both inside and outside of our police departments. Also, last week's tragic murders reflected how deep and dangerous racial bias against Asian Americans can go, but it also demonstrated additional and more complex and more ingrained dangers, in particular for Asian American women. Asian American women face bias and danger that is often different and more debilitating than that of Asian American men, just as Asian American women face sexism that can be more violent and debilitating than that against dominant caste women like myself. I hope that you will consider that also. Finally, for now, um, I know that Palo Alto in the past has looked into local gun control measures that you can do legally, especially given today's against shooting in Colorado. I hope you can consider to look into that so no one needs to be shot in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next speaker is Monica Young Arima to be followed by Aaron James and then Bing Wei. Monica, go ahead, you have two minutes. Yes, um, I'm Monica Yang Arima. I live in 1032 Byron Street. I'm a lifetime member for this national organization called OCA and APAPA, Organization of Chinese American and Asian Pacific Islanders um, American or whatever association. Um, so I, I also volunteer for Stanford for the history program for the Chinese rural workers and support their curriculum development in the Stanford SPICE program for uh, curriculum development to train teachers on multi-ethnic educations. So I'm very resourceful. If the city wanted to use me for anything, reference anything, just let me know. And I have a big collections of uh, documentary on Asian American and other, you know, Jewish community and other community as well. So that's that. And um, uh, I liked um, the, the awareness was doing pretty good, pretty good. Palo Alto Weekly, Sue Dredman have been picking up the rally news um, today already. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's uh, what in your res resolution on item four. So that was great. And I like it to be including the campus as well, like the PAUSD K-12 and Stanford, because a lot of times, a lot of the campus issues is not being reported. And another thing is about verbal abuse. Um, if you look at the latest uh, blog that one of the high school students that are bringing up on this subject, it, it is mentioned that they tried to report their verbal abuse to the police department and the police would tell them that there's nothing that they can do. I highly recommend that the police will take charge on that. And so that people don't continue to abuse people verbally. And, and lastly, I think the police would be, it would be nice for the police to be trained to be able to identify what's hate crime. A lot of times there is uh, confusions about that. And there is an Asian community that are tracking this crime. So they, excuse me, they ought to know where they are. And lastly, this is uh, the one that I mentioned earlier, community world wellness program. It should integrate it, you know, hate crime in there as well. Not just Asian, any race, any racial profiling is not acceptable or to be promoted in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Our next speaker is Aram James to be followed by Bing Wei and then Alan Yang. Aram, go ahead, you have two minutes. So uh, Council Member Ku, thank you very much for your presentation and I apologize to you uh, as a Jewish white American for uh, any hate that's been directed at you. Um, I think that we have to have a standard as citizens to be able to intervene anytime we see racism against any other uh, community member. And uh, Greg Tanaka, thank you 
from two Sundays ago, I believe it was, uh, having your staff call me and have our first conversation in the four years you've been on council and you uh, told me about some of the horrendous things that happened to your family, including being sent to the, the concentration camps, uh, euphemistic, euphemistically sometimes referred as relocation camps and the racial profiling that your father went under in Los Angeles and the racism that you've been targeted with. And I appreciated very much that uh, you shared that with me. I have Asian grandchildren, so uh, I have a, you know, a direct interest in this to say the least. Um, also, um, Big Cow Tran was tragically, she was a four foot nine, 108 pound, 109 pound member of the Vietnamese community. Chad Marshall from the San Jose Police Department rushed in within eight seconds, nine seconds. She had a vegetable peeler in her hand. She was shot dead. That horrendous hate crime by a member of the San Jose police officer led to a, grand, a sham grand jury proceeding. He wasn't indicted. He was actually allowed to come into the grand jury proceeding dressed in his full uniform and, his, and a gun. But that, or, that incident led to the formation of the Coalition for Justice and Accountability, which Richard Conda leads. That's been now like 17 years. We've been fighting against hate crimes and police crimes. And of course, he's the, been the executive director of the Asian Law Alliance out of San Jose for 40 years fighting this battle. Uh, these are people that we need to connect up with and uh, we just have to make sure that we speak out loudly. Thank you, Aram. Our next speaker is Bing Wei to be followed by Alan Yang and then Winter Dellenbach. Bing, go ahead, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, City Manager and the uh, city council members. My name is Bing Wei. I'm speaking on behalf of the Neighbors Board uh, as its board member and also on behalf of our president Bob Wenslow, as well as the local residents who um, I have been living here for 15 years. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity to let our uh, voice out. I really appreciate and also echo the sentiments uh, both Council uh, Ku and um, Councilman uh, Tanaka has expressed. Um, I'm really pleased that Council is adopting a resolution to denounce, condemn, and combat racism and the violence against APPI communities. So our work in um, Palato um, Neighbors Broad, as the mayor mentioned, we've got three cities in Asia, Yangpu District, Shanghai, which are led efforts to establish uh, since 2018, and Toshila, Japan, and we've been with them over 20 years. And Palo, Philippines is one of the oldest uh, sister city for us for many, many years. So the 50 years of um, Palato um, Neighbors Broad, we have um, instilled in Palato citizens, especially our youth and understanding of the common humanity across race and, and the skin. And um, since I've been living here, I'm really pleased to see the regular celebration, Chinese New Year and Japan Ubon Festival here. However, the shooting in Atlanta was a wake call and there are more we can do and there are more can be done to, uh, to connect all our minorities, immigrants and diaspora communities like uh, many people said before. And um, I'm impressed by the video just shared by the Wellness Wednesday. I agree with uh, Monica's suggestion, integrate all these different efforts. So from my experience of Neighbors Broad, I know firsthand that dialogues, interactions among various communities, be them minority or majority, can facilitate much deeper uh, mutual understanding. So Neighbors Broad would like to work with the city council and other uh, nonprofit organizations to push forward. I myself is very uh, much wanting to lead efforts in advocating uh, racial e equality in Palo Alto and excited that Council's Social Justice Initiative is there for us. So we would like to work closely with City Council to promote Palo Alto's racial equity, harmony and community wellness. So I can, a few people already mentioned before, more education Asian American here can be implemented, such as simply this year's May Fatih uh, Parade in May could be, a uh, could be one of the example because May is National Asian American Month for the United States. And we can also start a social justice month in Palo Alto itself, staging um, exhibitions in the library, which is going to be opened or in the parks or like um, showing documentaries too. So overall, uh, Neighbors Broad and myself um, want to be always the part of the solution of our city. And we support strongly of the city council adopting this resolution. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Bing. Our next speaker is Alan Yang to be followed by Winter Dellenbach. And then I'm only gonna say the first name on the third person is Adi or Addy. Alan, go ahead, you have two minutes. Hi, my name is Alan Yang. I'm an alumni of Gunn High School and I strongly urge you guys to adopt this resolution. So many people may think that like racism against Asians is unlikely or like impossible in Paul Oto or in, or minuscule in the grand scheme of things. But even here, this really isn't the case. Asian Americans have been verbally harassed on the streets and in grocery stores here, despite holding a huge por portion of the population. And with the most recent mass shooting in Atlanta, which were 70, which 75% of the victims were of Asian descent, it is difficult for me to feel safe in a community that I've grown up in my entire life. So just as black and brown communities can be discriminated against can be discriminated against, so too can Asians. The fact that this has been a, this has been made apparent with the recent rise of crimes against Asians in the Bay Area, as well as in the entire country, and as a city that prides itself on inclusion, diversity, and education, it's truly important that Paul Ocho recognizes these incidents and pledges to fight against them. Everyone in our community deserves to feel welcome, and you all as city council members can help your Asian neighbors, friends, and coworkers feel more at home. It is your duty to represent Paul Oto and the residents within our city. And supporting Asian American communities during this horrible time is really part of that role. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Alan. Our next speaker is Winter Dellenbach to be followed by Addy Menderada. And then our final speaker will be McKaylin Long. Winter, go ahead. You have two minutes. I'm really glad that here it is 11 o'clock at night, you guys, and yet there are eight people uh, speaking on this item. I want to really thank uh, the three folks that uh, brought this colleague's memo, and uh, I'm going to assume that you all on the council are going to pass this, and for all the people that are speaking on this uh, at 11 o'clock tonight. I also want to thank the uh, Palo Alto Police Department being one of the 17 signers on to the various law enforcement folks in the county and the uh, California Highway Patrol that did their own, um, uh, commit, made their own commitment to um, uh, uh, standing up uh, for a PPI folks um, also, and I don't know that everybody knows about that, but I thought that was really good what the PAPD did. So um, I just wanna say uh, this is good. By coincidence, I happen to be reading a new book from the Palo Alto Library that's called um, The Eagles of Heart Mountain. Heart Mountain was one of the um, uh, incarceration camps for World War II uh, Japanese. And it is uh, one of the most, I thought I knew a whole lot about this subject for various reasons. I ha had a, a particular interest in the subject and I feel like I knew nothing about it until I read this book and it has humbled me and I recommend it to everybody. The Eagles of Heart Mountain. Um, uh, it is extremely enlightening. I've learned more than I, uh, um, could ever want to know about the brutality that we leveled upon uh, Japanese Americans on the west coast of this nation for nothing more than simply being Japanese Americans. And it is really an object lesson on why we all have to stay together now and in all other ways, when any of us are put upon simply because of the color of our skin or our religion or our gender or in any other way. So thank you. Thank you, Winter. Our next speaker is Addie Menderada to be followed by our final speaker, Michaela Long. Addie, go ahead. Uh, okay, so most people experience some form of discrimination at some point, but I'll speak from what's most personal to me, which is South Asian discrimination. 
So often because of preconceived notions about their faith, South Asians experience prejudice in all spheres from school to the workplace. And uh, I've heard many family, many stories of family and local friends being harassed for their clothes or complexion, including my mom. So Palo Alto isn't as immune as we would like to believe. And so this resolution takes the first step towards relieving injustice against all people from AAPI backgrounds here and in other cities, however small or large those injustices may be. Thank you, Addie. Our next and final speaker is Michaela Leong. Michaela, go ahead. Hi, I'm Michaela Leong, a current junior at Gunn High School, and I strongly urge you to adopt this resolution. Racism against Asian is often discounted, especially in Palo Alto, but this is a serious issue that must be addressed. Crimes against Asian Americans have increased exponentially over the past year, even here, despite holding a huge portion of the population. With the most recent mass shooting in Atlanta, of which 75% of the victims were Asian women, combined with the hate crimes we've seen right here in the Bay, it is difficult for my family, friends, and I to feel safe. As a community, we cannot rely on others not having a bad day to feel secure in the very cities we've lived in our whole lives. Discrimination and racism against Asian Americans is just as valid, and as a city that prides itself on inclusion, diversity, and education, it's important that Palo Alto recognizes these incidents and pledges to fight against them. Everybody in our community deserves to feel welcome, and you all as city council members can help your Asian neighbors, friends, and coworkers feel more at home. It is your duty to represent Palo Alto and its residents, and passing this resolution is one small thing that would demonstrate your support of Asian American and Pacific Islander communities during this horrible time. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Michaela. Mayor Du Bois, that was our final speaker. Great. Um, thank you to all the uh, public speakers. Um, I want to go to Councilmember Ku to see if you'd like to make a motion. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to move to adopt um, the colleague's memo, I mean, the resolution to denounce and to condemn and combat racism, xenophobia, and intolerance against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the city of Palo Alto. I'll second it. Thank you. And um, did, did you both speak to it already? Um, if I may, just a little bit, um, just to say that, you know, I have Caucasian friends and many of them are good friends. And I have friend, also friends from many different nationalities. Um, my family is biracial. We're half African-American and everybody matters to me. And this hate that is being experienced and uh, by many um, causing fear and and um, causing hurt um, must be faced, um, must be addressed straight in the face. And there's gonna be difficult conversations. And the whole thing is to finish that conversation. Um, I was reading a blog today at, on Palo Alto Weekly that is written by Jessica um, Zhang. And, uh, and you know, and she wrote things that meant a lot to her and what she knows. And the commenters did attack, but the thing is the conversation went on. And you know what, I have to give it to her, to Jessica for what she writes and for still fighting to ensure that the hate stops. Um, I would also love to see uh, what some of the members in the community had said for further education and for further work on addressing these kind of hate crimes. And love to see our the Palo Alto History Museum um, to display some of the contributions that Asian American Pacific, Pacific Islanders have, have been contributing to this community for such a long time exactly what um, Ms. Monica Young-Arima had said, you know, in terms of what, how the Asian Americans have worked at Stanford, had 
done their share there as well as for the railroad, building a lot of the infrastructure here in America, especially on the Western, uh, in, in Western America. But um, I, I, I just think that we need to do more than just passing this resolution. It has to be against all racism and all hate against everyone. Um, so thank you. Okay, um, good. Council members, uh, sorry, Greg, did you wanna to speak to your second? Um, well, I think uh, I was going to, but um, I you know Councilman Kuh, thank you so much for, uh, for making the motion. Definitely support this. Um, I hope my colleagues will support this as well. I, I, I do think this was kind of like a baby step. I hope we could go further. I don't know if the city manager can talk a little bit about, because some of the things I talked to um, my fellow processors yesterday about what was that, how do we even report this? Are we supposed to go on Twitter? We just don't report it, just kind of keep it in. How, do, how does that happen, right? Um, so you may not have the answers today, but I think that's something which um, there were a lot of people I talked to yesterday that kind of asked that question. It was, it was kind of surprising to hear so many people who had, in fact, I, I don't think I talked to anyone who hasn't experienced racism. It was really quite alarming, actually, in Palo Alto. Um, but um, uh, yeah, and then I, I think, you know, one of the speakers, uh, Monica, talked about uh, Palo Alto Unified School District in Stanford. I know we don't, our preview isn't necessarily Stanford, but it'd be interesting to hear staff's perspective on that. So you guys may not have an, have an answer today on this, but if you, if you can comment on it, that'd be great, or give some pointers on how we can make some headway on it, that'd be awesome as well. Certainly, Councilmember Tanaka and Mayor, with your uh, indulgence, um, I would just note that uh, the Palo Alto Police Department does have a policy or a component of its policy manual that relates to hate crimes, both in terms of reporting as well as training for officers. So that was referenced earlier, um, certainly uh, is a starting point for us, not intended to be um, uh, the end all. Uh, but that said, uh, does provide a framework for us to ensure that the council and community is apprised of issues as they arise. Uh, we have, uh, as was noted earlier, uh, ongoing conversation with the Human Relations Commission uh, that can also be an uh, important foundation as we look to next steps, including uh, potentially areas for legislative advocacy, uh, for strengthening uh, laws and abilities, um, both to address reporting as well as prosecution. Um, let's go to Council Member Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, of course, I'll be enthusiastically supporting this motion. I want to thank Council Member Ku and Council Member Tanaka and Mayor Du Bois for, uh, for bringing this forward. And, and in particular, I just want to uh, say I, I really admire the, the courage that it took for Council Member Ku and Council Member Tanaka to share your very personal very hurtful stories that, that you've experienced in, in your lives and, and all the, the public speakers who also shared their stories. I mean, that's what's so important, I think, for us to, to be able to get out during these, the, these moments is to be able to share those stories. Um, it's, it's not only, it's not only you know, I think, helpful for the, for the soul, but also important to be able to get that, that narrative out to people, to recognize that these aren't just one-off incidents, that these are systemic issues that have existed in our country since the beginning of time and that we need to, to continue to fight against it. And I, I know how difficult these resolutions are to write. Uh, I myself, when I served on the Santa Clara County Human Rights Commission, I, I had to author at least three uh, resolutions focused on, on, on similar to, uh, horrific incidents in our, in our country. I mean, the uh, the Pulse nightclub shooting against the LGBTQ community, the Tree of Life synagogue shooting um, against uh, the Jewish community, and and just last year, just uh, a, a resolution condemning hate crimes uh, and the kind of uh, the the increase in hate crimes that we have seen across the country that continues today. And I remember, I think after my third resolution, someone approached me and and they asked me, "Well, what's the point of these resolutions? They're they're simply words. There's no actions behind them." And I, I, I was so just kind of amazed by the, the ignorance of, of that statement. I mean, words matter. They're so powerful. And what we've seen over the last several years is a, is a nation that has developed to the point where we allow people to spew hate and racism and xenophobia and intolerance and, and bigotry 
and we we chalk it up to to political differences but it's not hate is hate and it needs to be called out and i i just i i thank you for bringing this resolution because it is us as palo altans standing together together saying we will not stand for this anymore and I, I, so I, I really thank you for this. I'm very excited to continue the conversation and to really also put action because uh, we do need to, of course, combine the words with the actions. But I, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful for a better future. And uh, I'm very proud of this, of this city council for moving so quickly and decisively. Thank you very much. Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Mayor Du Bois. Um, I also want to express my gratitude to council member Tanaka and to council member Ku for bringing this forward and for to the mayor for uh, and to staff for making it arrive so so rapidly it's timely and yet also overdue at the same time. Um, you know it's it's incredibly difficult once again to listen to the spectrum of harm um, and to know that there are people who live in our community who don't feel safe. Um, I, I think we should take seriously the suggestion about bringing um, the gun legislation um, back forward. Um, and I thank the city manager for explaining what the police can do now. I'm sure there'll be more discussions about that. Um, as I reflect on how um, the Human Relations Commission was able to help us last year, uh, they were able to help us with the history of black and brown people. Um, not only the history of exclusion, but also the history of contribution. And I think it's possible that might be one of the ways we head forward. Um, you know, one of the things we haven't discussed is that there was a time um, in many places in Palta where people who were Asian weren't permitted to purchase a, a home. Um, I was with a, a friend over the weekend whose um, mother was in an internment camp and uh, her uncle was not allowed to buy a house in Palo Alto. And I think that probably would have changed their life if you think about um, you know, where the community was then and where it is now. So I think there's a lot for us to reflect on. Um, and, and I think there's probably also an opportunity for um, those of us who are not Asian to be better allies. Um, in the same time we have reflected on um, all of the things we did last year with Black Lives Matter after the murder of George Floyd and discussing how to be a better ally and, and call people in. Um, I think there's an opportunity for us to do that. And it's possible the HRC with their conversations we'll be having. Um, it may be a separate conversations in a different format, um, but we, we do need to figure out how, um, how to identify these things and how um, to make sure that we have, make sure that everyone feels belong a sense of belonging and everyone's welcomed. Um, tonight's not the night for um, what we're going to do next, um, but I, I look forward to the suggestions on that um, and I resolve to be part of the solution. So thank you, um, not seeing any more hands. So I think we'll go ahead and vote on the resolution. Um, I think we're, Got around the order, so I think we start with me. I, I will vote yes. Councilmember Felseth? Yes. Councilmember Ku? Yes. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. Vice Mayor Burt? Yes. And Councilmember Cormac? Yes. Great. Thank you. So that passes unanimously. And we are at council member questions, comments, and announcements. Um, so any reports from our regional boards or community updates, council member Gorman. Thank you, Mary Du Bois. Um, at the Bosca meeting last week, <laughs> um, the SFPUC water report, I know we've had a pretty dry year uh, despite um, the rain we just had. Um, just wanted to let you know that they will be deciding in mid-April whether or not there'll be water rationing. They, they anticipate that being unlikely but um, just want to remind everyone that conservation should continue. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Do I have to say, um, I think the farmer's market on Cal Ave is working quite well with the restaurants and market merged together. Uh, it's getting very crowded. So it's uh, interesting how uncomfortable that is after the year of sheltering in place. But, 
It's good to see people out. Okay, and with that, um, thank you all. We got through a pretty full agenda tonight. Uh, meeting, meetings adjourned. Good night.